coming up on Destination Tomorrow. See how solar sails are being developed for deep space exploration. We'll also see how NASA technology is being used to help protect some of America's most important documents. Plus, we'll take a look at how the next generation of reusable launch vehicles is being developed. And Johnny Alonzo finds out exactly how GPS works. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. Welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. Up first, we look at a new way for spacecraft to travel to distant destinations. New lightweight solar sails might soon become the standard mechanism to power spacecraft. These reflective structures use energy from the sun rather than rocket power to move through space. These sails are not only less expensive than current rocket-powered spacecraft, but can potentially be four to six times faster. This increased speed and cost savings could change the way we study deep space. Jennifer Pulley spoke with Dr. Keith Belvin at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. Throughout humankind's early history, the quest for greater knowledge and understanding fueled the need for exploration. For centuries, the vehicle most early explorers used to achieve this exploration was a ship with sails. But because these ships depended on wind pushing against the sails for forward motion, they were generally very slow, unpredictable, and often very dangerous. Today, with the multitude of ways that humans now possess to travel, the sail, with all of its limitations, has been relegated to recreational status rather than a serious tool for exploration. But a new idea might change the way we think about sails. NASA researchers are actually developing a new type of sail that will use the sun's light to propel spacecraft deep into space. These solar sails are so promising that someday they may replace slower, more costly propulsion systems for deep space exploration. I spoke with Dr. Keith Belvin at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. Well, the idea for solar sails has been around for a very long time. Uh, Maxwell, back in 1873, predicted the existence of solar pressure lights. So we've known about uh, solar pressure for a long time, but it wasn't until recently that we were able to build solar sails with the lightweight materials and structures that are needed. Tell me about these lightweight materials and structures. How are they being used? Well, the key to building a solar sail is, of course, to make it very large and very lightweight. Uh, for a useful solar sail, it has to have a a weight of less than 10 grams per square meter. Uh, for example, uh, copier paper has a weight of 70 grams per square meter. So we're talking about some materials that are much lighter than that. One of the things that NASA has done over the last decade is to work on materials that can be processed to just a couple microns. That's a couple millionths of a meter thick. And these lightweight, thin materials then are made space durable so they can withstand the radiation and temperatures of space. Dr. Belvin, tell me how a solar sail works. The basic principle is much like a ship on the sea that uses sails to capture the wind. The sun is constantly emitting light, or photons, in all directions. Since the photons have mass and are in motion, their momentum produces a pressure when reflected by a surface. When a spacecraft uses a solar sail for propulsion, the sail's reflective surface transfers a continuous force from the photons to propel the craft through space, much like a sailing ship uses wind to push it across the water. Since the pressure being emitted from the photons is very low, the force is small. But because the sail will have a constant source of energy, it is continuously accelerating and can reach speeds upwards of 155,000 miles per hour. This speed could cut years off travel time during long-duration interstellar flights. In addition, the constant propulsive force provided by the sun's light allows the spacecraft to travel in orbits that are not affordable using conventional propulsion. So can solar sails be used on all types of missions? Well, in addition to solar sails uh, having to be lightweight for various missions, the spacecraft they're propelling has to be very lightweight. But there are many missions where, with the miniaturization of electronics, that the spacecraft science sensors are very small and lightweight. And those systems are very amenable to being propelled by a solar sail. For example, we're looking at missions in the future where we do interstellar uh, transfer of science instruments using solar sails. 
So do we see solar sails only being used in deep space? Well, there are missions where uh, solar sails can be used close to the Earth's orbit. They don't all have to be long duration interstellar type missions. The constant acceleration that a solar sail produces gives it an orbit trajectory that is not achievable by some other means. For example, we can fly a science payload uh, to measure the magnetic storms emanating from the sun. How do you deploy such a large structure into space? But to deploy a solar sail in space is quite a challenge. Uh, first of all, the sail has to be packaged in a small size to fit into the launch vehicles. Near-term sail missions are on the order of 70 meters to up to 150 meters in size. And so it's a real challenge to package those tightly and then deploy in space. Uh, two aspects probably are most important for deploying a solar sail. The first is deploying the booms that hold the membranes in place. We're using inflation to uh, push the booms out and to the right location, and then we uh, cool the booms to rigidize them. The second aspect is deploying the sail, the thin film membranes that we've talked about. Uh, those will incorporate ripstop so that if there's a small tear, it doesn't propagate very far. In addition, we have to deploy those so that we don't affect the sail's reflective performance. And so special measures are taken to maintain the integrity of that sail. What is the future of this program? I would say within the next dozen years or so, solar sails will be used routinely to propel spacecraft. Uh, continual improvements in the sail technology will allow them to be used for extreme environments like near-sun missions. Over the next 20 years, most importantly, we'll have the technology in hand to do interstellar uh, missions. These are kilometer-sized solar sails that weigh only one to two grams per square meter. The technology being developed today at NASA is going to enable us to unlock a lot of the secrets of the universe. Not only will we be able to look at distant places using telescopes, we'll actually be able to send science instruments to some of those locations using solar sails. Researchers at NASA are continuing to improve the materials used for solar sails every day, making them stronger and lighter. Coming up, we find out how some NASA detective work helped preserve the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution. But first, did you know that the inspiration for solar sail technology came from the 17th century astronomer, Johannes Kepler? Kepler deduced that winds blew objects around in space after he observed comet tails blown by what appeared to be a solar breeze. Kepler suggested that eventually ships might navigate through space using sails that could catch this wind. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, also known as the Charters of Freedom, are obviously three of the most important American documents ever written. They not only guide and guarantee liberties for all Americans, but have also been modeled by dozens of other countries around the world. So when signs of premature deterioration began to show on the documents, conservators became very alarmed. To help find out what was causing the deterioration and how it could be stopped, the National Archives turned to NASA researchers for an answer. Tonya St. Romain finds out more. In the late 1700s, three of the world's most important documents were written here in the United States. Now called the Charters of Freedom, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights were conceived and written by early Americans who believed that tyrannical rule and oppression should be replaced by individual liberties and freedom. Until the mid-20th century, these documents were proudly displayed for the general public, but the years of inadequate preservation left them a bit faded and brittle. This all changed in 1951, when the documents were placed in specially adapted encasements, which were designed to slow down the deterioration process. These glass encasements were filled with inert helium, which would protect the documents from the harmful, chemically corrosive effects of air, keeping them safe for generations to come. But in the late 1990s, conservators began noticing that the documents were, in fact, still showing signs of deterioration. Mysterious small white spots were appearing inside the encasements and on the documents. To help determine the cause of the deterioration and how to fix the problem, the National Archives asked researchers at NASA to perform a series of tests on the atmosphere inside the encasements. I spoke with Dr. Joel Levine at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. In 1951, the National Bureau of Standards, which is now NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, was asked by the National Archives to preserve 
these very important documents, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, it became apparent several years prior to 1998 that some mysterious white spots appeared in all encasements. And over time, over several years, they increased in number. The National Archive conservators wanted to know if we had technology that could determine the chemical composition of the encasements non-invasively. Non-invasively means without extracting air. We didn't want to touch the air. We didn't want to touch the encasement. We wanted to come up with some technique that could tell us the answer without disturbing the contents of the encasement, both the documents and the atmosphere. After considerable discussion, we decided we should use a technique called laser spectroscopy. What the laser did is provide energy at the very wavelength that water vapor absorbs. And as we looked at the absorption, we could determine what the background gas was. We we're interested in not the document, but the atmosphere in the encasement that's protecting the document. What we found is that the gas that was sealed 50 years ago was still there. When the laser studies were done, NASA researchers conclusively determined that helium in the encasements had not leaked out. This determination only increased concerns over the origin of the mysterious white spots. Most conservators believed that chemically corrosive air had leaked into the encasements, causing the damage. With this belief dispelled, the puzzle only intensified. So in some instance, we actually went back to step one because we still had the problem. The problem is what is responsible for these white spots. We eliminated air as a corrosive agent. And the next thing the National Archives asked us is could we tell them non-invasively how much water vapor was in the encasement? Because the documents were written on sheepskin, which requires a small amount of water vapor for stability, the relative humidity inside the encasements was originally set between 25 and 35 percent. To determine if the humidity levels had changed, the NASA researchers needed to measure the relative humidity inside the sealed encasement. The first technique considered involved placing the encasements in a freezer to cause the condensation of gaseous water vapor to liquid water droplets. This idea was rejected due to the distinct possibility that the documents inside could be damaged by the condensed water. It was later decided that the humidity could be checked by using a very inexpensive device called a thermal electrocooler. This device would sample only a small area of the encasements, keeping the documents inside safe. I called up the archives and I said, we just have to freeze a small part of it at the edge where there's no document, no ink, and we can solve your problem. When the humidity levels were checked, it was found that the levels inside the encasement were 60 to 65 percent, twice the expected relative humidity. This is because when the documents were originally sealed in 1951, the relative humidity in Washington, D.C. was very high. The backing paper that the documents were laid upon had actually soaked up water vapor like a sponge. Once the documents were encased, the water vapor inside the backing paper could not escape, so it remained in the encasement's atmosphere, causing the humidity to rise. The white spots were basic or alkaline chemicals that were pulled out of the glass because of the presence of high levels of water vapor. And now, when the National Archives opens with its new encasements, we are all sure that the documents will be stable for many centuries. And in some small part, NASA scientists and NASA technology help preserve these documents for many generations to come. To better understand aerodynamic forces, early pilots and engineers pushed aircraft's tolerances to the limit. But by pushing the limits, some pilots experienced a very frightening aerodynamic phenomenon called a flat spin. In an effort to better understand this phenomenon, NASA's predecessor, NACA, developed a unique wind tunnel called the 20-foot vertical spin tunnel. This tunnel was designed to not only study the unique flight conditions of an aircraft in spin, but also teach pilots recovery techniques to avoid a fatal crash. The research performed at this tunnel would have a direct impact on virtually every American aircraft from World War II through today. Early in 1941, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, completed its new 20-foot vertical spin tunnel. 
This tunnel tested a very different type of flight situation than the tunnels researchers were accustomed to using. The traditional way to test aircraft in a wind tunnel is by mounting an aircraft in the wind stream to evaluate the aircraft's flight characteristics. This type of testing is very effective when testing an aircraft in normal flight situations. But data from a traditional wind tunnel could not adequately account for unusual flight conditions, like a flat spin. As a plane enters a flat spin, air is not moving over the control surfaces as it should, which renders the plane's controls virtually useless. To help find ways for aircraft to recover from these dangerous spins, researchers test small-scale models in the spin tunnel. The idea behind the spin tunnel is simple. A large fan pulls a column of air up through the middle of the tunnel. Then a researcher launches an airplane model directly into the airflow by hand. As the model spins downward, the operator increases wind speeds until the model's fall is just balanced by the uprushing air. Then the control surfaces of the model are systematically activated electromagnetically to find out which ones allow the model to recover from the spin. The same basic technique that was used in 1941 is still being used today, but researchers now use computers to track unique markers on the bottom of the plane to measure the aircraft's spin characteristics. With these measurements, researchers can determine design modifications and pilot training procedures which can help pull a plane out of a spin, saving the plane and the pilot from a catastrophic accident. This simple system has worked especially well over the years. During World War II, every fighter, light bomber, attack plane, and trainer, over 300 designs in all, were tested in the spin tunnel. Subsequently, over half of these aircraft were modified in some way to ensure that their controls would be able to pull them out of a spin. Today, the spin tunnel is still testing many different types of designs, from small general aviation planes to the Mars sample return capsules. Since it opened for business in 1941, nearly every American military fighter has been tested in this tunnel. However, with 10% of all military air accidents still occurring due to the flat spin, the NASA Langley 20-foot vertical spin tunnel will undoubtedly continue to save lives for many years to come. Before the spin tunnel was built, researchers sometimes tested aircraft spin characteristics by simply dropping airplane models from high buildings. Coming up, we find out about the next generation of reusable launch vehicles. But first, did you know that Lieutenant Francis Evans became one of the first aviators to develop an effective spin recovery technique? In 1917, while attempting to get his pontoon plane into a loop, Lieutenant Evans inadvertently went into a spin. As he maneuvered out of the spin, he realized that he had unwittingly discovered an effective spin recovery maneuver. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross nearly 20 years later for his life-saving discovery. Reusable launch vehicles like the Space Shuttle are a vital type of spacecraft for close Earth operations. With the International Space Station providing a platform for unique scientific experiments, a reliable multi-use craft like the Space Shuttle is needed. Since the early 90s, researchers at NASA have been developing new types of reusable launch vehicles which will replace the aging Space Shuttle. These new spacecraft will be safer, less expensive, and much more durable. Stephanie Sy spoke with Charlie Cockrell at NASA Langley Research Center to find out what the future holds for the next generation of reusable spacecraft. The ability to travel into space is still a relatively recent event in human history. To get to space, early astronauts traveled in very expensive space capsules, which were only used once before being retired. These systems worked well, but it was realized that a reusable system should be implemented over the single-use capsule system. So in the early 1980s, the world's first and only reusable launch vehicle, the Space Shuttle, came into service. With the shuttle in service, space flight became much more accessible and less expensive, while also truly expanding technological and scientific exploration. But in a continued effort to make space flight even less expensive and much safer for astronauts, NASA researchers have been looking toward the next generation of reusable space launch vehicles. To help develop the next generation of spacecraft, NASA researchers have been developing and testing a lot of new vehicle technologies. Some of these new vehicles are so revolutionary that they may soon change the way we all think of space travel. I spoke with Charlie Cockrell at NASA Langley Research Center to help explain the next generation of space vehicles. NASA's goal is to make space travel safer, more reliable, and more cost-effective. 
One of the goals of the Next Generation Launch Technology Program is to provide routine access to the International Space Station, uh, provide a safer way for a crew return from the space station, and to also look at other opportunities in space and be able to do that on a routine basis. Charlie, how are these new spacecraft so different from the space shuttle we're used to seeing? Our vision is to really move towards spacecraft that look and operate more like conventional aircraft. So we want to do things like uh, have less turnaround time in between missions. They're going to be more reliable to operate, less repairs that will have to take place in between missions. Um, one of the chief differences uh, between the space shuttle and the vehicles that you're going to see in the future is we're looking at more advanced types of propulsion systems. So they're going to look and operate much differently than the shuttle. So what are some of the technologies you're using to develop these new vehicles? Well, in addition to the advanced propulsion systems, we are developing a number of different vehicle technologies uh, that are going to be directly applicable to the next generation set of launch vehicles. One of NASA's major requirements is to develop new technologies and vehicles to transport crews and cargo to and from the International Space Station. Because the space station is relatively close to Earth and needs to be resupplied frequently, the most logical choice is a reusable spacecraft. One idea under consideration is an air-breathing craft rather than a rocket-propelled spacecraft. To break Earth's gravitational field, a craft needs to reach about 17,500 miles per hour. Currently, this is being accomplished through the use of a series of rockets. These rockets not only carry large amounts of fuel, but must also carry liquid oxygen to mix with the fuel for maximum thrust. Although this system is effective, it is very expensive and can be dangerous. The benefit of an air-breathing craft is that it would not need to carry its own oxygen. It would scoop oxygen from the Earth's atmosphere into a special engine called a scramjet. This system would allow the craft to reach the speed required to break the pull of the gravitational field, sending it into space. Because the craft is not carrying its own oxygen, the weight will be reduced by up to 50 percent. This could reduce spaceflight costs by a factor of 10, bringing current payload costs from about $10,000 per pound to about $1,000 per pound. So is scramjet technology the only concept you're looking at? No, we're actually studying a wide range of technologies that include different configuration shapes, um, different numbers of stages in the vehicle, uh, different types of propulsion systems. Most of the longer term applications do use scramjets, but we're also looking at something that we would call combined cycle propulsion, which would actually take elements of rocket propulsion, scramjets, uh, high-speed turbojet engines, and maybe other advanced propulsion cycles so that we can use the benefits of those at different points in the flight. So where will this program be in the next 10, 15, 20 years? I think we're going to be well on our way to developing a next generation reusable launch vehicle system. Whether or not we will actually have an operational system in the next 10 to 15 years is going to be dependent on what the nation's needs are and how we address that as an overall strategy. But we are developing technologies that can not only be included in a vehicle that would be developed in, say, the next 10 to 15 years, but we're also developing a lot more advanced technologies that would be uh, good for vehicles that are going to be developed in, say, the next 20 to 30 years. And we're doing all of that by utilizing all of the unique capabilities that we have at our NASA field centers across the country. One of the most useful developments for professional pilots, drivers, and seamen in recent years has been the GPS receiver. These receivers are also being used by hikers, golfers, and fishermen for recreational purposes. However, many people who use this technology still don't know exactly how it works. Our own Johnny Alonzo finds out how this complex system helps keep many of us on track and on schedule. Trying to figure out where you are and where you're going has always been a challenge. Navigation and positioning are crucial to so many activities, and yet the process has not always been easy. Thankfully, the days of navigating by celestial means or landmarks are long gone since the introduction of GPS, or the Global Positioning System. So what is GPS? For some answers, I spoke with Dr. Kevin Dutton and NASA Langley to find out how it works. GPS stands for the Global Positioning System. And like the name suggests, it's a system to find your location anywhere on the Earth or near the Earth's surface. And the way it does that is by using radio frequency broadcasts from orbiting satellites. Can you tell me why GPS was originally developed? It was developed uh, by the Defense Department to meet all of their navigational needs. For example, uh, aircraft and ships at sea. And now even individual soldiers carry 
little receivers like this in the field to find out where they are. The global positioning system consists of a constellation of 24 satellites and their ground stations working together. GPS uses these man-made stars as reference points to calculate positions accurate to a matter of meters and in some cases centimeters. As long as you have a GPS receiver and a clear view of the sky and a map, you'll never be lost again. Today, GPS is finding its way into cars, boats, planes, construction equipment, farm machinery, even laptop computers. So how does the system work? Let's say you're backpacking and you have a receiver with you. You're going to turn on that receiver. Now, the GPS satellites are constantly broadcasting a signal, all 24 of them. But above you, at any one time, there's only 12 available, and then the other 12 are on the other side of the Earth. Okay. So your receiver is going to listen and try to find at least four of these satellites directly above you. And then it's going to determine a range of each satellite, and it's going to use those ranges and the known locations of the satellites, and it's going to do some mathematical calculations and a process called trilateration and it's going to figure out where that GPS receiver is. That'll also give you altitude, and it'll give you speed and the direction that you're traveling in. A standard GPS receiver will not only place you on a map at any particular location, but will also trace your path across a map as you move. If you leave your receiver on, it can stay in constant communication with GPS satellites to see how your location is changing. With this information and its built-in clock, the receiver can give you several pieces of valuable information like how far you've traveled, how long you've been traveling, your current speed, and your average speed. Also, the estimated time of arrival at your destination if you maintain your current speed. There's a lot of uses that they hadn't really thought about when they developed the system. For example, later on it was discovered that if you put multiple antennas on a vehicle, like an aircraft, for instance, you could actually get attitude. You could figure out its orientation, and whether it was rolling or pitching or yawing. Other things that they didn't realize they could really do were, uh, for instance, seismologists use it for earthquake detection and to find out when tectonic plates are actually shifting apart. It's that good. Something else. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Sure. <laughs> so that's how it works. So the next time you want to know where you are or where you're going, don't reach for a map. Reach for your GPS. Well, which button is it here to press for a date for tonight's gathering? That's all for this edition of Destination Tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. Coming up on Destination Tomorrow, we take a look at the first century of powered flight. We'll look back at how two relatively unknown bicycle makers from Dayton, Ohio, beat many of the world's foremost thinkers to become the inventors of the airplane. Plus, we will see what the future holds for aviation in the next hundred years. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello, everyone. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. Welcome to Destination Tomorrow. On this special episode of Destination Tomorrow, we'll look back at the first century of powered flight and the pioneers who designed and built the world's first flying machines. And we'll discover what the future might hold for aviation. Throughout history, man has always been intrigued with the idea of flight. However, most early aviation pioneers could not imagine flight as we know it today. With limited understanding of basic aerodynamic principles, many of these early pioneers attempted to build flying machines that were shaped like and emulated the flight of birds. 
The crude structures that they built generally relied on feathers and flapping wings as a catalyst for flight, ultimately leaving a trail of broken men and machines. History is inundated with stories of these birdmen jumping from towers and cliffs in a vain attempt to fly. Flight attempts gradually moved from small feather devices toward larger structures, yet many of these attempts still ended in humiliation and sometimes even death. However, with all of these failures, early inventors were building a foundation of knowledge for the future of flight. Although many had tried to build machines that could fly, all earlier powered flight attempts had failed before the flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903. Though the Wright brothers were the first to fly a heavier-than-air machine, people had been airborne long before the Wright's first flight. The Montgolfier brothers conducted the first public display of a hot air balloon flight near Paris in June of 1783. Balloons were also used extensively during the American Civil War to observe enemy positions. But balloons could not be controlled very easily, so the search continued to find a system that would allow heavier-than-air powered flight. In the late 1700s, Sir George Cayley of England helped define the problem of powered flight when he observed the problems of lift and drag of birds. Through a series of mathematical calculations and use of a device called the whirling arm, he tested numerous wing designs and eventually published many of his findings, providing a solid basis for flight pioneers of the future. One of the most notable pioneers that profited from this information was the German glider designer Otto Lilienthal. Lilienthal was often referred to as the Birdman because his glider designs were generally shaped like birds or bats. In his lifetime, he built 16 different glider designs, testing them from a man-made hill near his home. Unfortunately, he died August 10, 1896, after the glider he was testing spun out of control. His last words were, sacrifices must be made. Building off of the work of others, Orville and Wilbur Wright began working towards their goal of building the first heavier-than-air vehicle. In June of 1899, the Assistant Secretary of the Smithsonian received a letter from Wilbur Wright asking for reading material that related to heavier-than-air flight. In his letter, Wilbur wrote that he was an enthusiast, but not a crank, with some pet theories of his own about flight. A few weeks after his letter was received, Wilbur received a package from the Smithsonian containing reading material and suggestions referencing virtually every text in existence that mentioned flight. With this information in hand, the Wright brothers started their crusade to build the first viable heavier-than-air ship. To help us understand how the Wright brothers accomplished their goals and how their early planes flew, Johnny Alonzo finds out how it works. On the morning of December 17, 1903, history was made off the sands of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. For the first time in history, man had achieved controlled flight of a heavier-than-air machine. The Wright brothers had achieved what all their predecessors had only dreamed of, flight. While many of their contemporaries had focused on very complicated designs, the Wrights chose a straightforward design as a means of accomplishing flight. Controlling the aircraft was a key area most designers took for granted. This is where the Wright brothers targeted most of their design and innovation. Most early inventors thought that flight control can be achieved by a pilot simply shifting his weight back and forth. The Wrights, on the other hand, knew that controlling the plane would be the key to successful flight. To find out how the Wrights accomplished the goal of flight, I spoke with Jim Cross to find out how it works. Well, it started when they were both pretty young. In fact, at the time, they were living in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So they didn't always live in Dayton, even though that's where they considered their home to be Dayton, Ohio. Uh, their father was a minister. In fact, he was a bishop in his church, and he would, would take long trips away from home. Uh, when he would come back, he'd often bring the boys uh, a gift. Well, one time he came back from a trip, and he walked into the room and had something in his hand. And when he opened his hand to show him what it was, it flew out of his hand. Now what he had brought him was a little helicopter, I guess is what you'd call it today. But at that point, Orville was only seven years old at the time, Wilbur was 11. That seed of flight was planted and it never left them. They really just started sort of as enthusiasts and hobbyists, but when they got started on it, they knew before they did anything, they were gonna have to learn everything they could on it. In 1896, they decided that they were going to get involved and take an active part in trying to solve this problem of flight. Now, they were in their 20s at the time, young men, uh, owned a bicycle shop, the Wright Cycle Company right there in Dayton. But what really propelled them was the death of Otto Lilienthal. Now, he was a great German glider pilot. He had made thousands of glider flights. When the Wrights heard of this, they took a look at this and they said, you know, how is this possible? How could he possibly have something go so wrong that it could cause an accident that he could lose his life in. And 
at that moment they decided that they wanted to maybe get involved to see if they could figure this out. At first, they didn't have this idea of they're going to go out and invent an airplane. Their initial idea was simply to study the problem, to learn everything about it they could, and what their hope was was to be able to come up with possibly some little tidbit of information that they could add to this body of knowledge that man was accumulating. And then they figured someday somebody's going to put it together and figure this out. The Wright brothers recognized early on that the pilot would have a very limited range of motion in which he could shift his weight. They realized that a pilot would become fatigued quickly if he was constantly adjusting his weight to control the craft. They understood that movable surfaces would be the only way a plane could be controlled. Wilbur Wright came up with the solution quite by accident. As he was talking with a customer in the bicycle shop, he was fidgeting with a small cardboard box. As he twisted the box back and forth in his fingers, he realized the same principle could be used on an aircraft's wings. This idea came to be known as wing warping, allowing the control they've been looking for. They tested the idea on a kite glider and were pleased to see how well it worked. With this discovery, the brothers were well on their way to solving the mystery of flight. The Wright Cycle Company right there in Dayton was really a key. A bicycle at the time, late 1800s, was cutting edge technology. Now, a bicycle is an unstable piece of machinery. If you just get on it and sit there, you're gonna fall off. Now, even if you start riding it, if you want to turn, you can't simply turn that handlebar. But if you lean a little into that turn and then turn the handlebar a little, you're making the turn. Same thing with an airplane, they figured. So control was the key. That's what they were going for. In the fall of 1900, the brothers tested their first glider design on the Windy Dunes here at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Although the test flights were somewhat successful, the aircraft needed more design modifications. For the next three years, the brothers would leave Dayton for a few months out of the year to test their new designs at Kitty Hawk. In the late summer of 1902, the brothers finally had a glider that worked well. Well, that was a turning point for the Wrights. At that point, they were no longer hobbyists. They were no longer enthusiasts. They were now true scientists and engineers. They had entered a whole new realm. All that was left to do was find an adequate engine and propeller system, and they felt that they would soon be flying. Unfortunately, automobile engines of the time were not up to their exacting standards. So in typical Wright fashion, they hired their friend Charles Taylor to make an engine especially suited for their needs. The engine weighed 180 pounds, and it gave them 12 horsepower. That's 50% more than they needed. So they had that engine. Now that was a four-cylinder, gasoline-powered, water-cooled engine. I mean, it worked great. With the engine problem solved, they looked to the propeller. For years, the Wright brothers assumed that the propeller would be the easiest problem to solve on the aircraft. Their original design was based on a ship's propeller, but they ultimately found that this design was not sufficient for their needs. The Wrights were the first ones to figure out that a propeller for an aircraft truly needs to be a rotary wing, something that can create lift. And you just rotate that 90 degrees, you got thrust. After months of tackling complex mathematics and theoretical physics, the brothers designed their own propellers. Now, they handmade these propellers out of laminated spruce. They put all of this together on the craft, and when they were done, they had a unique piece of machinery, something that could do what no other machine in the world had ever done before. They were confident of that. They knew it, but they had yet to prove it. After winning a coin toss to decide who would try first, Wilbur climbed into the plane December 14, 1903. Unfortunately, this first flight attempt failed, causing minor damage to the plane. So three days later, after repairs had been made, it was Orville's turn to attempt flight. Now, as they were getting ready to launch that craft, Orville and Wilbur kind of went to one side and had a little short conversation. The witnesses said when they left, they shook hands like two people that may never see each other again. Now they come back, he gets on board that craft, lays down in that pilot position there. Now Wilbur's got to take his place out on the wing. They're ready to go. Orville releases that wire and that craft starts down the rail. Wilbur's running along holding on to that wing, keeping up just fine until at 10.35 in the morning, 17 December 1903, it lifts into the air. And for the first time in the history of the world, we have controlled, powered flight. First flight, 12 seconds, only went 120 feet, but it was truly the first controlled powered flight by man.
Now they made three more flights that day, total of four flights, and they alternated. Wilbur made the fourth and the longest flight. The third flight was only 200 feet, but the fourth flight was 852 feet in 59 seconds. That really proved it to the world that they had really done it. What have we seen since then? I mean, we got a space station in orbit right now. I mean, we put a man on the moon. We have literally come from Wilbur's footprints in the sand right here to Neil Armstrong's footprints on the moon. Now, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, he had with him, had it tucked inside a spacesuit, he had a small patch of cloth from that original Wright Brothers 1903 powered flyer. And I can think of no finer tribute to the Wrights than that. That's all from the Wright Memorial. I'm out of here. Oh, but before I go, did you know that Orville Wright was not only the first person to fly, but he was also involved in the first fatal aircraft accident? The first person killed in an airplane accident was Lieutenant Thomas E. Selfridge. On September 17, 1908, airplane inventor Orville Wright took Lieutenant Selfridge up on a demonstration flight for the U.S. Army. During the flight, one of the propellers separated, causing Wright to lose control. The plane fell 75 feet to the ground, killing Lieutenant Selfridge, while Orville Wright suffered a broken leg and pelvis. Full-scale models of the Wright Flyer have recently been tested in NASA wind tunnels as well. Up next, we'll find out how flight has progressed since 1903. But first, did you know that the original Wright Flyer was first housed in a British science museum from 1928 until 1948? The flyer was first offered to the Smithsonian Institute in 1910, but Smithsonian officials declined the offer, contending that the former Smithsonian director, Samuel Langley, had in fact built the first airplane capable of flight. Incensed at the obvious slight, Orville Wright assembled the aircraft and allowed the Science Museum of London exclusive rights to display it. The disagreement between the Smithsonian and Orville was resolved after the Smithsonian offered a public apology stating the Wrights were in fact the first to fly. The dedication of the Wright Flyer in the Smithsonian Institute took place on December 17, 1948, 45 years after its first flight. After the Wright brothers provided a template for flying machines, aeronautical breakthroughs were achieved at a relatively quick pace. In fact, only 66 years after the first powered flight, the Apollo 11 spacecraft became the first manned spacecraft to land on the moon. This and many other amazing achievements were due in large part to the work done by NASA and its predecessor, NACA, or the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. From its humble beginning through today, NASA has truly changed the way we all live. By 1915, the United States was already falling behind the Europeans in aircraft design and manufacturing. To stem this tide, President Woodrow Wilson asked that an aeronautics organization be developed, modeled after the British Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. With only a $5,000 initial appropriation and 12 unpaid members, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics was born. Its mission was to supervise and direct the scientific study of flight here in the United States. With the first aeronautics lab at Langley Field opening for business in 1917, aviation would soon be entering its golden age. From 1917 through 1958, NACA was responsible for many pioneering flight achievements in history. NACA was involved in virtually every area of flight and would soon be known as the foremost aeronautics lab in the world for its pioneering research. I had heard about it when I was in college because two of my aeronautics professors had worked at, at Langley, and they said that they thought that all aeronautical engineers ought to work at Langley for a couple of years just to, for that experience. Well, I, I, I went there for the couple of years and then stayed for 35. One of NACA's first major accomplishments came in 1922 with the construction of the variable density wind tunnel. Before this tunnel was built, researchers could only test aircraft models at sea level, which left huge gaps in the understanding of aircraft performance at high altitudes. With the new variable density tunnel, NACA researchers for the first time could compress air and simulate high altitude flying. This provided accurate data for aircraft manufacturers, greatly improving the quality of aircraft being produced. The variable density tunnel was just the first of many NACA and NASA wind tunnels to come. NACA wind tunnel research helped define and alter many problems that early aircraft were experiencing in flight. Through the 1920s and 30s, this research helped engineers with breakthroughs in cowling research and in new wing designs. 
However, some of the most important work in NACA wind tunnels came at the dawn of World War II. Just a few short years before the U.S. entered World War II, it was found that many of the aircraft that American pilots were flying were slower and less maneuverable than the aircraft that their future enemies were piloting. In an effort to find a low-cost way to increase American aircraft performance, NACA engineers began evaluating aircraft in drag cleanup experiments. By placing an aircraft in a wind tunnel, engineers could look at the entire area of the aircraft and determine which area could be made aerodynamically smoother. This evaluation process greatly improved American aircraft performance. During one month alone, July 1944, 36 U.S. Army and Navy planes were evaluated in detailed studies of stability, control, and performance. All in all, NACA engineers tested 137 different airplane types between 1941 and 1945, either in wind tunnels or in flight. A typical performance improvement was seen on the Navy's F-4F aircraft. When Langley researchers streamlined the U.S. Navy's Wildcat, it was able to fly a full 45 miles per hour faster. Improvements like this were seen in virtually every aircraft evaluated, undoubtedly saving many lives. After the war, a large part of NACA's focus turned to jet-powered aircraft. With the success of Chuck Yeager and the X-1, America had once again taken the lead in aircraft design. In the years to come, NACA researchers would make key aeronautical breakthroughs in quick succession. Many believe that the freedom that was given to engineers to explore possibilities fueled many of these great breakthroughs. I give plenty of credit to Langley because they provided so much for me. I could never have done what I did without the Langley Research Center. They provided vast amounts of money and equipment, personnel that were required to demonstrate these ideas. One of the things I mentioned was the fact that when I first had the idea of the area rule, Having the idea was not, to me as an engineer, as important than putting the thing in a wind tunnel and demonstrating that it worked. And without the NASA, anything that I ever wrote on the damn thing would be in a file somewhere. NACA's mission changed on October 1, 1958, when it was absorbed into the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. This agency was formed primarily to focus on solving problems related to spaceflight, but would also continue to focus on aeronautical problems as well. Researchers at NASA have continually been on the forefront of aeronautical exploration. In fact, virtually every American aircraft, commercial and military, have been tested in some way by NASA researchers. This strong history of aeronautical research continues today and will continue in the future. Jennifer Pulley spoke with Bob McKinley at NASA Langley Research Center to find out what airplanes might look like in the near future. Not long after the first flight at Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers, and many other inventors for that matter, began trying to find ways to make aircraft better. In a relatively short amount of time, aircraft designs went from canvas and wood structures with very weak engines to metal structures with very powerful engines. With each new innovation, propeller-driven aircraft became stronger, safer, and much more efficient. The next great revolution in aircraft design came with the development of the jet engine. This type of engine truly changed air travel dramatically. It enabled aircraft to fly farther and faster than propeller-driven aircraft while improving safety and efficiency. However, since the beginning of the jet age, technology innovations in aircraft have been more incremental than revolutionary. Small steps forward have continued to make flying safer, but what will be the next great revolution in air travel? To help answer this question, NASA researchers are working on new designs that could change air travel once again. New aircraft shapes, cleaner burning fuels, and new materials could be the first steps in the next revolution in aircraft design. I spoke with Bob McKinley in the Vehicle Systems Program Office at NASA Langley to find out what future aircraft might look like. The Vehicle Systems Program Office is focused upon working on improving the aircraft of the future. In particular, we want to work on quality of life for the citizens of this country, and that's where our investment is aimed, and also to make aircraft safer and cleaner and better for the environment. Some of the aircraft that we're working on would be subsonic transports like jetliners that would fly quieter, land and take off quieter, and uh, supersonic aircraft that could fly over land without making a sonic boom, and personal air vehicles that you and I could use in place of an automobile. 
Now, will the aircraft of the future look similar to the aircraft we see today? Some aircraft will look the same as what we see today or very similar, and some will not. Uh, one of the concepts that we've been working on in terms of uh, advanced technologies is the blended wing body, or the BWB. And that aircraft is aimed specifically at being uh, much cleaner in terms of emissions and fuel burn. Current aircraft are much more efficient and quieter than aircraft designed, say, even 30 years ago. But public demand for quieter and more environmentally friendly aircraft continues to grow. In an effort to meet this goal, NASA is researching an aircraft called the BWB, or blended wing body. The BWB is a hybrid shape that mainly resembles a flying wing, but also incorporates some features of a conventional transport aircraft. The futuristic airframe is a unique design with efficient high-lift wings and a wide airfoil-shaped body, allowing the entire aircraft to generate lift and minimize drag, thereby increasing fuel economy. In addition to the blended wing body, we are working on aircraft that would cruise at a higher speed. Today's planes fly between five and 600 miles an hour. We call it Mach 0.85 is about, about the standard. And what we'd like to do is move to an aircraft that allows us to fly at Mach 1.6 to 1.8, which is over twice as fast, say 1,200 miles an hour. And you'd be able to get from, from New York to LA in about two hours. Now the technology exists to do that today. We have supersonic aircraft. We could make aircraft that would efficiently cruise at that speed, and, and the Concorde is an example. Aircraft like that can't fly supersonically over the United States or over any landmass uh, because they create a huge sonic boom as they do so. A sonic boom is a noise similar to thunder caused by an object moving faster than sound, about 750 miles per hour at sea level. As an aircraft travels through the atmosphere, it continuously produces air pressure waves, similar to the water waves caused by a ship's bow. When the aircraft exceeds the speed of sound, these pressure waves combine and form shock waves. These shock waves are heard as a sonic boom when they hit the ground. This boom is so disturbing that aircraft today generally only break the sound barrier over water or in restricted military space. But new testing at NASA might soon change that. In recent tests, NASA researchers successfully demonstrated a way to lessen the impact of a sonic boom. Well, I cleared high altitude supersonic entry exit point one if I was to complete the corridor. They found that by designing the wings and body of an aircraft to a specific shape, the pressure waves generated can be kept from merging together. The resulting shock waves are therefore much weaker in strength, and the sound heard on the ground is less intense. With this new breakthrough, supersonic flight over land may finally be within reach. Another program that NASA researchers are currently working on may completely revolutionize the way we currently commute and travel in our daily lives. One of the major breakthroughs for personal travel in the 20th century was the development of the automobile. Before the automobile came along, the average person would only travel five miles a day or less. This number increased to 50 miles a day with the development of the automobile. The goal of the personal air vehicle is to enable the average person to travel about 250 miles a day by using their own or a shared personal air vehicle. The hope of NASA researchers is that personal air vehicles will be used in the 21st century the same way automobiles have been used in the 20th century. This change would allow much more mobility and freedom in our everyday lives. These aircraft may be able to completely displace the automobile just as automobiles did horses. And we're looking at those in three phases. The first being what we call a quiet, conventional uh, personal air vehicle. Be very similar to what you see out on uh, general aviation runways today. We hope to make these aircraft so easy to use that almost anyone would be able to take a few hours of training and get in and, and use this vehicle to get anywhere they want to go. The second phase would be what we call a, uh, a vertical or short takeoff and landing air taxi. And this would be an aircraft that could take off in very short distances and hold six or eight people and you'd be able to just walk up like you do a taxi at a taxi stand and say I need to go from Washington to Cleveland and you'd be in and go. The third phase would get into what we call a dual mode and this would be uh, if you think Jetsons uh, this is the flying car. 
you'd be able to park this thing in your in your in your garage, drive out on your street, roll down the street a little ways to some short takeoff field, and fly. And, and maybe it's as simple as uh, take me to Grandma's house, and it knows how to get you there. You know, we've come a long way since the Wright brothers took their short flight at Kitty Hawk. There have been a lot of innovations in aircraft technology in just a short amount of time that we've been in the air. And NASA's been a big part of that. And we're going to continue to be a part of that in the future. That's it for this special edition of NASA's Destination Tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. up on Destination Tomorrow, we take a look at NASA's new plan for space exploration. We'll find out about some of the robotic missions that will lead the way for our astronauts. And we will talk about some of the challenges of getting to and staying on other worlds. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien, and welcome to this special edition of Destination Tomorrow. On this episode, we'll be focusing on NASA's new exploration plans to travel to the Moon, Mars, and beyond. In recent months, NASA planners have been preparing for a new initiative that will set a pioneering vision for NASA's exploration programs. To prepare for this vision, NASA researchers are developing a step-by-step -step process that will enable us to reach this goal in a safe and economical way. First, by using robotic missions as a test bed, then gradually, moving into human missions, NASA is paving the way for a human presence on other worlds in the next few decades. This new NASA vision will help us carry on the basic human desire to explore. From the earliest discoverers to our modern travelers, every step taken from the known into the unknown has helped to feed this exploration instinct. One of the most important agencies ever formed to help meet this need is NASA, or the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Obviously, exploration has been one of the cornerstones of the NASA mission throughout its existence. Over the years, the talented men and women of NASA have changed our world for the better, making exciting discoveries that have not only furthered the space program, but have also transformed our daily lives here on Earth. In fact, for every dollar NASA spends in space, at least seven dollars is returned to the public by way of inventions and discoveries. This investment return can be seen in everyday technologies, ranging from cordless power tools, cancer research, to weather prediction. Over 30,000 inventions and discoveries have been made as a direct result of NASA's involvement. Although NASA has done a great job pushing the envelope of exploration in space and back here on Earth, there is still much more that needs to be done. Even with great public support to reach our exploration goals, few people understand the challenges we'll face in getting to other worlds. 
To help us better understand the technical and environmental problems we'll encounter, researchers will first plan to test the waters by increasing our robotic presence throughout the universe. These robotic missions will expand our knowledge base and help us focus training that will prepare humans for the next step of exploration. Now to help us understand how this will work, Jennifer Pulley spoke with Mark Saunders at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. The history of the space program is very impressive. Since its beginnings in 1958, NASA has grown to be one of the most revolutionary agencies in recorded history. With President Kennedy's goal to reach the moon by the end of the 1960s, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And with the backing of the American public, technologies that would have seemed impossible in earlier years were being developed and perfected in record time. This drive and determination has never left the agency. Today, a new generation of researchers are gearing up for the next big step, crewed missions back to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. However, major challenges await. Questions of crew safety, medical concerns, the need for new technology development, and a host of other issues make this goal very daunting. To lead the way, robotic missions are being planned that can give researchers a better idea of what human crews can expect in space. I spoke with Mark Saunders at NASA Langley Research Center to help us understand how these robotic missions will work. Our robotic missions are actually precursors to what it is that we're trying to accomplish with humans. They're the, they're the probes that we're sending out to help us understand what it is that we're getting to when we send people there. Uh, they're testing new systems, collecting data about what's actually happening on the planet's surface as well as the atmospheres. We want to make sure that we, we understand this to the maximum extent so that we're always sending humans in a safe way. So Mark, what is the definition of a robotic mission? People think of uh, robots in many different ways, and, and those of us in the agency actually do that as well. We're, we're making spacecraft, you know, as an example, the Hubble Space Telescope is a robotic spacecraft. Um, it's actually very smart, but it, we, we talk to it a lot with people on the ground that kind of tell it what to do on a periodic basis, usually in terms of minutes. But as you get robots that are going farther out into the solar system, uh, they need to really operate a lot on their own because it takes a long time for us to talk to them. So radio waves go out there and it's hours before we hear back from them. So they're actually operating pretty much by themselves. What can we expect from robotic missions uh, in the next few years? As all of us have been watching, the Mars Exploration Rovers have been doing a great job on Mars. Cassini is at Saturn uh, with its Huygens probe. Uh, we're, we're planning the next ser series of missions, both for scientific purposes, as well as to prepare us to send people on to the moon and then on to Mars. The first of these planned robotic missions will be going back to the moon. The goal is to have these robots pave the way for humans by mapping the lunar surface, surveying potential landing sites, and searching for water ice. Now, tapping into water ice could be very important because human explorers could not only convert it into oxygen and hydrogen for breathing, but they could also use the gases to produce rocket propellant for future missions to Mars. In short, these robotic missions will allow NASA planners to design the needed equipment for astronauts to live and work on the moon while also helping them prepare for future missions to Mars. One of our biggest concerns is always making sure that our missions are as reasonably safe as possible uh, for the human, as the human participates in it. So when we send out robotic missions to the moon and to Mars, we're trying to understand what the moon and Mars represent in terms of their environmental conditions, what they're made of, uh, are there any uh, elements there, both in, in the atmosphere on Mars or on the surface or on the surface of the moon, that might have uh, some toxic properties, and, and as well as their physical characteristics, their composition, so that we understand when we build a human spacecraft to go with humans in it, that the system that we send is uh, compatible with the environment that it's going to be in. So that's one major point. The second point is that uh, 
like the explorers of old, to the degree that we can use resources that we find, we want to be able to use those resources to help sustain them. And doing this, by the way, reduces the cost. So although it may, it may cost us some to develop the technologies now, when we go, if they don't have to take stuff, it's, you know, we don't have to pay to get it off the surface, and we're not paying to get water off the surface if we can find water there. So is most of the technology already developed? Technology is actually the key to what it is that we're trying to do. New technologies will enable us to be more efficient in how we go, uh, allow us to actually take lighter weight systems, uh, cheaper systems, more reliable, safer systems, so that uh, the overall cost to the American taxpayer is uh, dramatically less than the Apollo program. And we've discussed going to the moon, going to Mars. What other destinations do you foresee for robotic missions? Obviously, asteroids. And everybody's familiar with asteroids. We certainly have uh, quite a few disaster movies around them. But there are a lot of scientists and um, engineers who believe that asteroids have the potential for resources that we might actually mine and use. And so, one other destination are asteroids. What our strategy is, is to begin to make small steps towards the moon, to Mars, and then on to destinations beyond that. So we're going to gradually, over the next decades, push our human exploration beyond the boundaries as our robotic explorers find out new things about what's interesting out there. Coming up, we'll find out about some of the major challenges facing astronauts on long-duration missions. But first, did you know a special robot is being designed to work primarily outside a spacecraft on extravehicular activities, or EVAs? The Robonaut will not be autonomous. Astronauts inside the spacecraft will use virtual reality display technology to visually immerse themselves in the robot's workspace while remaining safe inside the spacecraft. As we all know, traveling into space, even on short missions, is a very difficult endeavor. But the complexity increases dramatically when planning for missions that last for months or years at a time. With current predictions of crewed travel to Mars lasting at least three years, NASA researchers must find a way to prepare our astronauts for long missions. To help us understand some of the challenges future astronauts will face, Tonya St. Romain spoke with Orlando Figueroa at NASA headquarters to find out more. Since the early 1960s, the general public has accepted space travel as almost commonplace. Moon missions, shuttle flights, and trips to the International Space Station have helped us learn about the challenges of traveling into space. But with new exploration missions to Mars and beyond, different and possibly even more challenging problems will need to be overcome. Just the journey to Mars will require a new way of thinking about space flight. New vehicles need to be developed, and the crew's physiological concerns, such as Radiation exposure, bone loss, and food storage need to be addressed before the mission can be undertaken. To help find out more about some of these challenges, I spoke with Orlando Figueroa at NASA headquarters. Some of the uh, major challenges in getting crews, uh, human beings, to another world deal with the, uh, the environment of space. I mean, not only is it very difficult to get them on their way to the uh, new world, but the radiation environment that they're going to be exposed to, the duration of those flights. Other than the moon, most uh, destinations in the solar system are pretty far away, so they're going to spend uh, several months in, in the process. Uh, they also need to carry a significant amount of uh, resources, water, uh, food, to be able to, uh, to live in space. And they're in confined spaces where they need to exercise and to keep their uh, body healthy. We on Earth have to be able to uh, keep track of their health. You know, how are they doing? What happens if they get sick? So an enormous number of challenges that we have to overcome before we're ready to take that, uh, that step. Orlando, give me an idea of what the proposed spacecraft might look like. The proposed spacecraft to uh, take the humans in their journey through uh, space are just, uh, as we speak, being designed. Uh, they're called crew exploration vehicles, vehicles designed to be able to carry uh, on board a, uh, a number of astronauts. Uh, and uh, have all of the equipment necessary, the food and uh, other equipment, to, uh, for them to be able to, to go on their journey. 
Now, uh, they are in similar in shape, perhaps, to some that we observed during the Apollo era. Bigger, much greater capability, and new rockets that are being developed to uh, take them uh, into space. Once in space, the system they're going to be using for propulsion will rely upon chemical, a uh, combination of nuclear, uh, energy, and or chemical. This type of technologies that are being developed uh, as we speak. Using current rocket technology, it would take at least six months to get to Mars. In order to cut back on that time, NASA researchers are looking at new methods of propulsion that would greatly reduce trip duration. One of the most promising plans, called Project Prometheus, could cut this travel time to about two months. A Prometheus spacecraft would use nuclear propulsion rather than chemical propulsion to increase speeds to distant worlds. The nuclear option would make a crewed Mars mission much easier because it would reduce the need to carry so much food, fuel, and oxygen. Nuclear power would also mean that Martian launch windows would be longer, allowing a more flexible choice of launch and return times, leading to a crewed landing mission that could last as little as three or four months, as opposed to the current projection of about three years. Another concern is the crew's exposure to radiation when they're in space. So how will the vehicle protect them from the radiation that's in space? Well, space has a certain level of radiation that can get uh, significantly worse if they are exposed to uh, solar emissions. You, know, you have a, a solar uh, ejection. These are highly charged particles that are traveling incredibly fast uh, through space. On Earth, we have the benefit of having a magnificent uh, magnetic field that provides great protection against that, that radiation and those particles. In space, you're fully exposed. So clearly, we need to worry about the design of a spacecraft and, and make certain that it provides a certain amount of shielding or a combination of materials that can increase uh, the, the stoppage ability on those particles. It cannot be 100% effective, so you also need a way to predict when such a, a coronal mass ejections uh, may come through to give them some adequate warning and perhaps have the astronauts move to a safer area in the spacecraft to protect themselves. So it's a combination of systems and prediction and other capabilities that, that would make it uh, much safer. Will being in microgravity for long periods of time be detrimental to the astronauts? In space, there is no gravity, of course, or very limited gravity. So you, your bones are not needed for the same purpose or for the same strength that you would need them here on Earth. Likewise, your muscles. You don't need to exert as much pressure or, or force in order to move around. You're not fighting gravity. So therefore, you also tend to lose muscle mass. So one, and, but obviously, once you get to, to the destination, you're going to need that, again, not necessarily if it's to Mars. It's about half of the gravity of Earth, so you wouldn't need as much. Nevertheless, you need you know, a certain amount of uh, strength and muscle mass to be able to move around and be healthy. So part of a, a challenge is to define uh, techniques, skills, equipment, etc., that allow the astronauts to remain healthy and to protect their uh, bone and muscle uh, mass uh, to do the journey and return back to Earth. Because we have to worry about bringing them back uh, when they're done. A strong element of a vision for space exploration is this combination of humans and machines working together. Uh, to learn about a new world, normally we begin the process by sending robots that, that explore and understand the environment from a science perspective as well as from an uh, engineering and safety perspective. Where would humans uh, go to do further scientific research and explore this new world? Now, it is a daunting task right now for us to develop all the capabilities that will take us there. And because of that, we're taking a stepwise approach. We're going first to the moon where we're going to bring capabilities, develop technologies, develop uh, the knowledge and, and the uh, necessary for humans to survive in that environment for a long period of time. And from there, then start graduating, if you will, to Mars as the next target, the next target where we can start proving the scientific theories and explore this new world, and then move on uh, beyond. That's what the uh, vision for space exploration is all about. We in NASA are incredibly excited about the opportunities that the Vision for Space Exploration are bringing forth. And who knows what we may discover, uh, who knows what we may learn. Coming up, we'll find out what some of the challenges will be for actually living and working on other worlds. But first, did you know that the early days of flight had its share of challenges as well? For example, 
On May 14, 1918, the U.S. Post Office released the first stamps commemorating airmail delivery, which were scheduled to begin the next day. Unfortunately, the plane pictured on the stamp, the J-4 Jenny, was mistakenly printed upside down. During the inaugural flight, Airman George Boyle had problems from the start, eventually crashing his Jenny into a Maryland cornfield. Scrambling from his plane, he stood looking at it, lying upside down, exactly as the inverted stamps had predicted. The prospect of living and working on other worlds is very exciting, but there are many questions that need to be answered before this vision can become a reality. Food concerns, radiation exposure, spacesuits that can withstand the rigors placed upon them, and a host of other problems are concerns for NASA planners. Johnny Alonzo spoke with Lisa Guerra at NASA headquarters to find out how it works. In the late 60s and early 70s, researchers at NASA learned quite a bit about living and working on other worlds with the success of the Apollo moon landings. These missions helped broaden our understanding of how humans could work and interact outside of the comforts of Earth. But even though much was learned about problems astronauts would face on other worlds, the human presence on the moon was relatively short, generally only a few days at a time. Future missions to Mars will be much longer, potentially lasting years at a time. Things that many of us take for granted, such as food, clothing, medical care, and safety, will be some of the biggest challenges that need to be addressed by NASA planners. To help us understand what is being done to prepare for these long-duration missions, I spoke with Lisa Guerra at NASA headquarters to find out how it works. The major challenge to live and work on other worlds is predominantly adapting to a new environment. The crews will be coming to these new worlds, and the one we've been looking at in particular is Mars, and have to arrive and adapt to the environment. And that environment on Mars involves a third of our Earth's gravity, as well as different weather patterns, dust storms, which we are particularly concerned with, radiation, uh, which we have to measure and understand how to protect the crews against. And in particular, these crews will be traveling for long distances uh, from Earth to Mars, and we will have to uh, have the crews fend for themselves once they get there. There will, will not be hosts of doctors and NASA personnel when they arrive, and so are they physically able to adapt to this environment as soon as they get there. So when our astronauts arrive at Mars, Will they have to build permanent bases, or could they just live on the spacecraft that they arrive in? Whether they live in their spacecraft or we would have to have a more permanent habitat for them would depend on how long they would stay at Mars. And there are two different approaches to sending crews to Mars. One uh, involves a short stay, and that's on the length of about 30 days on the surface of Mars. If that's how long they would be there, they could probably live out of their spacecraft, much like the Apollo astronauts did. However, if we take the other approach to going to Mars, uh, they could be there for almost uh, 500 days, from a year to 500 days in Mars vicinity. And in that case, uh, it's a very long time for six people to live out of one spacecraft, so we would probably have a larger habitat and presence on the surface. It would also mean we'd probably need other power sources than uh, solar power because they'd have to sustain their activities for such a long period of time. And with the weather and dust conditions, it makes solar power very difficult on Mars. So Lisa, when astronauts are on Mars for years at a time, how would they get their food and water? As I mentioned, if they could stay for over a year, Ideally, you could use some of the resources that might be on Mars. And with our current Mars robotic program, we are trying to determine the levels of potential water or water ice on the planet. And if we do find uh, sources in large quantities of water, we could use that for the crews, as well as use it in fuel cells for power generation. We could also use the atmosphere, which is made up predominantly of carbon dioxide, and you could use methods to uh, decompose the carbon dioxide into oxygen, and then we could use that oxygen for the spacecraft air. As far as food goes, again, if you have uh, water and oxygen, uh, you could ultimately see the crews 
developing their own uh, growth chambers and actually growing their own food. And that would be something we'd look into if we were staying there for a long time. What are some of the differences astronauts might face you know, working on the moon compared to working on Mars? The difference between uh, spending and occupying time on the moon to Mars, first and foremost, is that the moon is much closer to the Earth, about a three-day trip. We could actually rescue the crews if necessary. They could come back and get medical care. They would not have to be as self-sufficient. And you could set up a, like a ferry system with logistics, much like we do with the space station. So again, the, the crews could operate for varying amounts of time but still be reliant on the Earth. Whereas the distance to Mars is so much greater, we'd have to build the reliability and maintainability into our systems and have the crews be much more self-sufficient. Right now, NASA is planning to use the moon as a test bed for Mars. Uh, this would be uh, primarily a systems type test bed, uh, design some of these life support systems and spacesuits and use them and work them on the moon and learn from that uh, engineering experience and then improve the design for Mars. One major challenge that will need to be addressed will be what type of spacesuit our astronauts will wear on other worlds. The current suits used on the shuttle and in the space station work well, but they are not designed for full range motions like walking and working on a planetary surface. So future suits will probably look more like the suits that were used during the Apollo program. These new suits will need to be much more durable and better suited for the harsh conditions astronauts will encounter on other worlds. The other issue, though, with spacesuits for Mars is the dust issue. The dust tends to be very electrostatic, and there are concerns that if you came into the habitat or the airlock with your suit, uh, that dust would get circulated into the air system. So there are concepts being developed where maybe the suit never comes into your habitat, that you actually step out of it, like walk out from the back of your suit into your habitat, and the suit's always exposed to the environment. We're looking at this as, as not just a milestone, but a journey to actually get beyond Earth orbit, to get beyond the moon, and go to other worlds. And so everything we do today and everything we expect to do in the next couple of decades will give us a capability to enable us to get to, to Mars. And it may not be within my career, but it may be uh, the young engineers in school today that they will see it through, and then the next generation, the next generation. So that's how it works. So for the next generation of explorers, a walk on Mars might be in the cards. With my pull here at NASA, I just might see you there. That's it for this edition of Destination Tomorrow. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time.
Coming up on Destination Tomorrow, NASA has developed a revolutionary satellite sensor that will greatly improve weather forecast accuracy, as well as change the way weather information is conveyed to the public. Plus, NASA's commercial invention of the year might help people with heart disease live longer. And we meet the chief engineer of one of the most successful spaceflight missions in NASA history. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien, and welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. Current weather forecasts give us a best guess of storm formation, moisture, temperature, and winds. Considering the difficulties of forecasting these variables, it is not surprising that predictions sometimes differ from what actually occurs. Accurate forecasts are valuable. Ones that go astray can be costly in terms of property loss and sometimes human life. A new program at NASA called GIFTS will use three-dimensional cameras on board geostationary satellites to continuously observe Earth's surface and atmosphere. Measurements and data from GIFTS will enable meteorologists to predict the future position of storms and their changing intensity. This capability will give earlier warnings of the development of destructive weather. Jennifer Pulley finds out how this revolutionary satellite sensor will change the way weather information is predicted. In this modern age, weather forecasting is something that many of us take for granted. We depend on accurate information from forecasters every day in order to make travel plans, dress appropriately, and in cases of extreme weather, protect our lives and our property. But unfortunately, weather predictions are still not as accurate as we would like. In fact, you may be surprised to find out that forecasts over three days are still only correct about 50% of the time. In an effort to make weather prediction much more accurate, researchers at NASA are developing a revolutionary new weather satellite instrument called GIFS, or the Geostationary Imaging Foyer Transform Spectrometer. GIFS will provide more than 1,000 times more data than current satellite weather sensors. I spoke with Dr. Bill Smith at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. GIFS is a revolutionary new satellite sensor which will not only change the way we convey weather information to the public but will drastically improve weather forecasts. Today weather is very difficult to predict although weather satellites provide two-dimensional images of clouds which help us detect where storms currently exist Quantitative temperature, moisture, and wind data are needed to forecast where storms will develop and where they will move. The poor vertical resolution of current satellite observations now limits the range of useful forecasts to about three days. Currently, weather predictions are not only made from information gathered from satellites and radars, but a large part of the prediction information comes from ground-based weather balloons, which are launched into the atmosphere every 12 hours, about 500 miles apart. These readings create gaps of weather information between the balloons, with upper atmosphere conditions changing very quickly, making timely, accurate predictions with old data can sometimes lead to a confusing weather picture. To help change this, the GIFS satellite will update weather information used for atmospheric predictions in minutes rather than hours, without gaps in the geographical location. Most of the weather information needed for visualizing the current state of the atmosphere will come from GIFs, making the weather picture much clearer. GIFs is a three-dimensional digital movie camera. Being on a geostationary satellite and with a, a 3D camera, you can actually see water vapor, temperature, and even pollutant gases uh, move in the atmosphere. We will be able to see the temperature changes, the flow of water vapor molecules, and the upward spiraling air before the clouds appear, enabling us to detect the storm's location even before their destructive forces develop. Also, being able to watch the motion of the atmosphere in three dimensions will enable meteorologists to predict the future position of the storm and its changing intensity. By providing today's weather forecasting models with more data more often, it's projected that for the first time, weather forecasts can be made reliable many days in advance. Having reliable forecasts could potentially have huge economic advantages for our country. Outdoor workers will be better prepared for inclement weather. Homes and offices will be able to regulate thermostats better. And farmers and communities will be better prepared for storms, floods, and drought. Another potential economic and safety improvement will be in hurricane landfall predictions. Currently, 
24-hour predictions are given in about a 300 square mile radius of potential landfall locations. On average, it costs about $1 million per mile to evacuate a threatened coastline. Unfortunately, with poor forecasting, the public often delays evacuation until storms are very close to shore. If forecasters can make accurate landfall predictions within tens of miles rather than several hundreds of miles, more people might consider taking proper measures to secure their lives and their property. Will gifts be able to help in aviation as well? Actually, gifts will have a significant impact on both general aviation safety and the cost of uh, commercial flight. With regards to general aviation safety, gifts will help delineate where supercooled water exists in clouds, which causes airframe icing when an airplane comes in contact with it. It may also be possible to uplink this data directly into the cockpit of an aircraft. So a pilot looking at a screen, uh, like a TV screen, will be able to see uh, clouds which have these supercooled water droplets and avoid them during his flight. So what are your overall hopes for this system? Probably the most important thing is that GIFs will help us uh, understand weather processes, understand climate. GIFs will be able to observe not only weather variables, but also atmospheric pollution and see how it's transported around the globe. Of course, understanding weather better will help us improve uh, hurricane prediction and other severe uh, tornadic storm forecasts and the like. All in all, GIFs is uh, not only going to uh, create a much better life for human beings. It's going to save us property and, and probably most important, save lives as well. NASA's Aviation Safety Program, a project created to reduce the threat of weather-related aviation accidents, will also benefit from GIFS technology. Coming up, NASA's Commercial Invention of the Year may help save millions of people stricken with heart disease. But first, did you know that you can tell the temperature by listening to the chirping of a cricket? Crickets are called the poor man's thermometer because their activity is directly affected by temperature. Count the number of chirps a cricket makes in 15 seconds, add 37, and the sum will equal the Fahrenheit temperature. NASA's Commercial Invention of the Year, the VAD, or Ventricular Assist Device, represents the next generation in heart assist devices. This ingenious pump uses space-age technology to help keep patients alive while waiting for a transplant. Tonya St. Romain spoke with the VAD's co-inventor at NASA Johnson Space Center to find out more. Every year, approximately 20 million people worldwide suffer from heart failure, nearly 5 million of them in the U.S. alone. In many cases, a heart transplant is the best chance for survival, but unfortunately, only about 2,500 donor hearts are available each year, leaving many patients with little hope of survival. Until now. A unique device called the DeBakey Ventricular Assist Device, or VAD, is now able to prolong life until a suitable transplant heart is available. Based on the vision of Dr. Michael DeBakey and designed by NASA engineers, this device uses advanced flow technologies, first used in the space shuttle, to increase blood circulation for heart failure patients awaiting a transplant. I spoke with Jim Ackerman at NASA's Johnson Space Center to find out more. The assist device is a lot like a fan. You can imagine a fan in a little pipe, and it just sort of blows the blood along. Blood is a very fragile fluid, a very unusual type of thing to, to be pumping along. And there's been a lot of work for many years with plunger-type pumps that, that are able to handle the fluid very tenderly, but they've all been big and not very practical. The key to us, blood has to flow fast through it. And of course, that generates problems with turbulence and low pressure zones and blood damage. And it's, uh, it's just turned out to be a real challenge. Jim, how does the device work? The assist device essentially hooks to the left ventricle and a, a small hose comes up and connects onto this end of the pump. The blood flows in here. These little blades sort of screw into the blood flow. It runs 10,000 revolutions a minute the blood is rotating with the rotor. Then when it flows into the diffuser blades in the aft end of the pump, the blood rotating motion is decelerated, discharged, and flows over into the descending aorta. So how did NASA become involved in a medical project? Well, essentially, 
uh, they got involved with DeBakey through one of his patients. Dr. DeBakey, of course, is a, a heart surgeon. In fact, he invented the first pump that was used to support the life of the person while he worked on the, the heart. DeBakey had been working on a, a blood pump for like 30 years, trying to get something that was practical and realistic. And I think he had essentially pretty much thrown in the towel almost, because it was such a challenge, technically. And uh, he asked if maybe somebody down at NASA would be interested in, in looking into it. We went over the requirements, and, and uh, it, it became obvious that, that a special kind of technology was going to be required. Because blood is the operating fluid for the VAD, the device must be designed to gently propel blood through the apparatus to minimize damage to the red blood cells. In order to accomplish this, NASA engineers designed the pumping device to avoid regions of high stress and separated flow inside the pump. They also designed the pump to properly wash out all of the blood from low flow regions inside the device, helping to prevent the formation of blood clots. These modifications were accomplished by using the same type of complex computational flow models developed to increase fuel efficiency inside the space shuttle engines. By using a computerized model of blood flow for the device, researchers were able to refine the VAD's problem areas, gain valuable insight into the blood flow process inside the device, and most importantly, help save lives. Jim, how long is this device designed to work? It's designed to run for at least 100 days but we've already run it like 110 days and, and uh, no signs of any problem at all. As long as the bearings are still intact, it's still gonna function. Uh, we can envision the thing almost indefinitely. The really exciting part of it all is that, that with the extra circulation this little unit provides, there's a large percentage of the uh, patients that are recovering to the extent that they don't have to have a transplant. They're actually, the heart itself recovers with good enough circulation. That's a real advantage to know that a lot of people that need the support will eventually not need a transplant. It's really a, a challenge, fun kind of challenge that engineers really enjoy. And, and uh, with the technology NASA has, we were able to solve the problem. In the early days of the space program, many at NASA dreamed of extending our reach outside of the boundaries of Earth. One dream in particular was to send a spacecraft to another planet to determine if life existed beyond Earth. This is where the idea for the Viking mission was developed. This extraordinary mission was not only designed to land on the surface of Mars to do basic research, but to also perform scientific experiments to search for life on the red planet. Planning for the Viking project began on November 15, 1968, but the actual missions didn't launch until August and September of 1975 due to the complexity and challenge of the project. The mission included two identical spacecraft, each consisting of a planetary lander and an orbiter. Their primary mission objectives were to obtain high-resolution images of Mars, determine the composition of the Martian atmosphere and surface, and most importantly, to conclude if life existed in the summer of 1976, both Viking spacecrafts arrived at their destination. As they eased into orbit, onboard cameras began scanning for potential landing sites. After a favorable landing location was chosen, each lander separated and descended to the planet's surface. The landers touched down over 4,300 miles away from each other, making history by becoming the first mission to land spacecraft safely on the surface of another planet. Well, when we landed on Mars, I was quite jubilant especially jubilant when I knew after the second landing that we had two relatively successful landers. In fact, the experiments on both landers worked beautifully. Before the Viking mission was ever launched, many people thought Mars might harbor abundant plant life and microbes living among its rust-colored rocks. But the two landers quickly dispelled these notions. The landers revealed a world seemingly devoid of life at all. In an attempt to conclusively prove or disprove life on Mars, the two landers conducted three biology experiments by remote control from Earth. One of the experiments, called the Labeled Release Life Detection Experiment, collected soil samples that showed signs of possible microbes, but the consensus of scientists interpreting the data believed that the findings did not prove that life existed on Mars. We guaranteed it for 90 days, three months, and I think the lander landed 
and operated successfully for about six years, which was quite a surprise to me because I was familiar with the failure rates of parks. And it turns out that once a few failed, as they did on the way to Mars, when we got to the surface, we were relatively lucky and had very few failures thereafter. Together, the two landers accumulated 4,500 up-close images of the Martian surface. They also collected more than three million weather-related measurements, including the first on-site observations of a global Martian dust storm. The two orbiters circling high above the planet snapped 52,000 images covering 97% of the Martian globe. I was very thankful that I came to Langley. Those uh, spacecraft were successful not because of me, it was successful because we had such a tremendous pool of talent here at the field, and I hope that can continue into the future. I believe research ought to go on. That's the uh, best way to get your money back. You can't spend too much for research. The data retrieved from the Viking mission exponentially increased our knowledge of Mars. Volcanoes, canyons, craters, and evidence of surface water for the first time became apparent from the orbiter images. The Viking mission proved to be one of the most successful missions in NASA history, forever changing our understanding of Mars. In fact, it's been said that scientists learned more about Mars in the first five minutes of the Viking mission than in the 500 years before it. The last data from the Viking 2 lander arrived at Earth on April 11, 1980. The Viking 1 lander made its final transmission to Earth November 11, 1982. The total cost of the Viking project? $1 billion. Coming up, we'll see how NASA research is able to predict prevent and eliminate aircraft accidents with new technologies. But first, did you know that the Mars Odyssey spacecraft has detected evidence of ice below the surface of Mars? Using a device called a gamma ray spectrometer, the craft scanned the southern hemisphere of Mars, finding enough water ice to fill Lake Michigan twice. NASA's aviation safety program is developing innovative technologies that are making our skies safer. Researchers in one program called the Single Airplane Accident Prevention Program, or SAP, are hoping to use data available from aircraft and simulators to identify and correct aircraft system problems before they lead to fatal accidents. Derek Leonidoff explains. We've all heard that flying is the safest way to travel, and statistically it is. Even as our world's airspace becomes more crowded, flying today is actually becoming safer. But unfortunately, fatal aircraft accidents can still occur. That's why researchers in the Aviation Safety Program are working on revolutionary technologies that may make fatal aircraft accidents a thing of the past. The Single Aircraft Accident Prevention Project, or SAP, is part of the Aviation Safety Program that is developing new technologies that may help pilots recover and safely land an aircraft from a potentially fatal event. I spoke with John Foster in the Vehicle Dynamics Branch at NASA Langley to find out more about SAP. Well, the SAP project is uh, developing systems that will anticipate uh, failures on the airplane before they occur and help the pilot recover the airplane if an out-of-control uh, event should occur. What's, what's an example of an out-of-control flight situation? Well, there are a number of factors that can contribute uh, to an airplane loss of control accident. Uh, these factors can be both internal or external to the airplane. Some external factors may include uh, severe weather or just poor visibility. Some internal factors, though, could include some failure uh, in the control system, as well as uh, a structural failure or just an inappropriate crew input. In many of these situations, catastrophic failures cause the pilots to lose control of the airplane, resulting in a fatal accident. Researchers in the SAP project are working on new technologies which they hope will prevent these types of accidents from ever occurring again. They are developing a series of revolutionary systems that will not only detect and predict system or component failures before they become severe, but are also developing automatic control recovery systems, which will actually help pilots recover an airplane from an upset situation. Okay, so how do these systems help a pilot out? I mean, how do they work? Well, the vehicle health management system is being developed, which will continuously monitor the airplane's uh, health and compare that to the math model for a healthy airplane. In case a disturbing trend or an anomaly uh, occurs, it can send that information to the ground crews and they can take the appropriate maintenance action to fix the part after the airplane lands. Wow, kind of like an onboard doctor. 
Exactly, that's why it's called health monitoring. Another system being developed as part of the SAP project is the control recovery system. This system is being designed to help the pilot in case the airplane gets into a loss of control situation. That uh, system will carry a math model of a, a normal maneuvering airplane on board. And if the system detects that the airplane is about to enter a loss of control situation, it can alert the pilot and help him to recover the airplane, or it can automatically recover the airplane uh, for the pilot. These systems will not only be able to help a pilot regain control of an aircraft quickly, but will also be able to help land an aircraft that has suffered catastrophic damage. With these new systems on board commercial planes, pilots will be able to maintain safe flight even under the most adverse flight conditions, potentially making fatal crashes a thing of the past. Okay, so the systems you've mentioned are obviously computer systems, but we're standing here in a wind tunnel. How does wind tunnel testing help? Well, wind tunnels are used to develop pilot training simulators. We can take the data out of the wind tunnel uh, for extreme uh, flight conditions and put that in the simulator and allow the pilot to experience an out-of-control event and conduct training to learn how to recover from such a situation. Our goal is to provide the most realistic training possible uh, for the pilots in case they would enter an, a loss of control situation. John, how will these systems be tested before being implemented on an airplane? Well, there are several methods that we can use to test the systems before they are actually implemented in the uh, airplane. Uh, one is to use a, a subscale, dynamically scaled flying model of the airplane. In that model, uh, which is uh, remotely controlled, we can install the actual uh, systems in onboard computers and then fly the model through various uh, out of control uh, flight conditions and then see how the system works to recover the airplane. What are your hopes for the future of this project? I mean, what are the future goals of SAP? Well, flying is already a very safe form of transportation, but accidents still occur. And our goal in this research is to develop systems that will specifically help reduce those kind of accidents and save lives. The term virtual reality has become synonymous with futuristic technologies. Although it seems futuristic, it is being used every day by researchers as a cheap, safe, and efficient way to study complex computer data and environments. Even though it is being used every day, it is still not widely understood by the general public. Our Johnny Alonzo visits the Immersive Design and Simulation Lab at NASA Langley to help explain virtual reality and find out how it works. The great poet Walt Whitman once said, I accept reality and dare not question it. <laughs> well, if old Walt was here to see this, he just might question it. Today, NASA researchers are working in high-tech virtual reality simulation labs using numbers, graphics, mathematical models to create three-dimensional images of objects and environments. Man, it's like working inside a real holodeck. Now, I spoke with Dr. Chris Sandridge at NASA Langley's Immersive Design and Simulation Lab, better known as the cave, to find out how it works. What we're standing in right now is, is called a CAVE. It stands for CAVE Automatic Virtual Environment. Basically, it's a multi-screen theater where we can generate 3D images, 3D sounds, and simulate various uh, NASA missions. The CAVE has three walls made of 10 foot by 10 foot rear projection screens and a floor that is projected from above, giving the users a near complete immersion in computer generated graphics. The simulation looks like double images until you put on the goggles that gives everything a three dimensional quality. The hardware and graphics equipment used to operate the system were first developed for use in computer games and in the theme park industry. So how does this virtual environment work? We need the glasses to describe that. Basically what we have here are uh, shutter glasses and what they do is they kind of decode the, the stereo image so that we see the depth. Uh, basically, the computer is generating two images, one for your left eye, one for your right eye. Okay. And then there's a little sensor here on the glasses that is detecting a infrared uh, signal from behind the screen right. that synchronizes the glasses so you see a 3D image. In addition, the person who's actually running the cave is also being head tracked. There's a, a black box above us that is putting out a, an electromagnetic field that's being picked up by this antenna. And then that relays information back to the computer and tells the computer where the person is looking and what his head orientation is. 
and then it updates the, the visuals and it updates the sound based on this person's uh, position. And then finally, uh, because we don't have a mouse and a keyboard available to us, we need some type of an input device. So what we have here is the, the wand that we use to uh, control the application. It has uh, joysticks on it, it has some buttons, and then also it is tracked as well, so uh, the computer knows where the position of this is so we can interact with the environment. Check it out. So that's basically how it works. And then, of course, there's a kind of a supercomputer uh, in the back room that's kind of driving it all. So can you show me how this application works? Sure. Uh, put your glasses on and we'll right. we'll go to town. Got it, uh, man. Test drive this thing. This is a full-up configuration of the station, and we're using this application basically for two different environments, the, the radiation environment and the sound environment. Currently, NASA Langley researchers are developing tools to help design improved radiation shielding and reduce noise for the International Space Station. They're able to move equipment or install shielding in the virtual reality image and then observe and store calculations of what effects the changes make. The simulations can be shared with other researchers at distant locations via computer network connections. So, Johnny, you want to try to give it a shot? Absolutely. Right. Let me see this. So take the wand. Okay. You need to put it on these glasses because oh. these are the ones that are tracked. All right. Thank you. And the way it works is that you point the wand in the direction, uh, the direction you want to go and then push the joystick forward. Forward. To go forward. Oh, and you man. pull it backward to go backwards. <laughs> And then rotating is, is pulling the joystick left and right. Check you might want to back out and so you can see you fly around the station. Yeah, I'm going to throw up. All right. All right, there we go. <laughs> Rookie driver. Yeah. Here, take the wheel. Here, here your glasses Thanks. back. And I'll take these. So what are some of the other uses for this technology? Uh, another use that we're uh, just starting to work on is to develop a simulation to evaluate community noise of jets and aircraft flying near airports uh, to look at how we can uh, quiet the, the aircraft and be less intrusive uh, to the neighbors around the airport. And then finally, I guess, um, these types of cave environments are used uh, by the automotive industry to lay out the interior cockpit of the car so they'll in a virtual environment, they'll look at like where the mirror is, uh, where the console is, anything that where human factors are involved, and you can put it in actual size uh -huh. and look at it in the correct perspective before you build hardware prototypes, which are fairly expensive. Well, this was a lot of fun. This was really something else. And thanks a lot man, for everything. Yeah, no problem. Can I, one more question? Sure. Can I keep the glasses? Yeah, everybody wants the glasses. They <laughs> so are very cool. Stylish. Check these out, man. <laughs> That's all for this edition of Destination Tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. On Destination Tomorrow, NASA's HyperX program brings a trip to space a little closer with new scramjet engine designs. We'll also see how NASA engineers are developing new lightweight materials that are stronger than steel. And we meet a retired NASA engineer who many consider to be the father of modern hang gliding. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien, and welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. Today, flights into space are usually reserved for trained astronauts, but a new technology being developed by NASA may someday allow anyone the opportunity to travel into space. 
NASA's HyperX program is working on experimental engine designs that could eventually propel commercial planes into space. This new technology may make conventional rockets a thing of the past. Tonya St. Romain finds out more about this fascinating new program. Have you ever dreamed of going to your local airport and getting on a cross-country flight that would take you minutes instead of hours, or getting on a flight that would actually take you into space? This may seem like an unrealistic idea now, but in the near future, these dreams may actually become reality. NASA researchers in the HyperX program office are working on a new vehicle. It's called the X-43. The vehicle will demonstrate technology that could someday allow aircraft to travel at incredible speeds, even fly into space. The X-43 has a revolutionary new type of air-breathing engine called a scramjet that may enable future spacecraft to take off and land like an airplane instead of blasting off like a conventional rocket. The scramjet engine may also be used by commercial airlines, and that would significantly reduce the amount of travel time between destinations. I spoke with NASA manager Vince Rausch to find out more about the X-43 and the scramjet engine. Tonya, the X-43 is a revolutionary new kind of airplane. What we want to do with this is prove that hypersonic flight with an air-breathing engine is possible. Hypersonic flight means flying more than five times the speed of sound. Today, most airplanes fly below the speed of sound or subsonically. This airplane, the X-43, which you see here full scale, inverted in the wind tunnel, uses a new kind of engine to do that called a scramjet or supersonic combustion ramjet. Vince, what makes the scramjet so special compared to a typical engine? Well, the scramjet is very much like a jet engine as far as how it operates. However, if you look at a typical jet engine on today's airliners, what you see are fan blades in the front that compress the air before it goes into the combustor section where it's mixed with fuel and burn to produce thrust. The scramjet engine, such as this one, uses the forward velocity of the vehicle as it moves forward in the air to ram the air into the engine so it can do away with those fan blades. It then mixes the fuel, burns it, and produces a thrust. That's much more efficient at the higher velocities that this engine operates at than using uh, compressor blades. What's the technology that's going to make this plane fly into space? The technology primarily is that this engine, because it uh, doesn't have moving parts, is designed to operate over a wide speed range, can actually fly theoretically up to 25 times the speed of sound, which is orbital velocity. What we want to do with this vehicle is show that one of these engines actually works in flight, something that's never been done before. So we're really excited about taking this to flight, show that it works, and then from there go to bigger vehicles to show that we can actually make space access vehicles that fly like airplanes. The scramjet engine is very different from conventional rocket engines. In order to break free from the Earth's gravitational field, vehicles like the space shuttle use a fuel mixture of hydrogen and oxygen to propel the vehicle forward. Unfortunately, the oxygen and hydrogen must be carried in the vehicle, which significantly increases the weight, making it very expensive and inefficient to fly to space. Since the scramjet engine actually scoops oxygen into the engine from the atmosphere, it doesn't need the extra tanks to carry the heavy oxygen propellant. The scooped air, which is traveling above the speed of sound relative to the vehicle, is heated up as it reaches the combustion section of the engine. It's then mixed with hydrogen and burned quickly to provide thrust. This process allows the vehicle to move faster and faster, reaching orbital velocity, enabling the vehicle to break the gravitational field and fly into space. We have a long history here at NASA Langley of doing scramjet research. In fact, over the last 40 years, we've built and tested over 20 engines. We've run 5,000 tests. If you ran these tests end to end, we would actually have enough test time to fly five times around the globe. Unfortunately, there's some things that we can't duplicate on the ground in a facility such as this that we have to take to flight. So now what we're ready to do is take engines such as this Ramjet engine to flight. All right, let me get this straight. The X-43 uses an air-breathing engine. What makes it different from other vehicles that fly into space like the space shuttle? The the space shuttle uses rocket engines, obviously, instead of an air-breathing engine. What we want to do is take the cost of the space shuttle, which is about $10,000 a pound today, and by using an air-breathing vehicle, such as a follow-on to the X-43, drop that price down to a couple of hundred dollars a pound. That would mean that you and I could take a space trip, something that I'd very much like to do in the future. It would also, by operating like an airplane, take off and land on a runway. It would be much more flexible, much more reliable, and obviously much safer. So we want to really take airplane technology and apply it to space launch technology. And the scramjet is kind of a mix of both. And we're very excited about the potential for the future and what we're about in this program is starting to prove that that 
potential is really there. Vince, I know the X-43 is still in the initial test phase, but when might you and I expect that we could actually hop on one of these planes and fly into space? Tonya, we have a lot of work to do before we get to that point. Uh, the X-43 is the first step. Beyond the X-43, we hope to have an X-43C, which would be slightly larger, and then going from there into fully reusable systems where we test them many, many times. I would say that realistically, we're talking about being able to make a decision on building a real airplane uh, using the scramjet technology in the 2025 time frame. Currently, the world's fastest air-breathing aircraft, the SR-71, cruises slightly above Mach 3. The HyperX research vehicle will have the ability to fly at Mach 10, or 10 times the speed of sound, which is roughly two miles per second. Up next, testing shuttle tires at 250 miles an hour on the ground. But first, did you know that the X-15 was the first winged aircraft to investigate piloted hypersonic flight? From June 1959 to October 1968, the X-15 set the world speed record at Mach 6.7, or 4,520 miles per hour. It also set the altitude record of 354,200 feet and earned astronaut wings for five of its pilots. The term stronger than steel used to be synonymous with great strength. But today, many manufacturers are using new lightweight materials called composite materials rather than steel. This is because composite materials are generally stronger, lighter, and much more resistant to extreme temperatures than steel. NASA is using composite materials to make new spacecraft and aircraft parts that are tougher and more efficient than conventional parts. Derek Leonidoff takes us to the Advanced Materials and Processing Branch at NASA Langley to find out more. Have you ever heard the term composite materials? Even though most people don't know exactly what they are, there is no doubt that these materials are being used by most of us every day. More and more of the goods we use, like tennis rackets, golf clubs, cars, and even planes are made with these materials. But do you know what a composite material is or how one is made? Well, I spoke with researchers at NASA who are developing new composite materials that are not only lighter and safer than existing materials like steel, but also stronger. These researchers are also working with radical new materials called nanotubes that are thousands of times smaller than a human hair, but they may revolutionize the way future materials are made. A composite is really a generic term which describes a material that uh, is composed of one or more parts. And those parts are combined together in a way that you end up with a final material that has better properties than any of the individual components. An example of a composite that we see every day is a tree. A tree is composed of cellulose fibers that are bound together by a polymer called lignin. And when you combine these two components together, you end up with a tree which is very, very strong. A composite material is made when a combination of two or more materials are combined together to make a new and different material. Researchers take individual materials, one, a reinforcing material for strength and stiffness, and one, a glue or binding material, such as a resin, to surround and hold the reinforcement in place. When the reinforcing material and the binding material are combined, they make a new material. This new material usually is not only strong and resistant to extreme temperatures, but can be much lighter than the existing material. Similar to the tree, an analogous synthetic material is a graphite composite. A graphite composite is composed of um, carbon fibers, which are very, very strong. And to make a structural material using these carbon fibers, we consolidate it by combining it with this polymer matrix resin. This polymer matrix resin is kind of like a glue. And this is a, a large part of the research that we do here at NASA. Depending on the properties of this particular polymer, it will dictate the maximum temperature that you can use it at, and also how strong this material is. One of the ways that we can use the glue that Joyce Lynn talked about is to make it into little balls called microspheres. As you can see, it's mostly air. Since it's mostly air, we have the combination of a strong material that's also lightweight. What we do is we take the balls and we consolidate it into a foam piece. And because, again, the material is strong to begin with, you now have a very um, tough, lightweight structure. We then take this structure, combine it with carbon fiber. What we have done now is to have a lightweight structure that improves fuel efficiency, therefore it reduces the cost of travel, and we also have improved safety in aircraft travel. So Mia, what is the future of composite materials? I mean, where do we go from here? 
One of the things that we're looking into now is called nanotechnology. Nanotechnology presumes that we're able to go into the atomic level, move atoms, so that we can create materials in a very controlled manner. That way we can design materials very precisely. In the current technology, we use wires embedded in structures to sense defects in aircraft parts. We are trying now to reduce the size of these wires so that, in effect, we have nerves embedded in aircraft structures. Because carbon nanotubes are about 80,000 times smaller than human hair, we can embed many of them in an aircraft wing, for example, where they can perform a function similar to the nerves in our body. This technology will allow the wing to respond to changes in temperature and pressure in the atmosphere by changing their shape without using mechanical flaps. Because of this ability, we can now design the aircraft of the future to be safer and much more efficient. We think about biological systems like us. When we get cut, our body heals itself. Those are cells that are forming and going and doing their job. What we want to do is be able to get that kind of control over the types of materials that we make. Although we know that we want to get to a smart plane using carbon nanotubes, we don't know how to get there yet. And as Einstein said, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research. So that's the excitement of the work that we do. For centuries, man has dreamed of flying. Early artists and inventors, including Leonardo da Vinci and Otto Lilienthal, drew sketches and even built primitive hang gliders in the effort to soar with the birds. In the 1940s, a pioneering young NASA researcher named Francis Regalo developed a new design called the flexible wing. This design was not only considered for use in the Gemini and Apollo space programs, but also spawned the birth of hang gliding as a recreational sport. In the early 1960s, astronauts in the space program returned to Earth from space using parachutes deployed from a capsule. These parachutes enabled the capsule to splash down into the ocean safely. Although this proven technology was successful, NASA planners began looking for an alternative to the re-entry parachute. Many at NASA felt that astronauts should have more control over a capsule rather than just landing in the ocean. In answer to this request, an inventive NASA researcher named Francis Rogallo suggested using his flexible wing or paraglider to complete the task. Aerodynamically, a flexible wing works like a rigid wing, uh, but structurally it, it works like a parachute. So it's that combination of a parachute-like structure with a, uh, a rigid wing aerodynamic characteristics. The paraglider idea was intriguing. Its diamond profile and flexible covering would deploy from the top of the spacecraft and would fill with air to create drag, thus reducing the speed of the spacecraft. After the wing was deployed, it was designed to keep its shape with a series of tension lines. In theory, the astronauts would then be able to steer the spacecraft and touch down on land rather than splashing down in the ocean. Unbeknownst to the NASA planners, Regalo had already been working on the flexible wing design for over 20 years. Originally, Regalo had designed the flexible wing to be a low-cost vehicle that anyone could use to fly. One of our goals was to make it possible for anybody to fly. Because I know in my case, I wanted to fly. I, I, I tried to get in the Army Air Corps and the Navy Air Corps and none of them wanted me and I thought well gee many and and I didn't have the money to 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 do it on on my own it was so expensive and uh, so I had to find some way uh, that anybody could do it uh, with all almost uh, no money cost and I did ironically most of the work on this wing had not been done at NASA but by Rogallo and his wife at their home in fact the early models of the flexible wing were actually made from the Regalo's living room curtains. Regalo's paraglider concept was tested in wind tunnels and flight tested at NASA for over two years. But ultimately, the NASA planners decided to use the proven parachute re-entry system over the paraglider. Although NASA didn't use this idea for the space program, word began to spread about this new lightweight wing. By the early 1970s, Regalo's flexible wing had given birth to the new sport of hang gliding. Humans have wanted to fly for hundreds of years, but they just weren't able to do it. And, and now uh, anybody who wants to can do it. It's, it's simple and easy and cheap <laughs> because of our 
uh, invention of, the fl of flexible wings. Today, millions of people have flown hang gliders worldwide. Regalo's flexible wing has also inspired the design of paragliders, kites, and revolutionary parachutes. Regalo's flexible wing has not only proven to be reliable, inexpensive, and safe, but has allowed people to be introduced to the adventures and challenges of aviation. Mr. Regalo still hang glides on occasion off the dunes at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Coming up, we find out how NASA tests aircraft tires at over 250 miles per hour. But first, did you know that engineer Otto Lilienthal developed 18 different gliders between 1892 and 1896? Described by many as the world's first true aviator, Lilienthal's designs were used by many aviation pioneers, including the Wright brothers. Tragically, Lilienthal was killed in 1896 while flying one of his own gliders. His last words, sacrifices must be made. One of the most important components of any vehicle is its tires. Unfortunately, tires are often overlooked and poorly maintained. Worn treads or even bald tires can lead to hydroplaning on wet surfaces. When this occurs, control of the vehicle is lost. NASA Langley Research Center has a special facility that makes traveling safer by testing new tire tread designs and road surfaces. Paula Vaden finds out more about NASA's Aircraft Landing Dynamics Facility. Have you ever heard this sound? It's the impact of tires over grooved pavement. Developed at NASA Langley, grooved pavement limits hydroplaning on wet roads and runways, which helps automobiles, planes, and people travel safer. Most of this research is performed at a unique facility called the Aircraft Landing Dynamics Facility, or ALDEF. Besides developing grooved pavement, ALDEF tests aircraft wheels, tires, and advanced landing systems. The research gathered here develops safer roads, runways, and pedestrian walkways. I spoke to Bob Doherty of NASA Langley Research Center to find out more about this one-of-a-kind facility. Well, the ALDEF is a unique facility that NASA uses to test landing gear uh, components, tires, and even advanced landing gear uh, concepts uh, at full-scale conditions. The biggest advantage is this facility allows us to simulate full-scale conditions where it might otherwise be dangerous for a pilot or an aircraft to, to encounter. For example, if we tested this tire and, and it failed, uh, here at our facility, we've only lost a tire. We haven't risked any injury to a pilot or done any damage to a real aircraft, which gets very expensive. And of course, being able to run tests over and over quickly uh, at low cost uh, gets you a lot of data in a very short period of time. The key to doing that is getting whatever component we're looking at up to speed and making it think that it's on an aircraft or a spacecraft. We do that by taking this 60-ton carriage, propelling it up to the speed we want. We can get up to 250 miles per hour, and it only takes two seconds to do that. And then landing this tire, for example, on a runway, applying forces to it, steering it, and measuring those forces so that they can be simulated elsewhere in uh, a pilot training simulators and so forth. Well, Bob, tell me, how exactly do you propel the carriage? Well, that's really the neatest thing about this facility. Believe it or not, we use a giant squirt gun. We've got a pressurized water tank at the end of the track with a real high-tech valve. Um, we actually shoot an 18-inch stream of water at a bucket at the back end of the carriage, and that actually gives us the energy to launch the carriage. Now what's unique about this is it's, it's low cost. If we were a rocket, we'd have to carry our fuel with us, uh, and that's, that's very expensive to do. But since we're using low cost, low efficiency water power, we store all of our pressurized water at the end of the track and shoot it at the carriage. All we have to do is pay for the water and the electricity, and it only costs about $25 for each run. So at the speed of 250 miles an hour, how do you stop this carriage? Well, at the end of our track, we have an arrestment system. And that arrestment system consists of five cables that stretch across the track. And we have a nose block on the front of the carriage that lines up with those cables. So as the carriage continues to travel, the cables allow us to gradually dissipate the carriage energy in the last few hundred feet. So, Bob, what other kinds of things have you tested at ALDEF in the past? Well, over the years, we've tested a lot of different things. But probably the biggest accomplishment here at the ALDEF has been the pioneering work done on hydroplaning. An aircraft or highway vehicle tire hydroplanes mean water comes between a tire and pavement. 
When this happens, the tire loses contact with the pavement and is supported only by the water. This causes the tire to lose traction, which could then send the vehicle spinning out of control. Researchers at ALDEF have proven that by cutting thin grooves across concrete surfaces, channels or escape routes are created, which allow excess water to drain from the surface. This process of cutting grooves dramatically reduces the risk of hydroplaning. As a result, hundreds of commercial airport runways and interstate highway curves and overpasses have had these safety grooves added. Accidents on slippery highways are down as much as 85% in some areas, and aircraft tire friction in wet conditions has been improved by 200 to 300%. An added benefit of grooving is that the lifespan of these groove surfaces is extended by 5 to 10 years, resulting in significant maintenance cost savings. One of the things we're doing now is trying to increase the safety margin of uh, space shuttle orbiter tires. Uh, NASA wants to improve that safety by increasing the load carrying capability of the orbiter tire by about 20 percent and increasing the speed capability uh, by about 10 percent up to 250 knots. This is going to require a new tire design and the best place to evaluate that is right here at the ALDEF rather than on board an orbiter that costs several billion dollars. We're going to be looking at design considerations like uh, the structure of the tire itself and the tread patterns uh, to determine which design path to go down. So as long as tires have been around, Bob, it seems like we'd know by now how they behave. You'd think so, but as it turns out, uh, how a tire behaves, whether it's an automobile tire, aircraft tire, or a spacecraft tire, uh, is dependent on so many factors that technology is not yet at the point where we can accurately predict uh, the behavior of each and every tire. So that's where the ALDEF comes in again to test these things and improve the predictions. And we share that data with tire manufacturers so that ultimately they can provide a product that all of us can use more safely. The Aircraft Landing Dynamics Facility has been in continuous use since the 1960s. Researchers there have not only made runways and roads safer for all of us, but also coined the term hydroplaning. Wind tunnels have been around for over a hundred years. Even the Wright brothers used their own homemade wind tunnel to test ideas for their first flyer. Today, aircraft designs undergo significant wind tunnel testing before being built to full size and test flown. But what is a wind tunnel and how does it operate? For some answers, we turn to Johnny Alonzo to find out how it works. Wind tunnels have been around for well over a hundred years. Now, even before powered flight had been achieved, Aircraft designers like the Wright brothers use them to understand how air flowed over aircraft surfaces. Wind tunnels come in many different sizes and can reach speeds from 1 mile per hour to over 17,000 miles per hour. Most are used for testing aircraft, but they've also been used for testing things like cars, submarines, buildings, golf balls, and even wheelchairs. Wind tunnels are fairly simple devices, but have you ever wondered how one works? For some answers, I spoke with NASA Langley researcher Luther Jenkins to find out more. Well, a wind tunnel is actually a simulator. It allows us to simulate the conditions that an airplane or some other type of vehicle is actually going to experience as it's operating. So instead of building a full-size aircraft or a full-size car, we actually build a small-scale model testing the wind tunnel to see how it's going to perform. And once we see that it has the performance characteristics that we desire, then you may take it and start manufacturing it on a mass scale. Anything that's going to be exposed to the air or has to travel through the air can actually be tested in the wind tunnel to see how it will perform. Earlier you mentioned that um, wind tunnels come in different sizes, correct? That's true. Great. So um, how does that work? What, the bigger the fan, the faster the speed? Tunnels come in all shapes and sizes, but they're actually just two types of tunnels. One is an open return wind tunnel, and the other one is a closed return. And what it describes is the way the air flows through. In an open return wind tunnel, the inlet or the opening to the tunnel is open to the atmosphere or the environment, and the exit or where the air comes out is open to the environment. In between, what you have is your test section where you actually put your model, your test article, and then you have a diffuser which actually causes the air to slow down a little bit before it hits the fan and then the fan is downstream so it actually pulls the air or draws the air through the tunnel like a vacuum cleaner and then in your closed return tunnels those are a little bit more complicated because the air flows continuously around the loop you have to have turning vanes in the corners to actually turn the air so it moves through nice and smoothly you have a fan which is actually providing the air that goes through the tunnel and then you have your test section just like in the open return wind tunnel where you would place your model now 
All tunnels don't have fans. Some use just air sources. I mean, you can hook an air bottle up to the tunnel and turn it on and the air flows through the tunnel. Is air the only media that you can use in a wind tunnel? No, actually, wind tunnels use a variety of media. You can use air, you can use water, you can use nitrogen, you can use freon, you can use helium. And all of these different gases are used to actually produce certain conditions that the design or the aircraft is going to actually see when it flies. All right, so why do we still need wind tunnels? I mean, can't computers today do the simulation? Well, computers can be used to do a lot of the simulation work. But just like the Wright brothers, they would start off doing testing in the wind tunnel, and they had to do it over and over and over again until they arrived at the final design. Whereas now, a lot of that work could be done on the computer, but you would still, once you come up with your final design, you want to test it in the wind tunnel just to make sure that all of the things that you predicted with the computer occur in reality. Sure. A wind tunnel is a valuable tool for an engineer. Every plane that flies, every car that travels along the road, every bus, every ship, is tested in the wind tunnel to make sure it's going to perform as designed. And in that regard, we save time, we save money, and we also save a lot of lives. So remember, the next time you ride in a plane, a car, or even hit a golf ball, it was probably tested in a wind tunnel first. Sure wish I had a wind tunnel behind me now. Perfect. That's all for this edition of Destination Tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. On Destination Tomorrow, a revolutionary technology developed by NASA is being used to detect cancer instantly, leading to a more accurate diagnosis of this disease. Plus, in an effort to quiet our skies, NASA has a new program aimed at reducing noise generated by aircraft. And a record-setting unmanned aircraft called the Helios is changing the way scientists conduct Earth and atmospheric science missions. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien, and welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. NASA's new Helios aircraft is a remotely piloted flying wing, which is designed to operate at high altitudes for several months at a time. Developed with ultralight composite materials and with a wingspan of 247 feet, the Helios exceeds the overall length of a Boeing 747. Often referred to as an atmospheric satellite, Helios's mission is to conduct a wide variety of Earth and atmospheric science missions while flying on the edge of the atmosphere. Helios could also monitor weather, track hurricanes, and provide coverage of disaster sites such as fires, flooding, and earthquakes in order to precisely direct emergency resources. The Helios could also provide telecommunications and other services at a fraction of the cost of satellites, while providing a reliable means of collecting vital information. Greg Provan spoke with John Del Frate about the future of Helios and its unique design. Since the early 60s, the world has relied on satellites for a variety of different applications, including use in the telecommunications field and in weather observations. Although satellites have revolutionized the way we live, they are not only very expensive to build and fly into space, they sometimes don't make it into space at all. To help find new and less expensive ways to fulfill the need for satellite usage, researchers at NASA are developing an innovative type of low-cost aircraft, 
It's called the Helios and may be able to work much like a satellite, but at a fraction of the cost. This so-called atmospheric satellite will be able to fly at high altitudes for months at a time, providing a low-cost solution to current satellites. I spoke with John Del Frate to find out more. NASA is developing an experimental airplane, and we're using a, a, some technology that's been developed over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, we want to use solar cell technology and some very lightweight aircraft structure technology. By putting those two together, we think that we can build an airplane that can fly very high and then, more importantly, fly very long. We want to be able to do the mission of a satellite in some ways. And in this case, because we're doing it in a, on an airplane, it's, it would be like a poor man's satellite. So why do you think this would be a better solution than using existing satellites? Well, there's a few advantages that this kind of an airplane would give you over a regular satellite. For one, it's a lot less expensive. The other aspect is the satellite gets launched and the technology is ancient already. Um, an airplane like this could use technology that is current, the stuff that the scientists have just developed. Put it on the airplane, go up, fly it, test it, see how it does, bring it back down, change it. A satellite, once it's up there, it's, it's pretty much up there. So the hope is to have the Helios fly for months at a time. How's it going to stay in the air that long? We've already licked the problem of being able to fly under solar power. But now the question is, you know, we've got solar power. What happens when the sun goes down? Well, we're developing a system that is like a rechargeable battery, for example. Um, during the day, whatever excess power is produced by the solar cells, we capture that and store it on board. And then at nighttime, when the sun goes down, we use that power to power the electrical systems on the airplane. Although the Helios prototype uses new space age materials, the design is actually very simple. Weighing in at just about 1,600 pounds, this ultra lightweight, electrically powered all wing aircraft is constructed mostly of composite materials. It's assembled in six sections, each about 41 feet long, with an underwing pod attached at each panel. The pods carry the battery power system, flight control computers, data instrumentation, and the landing gear. The aircraft is powered by 14 electric motors, producing about two horsepower each, which drive lightweight, high altitude propellers. This amount of power allows the aircraft to cruise between 19 and 27 miles per hour with takeoff and landing speeds roughly about the same as a bicycle. The electric motors are solar powered, enabling the aircraft to produce enough energy during the day to stay aloft. When the sun goes down, the craft relies on proton exchange membrane fuel cell technology to power the motors. These unique fuel cells combine oxygen and hydrogen to produce electric power, heat, and water. As long as these gases are supplied, the unit continues to produce power, allowing the aircraft to remain airborne for days at a time. So what are some other potential uses for the Helios? We believe the airplane could be used to do some science research. Basically, the airplane can be loaded with sensors and instruments that study the Earth's atmosphere, look down, study things on the ground. Then you could be looking at volcanoes, you could look at the, the humidity in the air, the temperature of the air, a whole lot of things that could be studied. So science is, is important to NASA and this airplane could do some really good science over the next 10 years or so. Along those same lines, to be able to look down and look at the health of your forests, you could be looking at the health of crops, the health of your coral reef, the health of your riverways could be provided, and I think, in a much more consistent fashion. So, John, what are your hopes for the future of the Helios? Well, we see Helios going all over the world, tens, hundreds, thousands of these airplanes. In fact, some of the applications, I think, are still to be discovered. There's all kinds of things that we envision as being exciting ways of improving people's life here on Earth. And it's exciting because I think that for a lot of people, even for aeronautical type engineers, just 10, 20, 30 years ago, I think they were kind of thinking, airplanes have pretty much kind of reached the limits, you know, let's concentrate somewhere else. But you know, some of the things that are going on at NASA tell us otherwise. There's a lot of exciting stuff that's still left to be discovered, and this is just one part of that. NASA researchers believe that a Helios type aircraft may one day fly in the thin Martian atmosphere which is similar to the upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere. Up next, a revolutionary new technology is helping improve the early detection of breast cancer. But first, did you know that the Helios broke the altitude record for non-rocket powered aircraft? The original record of 85,068 feet was set in 1976 by the Mach 3 capable SR-71 Blackbird. 
the Helios, flying at speeds around 20 miles an hour, climbed above 99% of the Earth's atmosphere and set the new record of 96,863 feet in the summer of 2001. All of us know or have known someone with cancer. In fact, one in three Americans can expect to be diagnosed with some form of the disease at one point in their life. A key to treating and defeating this insidious disease is to find it quickly before it spreads. Now, thanks to enterprising work done by researchers at NASA, doctors may soon have a new device called the Smart Probe, which will be able to detect some forms of cancer instantaneously, greatly improving the patient's chance for survival. Tonya St. Romain finds out more. Breast cancer is one of the most frightening and deadly forms of cancer, afflicting over 200,000 women every year. Early detection of the disease has helped many women find and treat the cancer quickly, but early detection technology is still not as good as it could be. To help improve the early detection of breast cancer, researchers at NASA have developed a revolutionary technology called the Smart Probe. This probe will be able to detect the presence of cancer much more precisely than current technology. Intended for long-duration space missions, this device could soon be saving lives here on Earth. I spoke with Dr. Robert Ma at NASA Ames Research Center to find out more. At this point, when a woman suspects a, uh, a lump in her breast, she would go in to see a physician. The physician would examine and then decide whether to take a, have a mammogram made of the, uh, the lump. And from the mammogram, you could tell whether it may be uh, malignant or not. If it is suspected to be, they would then go in for a biopsy. They normally go in with uh, using an ultrasound to guide a biopsy needle and go in there and extract samples of the, the lump. And that tissue sample gets analyzed by pathologists. And that could take days uh, in some cases. If it is uh, malignant or cancerous, they have to go in there and take out as much as they possibly can. Every week in the United States, approximately 16,000 women needlessly undergo surgical breast biopsies where no cancer is found at all, while another 4,600 breast cancers are missed each week during physician review of mammograms and physical examinations. This is primarily due to the fact that initial breast cancer screening procedures do not provide specific information about known cancer indicators. For example, a light spot on a mammogram x-ray can be many things other than cancer, leading to a missed or inaccurate diagnosis. The new NASA Smart Probe is designed to see a suspicious lump in a breast, determine by its features if it is indeed cancerous, and ultimately predict how the disease may progress. The process of diagnosis begins when a small needle, which is mounted on the probe, is inserted into the lump. The probe is able to detect if the lump is cancerous or benign instantaneously, providing real-time detailed interpretations at the needle's tip, supplying an accurate diagnosis in seconds rather than days. What's behind this technology is the software. The software that we develop learns like people do, it learns from experience. So when we stick the probe into different types of tissue, we teach the software that those characteristics are certain types of tissue normal tissue, or whether it's, um, say, normal muscle or normal fat tissue, cancerous or different types of cancer. If it is cancerous, instead of having to remove tissue around the tumor with a very wide margin, you could take less tissue out and you'd be more certain that you're not leaving behind malignant tissue there. So what you get here is, is confidence level as to what, what kind of tissue that it's that the probe is seen. How did NASA get involved in breast cancer research? It was clear that to put man on Mars and have him survive for three years, you need to provide him with smart tools uh, for many different tasks. And the medical emergency is one of those. So that's where we started to uh, work in that direction. In preparation for a three-year-long mission to Mars, NASA planners have begun to develop smart medical robotics. These robots will be able to assist an astronaut physician in performing medical procedures if a problem occurs during a mission. With Mars being over 30 million miles away, this is particularly important because a transmission to Earth would take 20 minutes, further endangering the stricken crew member when every second counts. How else might this technology be used here on Earth? This technology has great potential. It could be used for, for spinal surgery, it could be used for prostate cancer detection, it could be used for brain surgery, and just surgery in general, where you want to minimize injury to critical targets. 
Dr. Ma, what are your overall hopes for the Smart Probe? I'm very excited about this technology because what we're developing in space can be applied for Earth use. I think uh, a tool like this, the technology behind it, will revolutionize how medical practices will be carried out to be able to uh, provide real-time diagnosis for virtually any kinds of uh, medical problems they may have. So for me personally, it's very rewarding to see that uh, the potential that it saves people's lives or even minimize the risk to, you know, hundreds and thousands of people. That's, that's really rewarding. When discussing manned space missions, the two American programs that are the most talked about are the Mercury and Apollo programs. One program that does not get as much attention, but which was instrumental in getting man to the moon, was Project Gemini. The Gemini missions flew between the Mercury and Apollo programs and allowed astronauts and planners to practice many of the procedures that would be important for future moon flights, paving the way for man to walk on the moon. Early in January of 1962, Project Gemini began. Because of the large time frame between Project Mercury and the Apollo flights, it became clear to NASA officials that more training in spaceflight was necessary to get men to the moon and back safely. Unlike the Mercury capsule, which could only hold one astronaut, the aptly named Gemini capsule could hold two astronauts and could be maneuvered in space by the crew. The ability to maneuver in space allowed astronauts to train for space rendezvous and docking. Learning these procedures would be critical to successfully return from the lunar surface and docking with the command module in lunar orbit. Gemini also needed to provide useful information about how the human body and man-made equipment would respond in the harsh environment of space. Up to that time, no one knew exactly what would happen to astronauts after being exposed to long-term microgravity. The program would consist of 10 manned missions, all of which were to be completed in 12 months. After two unmanned missions, the first manned mission, Gemini 3, was launched on March 23, 1965. The flight was a complete success, proving how easily the astronauts could maneuver the craft. The flights that followed all saw success as well, including the first American spacewalk on Gemini 4, the first docking with two vehicles in space by Gemini 8, and a long-duration mission which lasted 14 days by Gemini 7. With the final flight of Gemini 12, all of the major objectives were met, as well as many other mission objectives. With all the critical theories tested and proven, it was time for Apollo to go for the moon. The 10-manned Gemini flight spanned 603 days and accumulated over 1,940 man-hours in space. Of the 20 astronauts who trained for the Gemini flights, 15 of them went on to subsequently fly on Apollo missions in the lunar program. As the successes grew in Project Gemini, it became clear that man could, should, and would fly to the moon and back safely, making history in the process. Because the crew consisted of two astronauts, the project was named Gemini for the third constellation's twin stars, Castor and Pollux. Coming up, we'll find out how NASA is helping to reduce aircraft noise. But first, did you know that the Gemini 3 was the only Gemini spacecraft to have a nickname? Because Capsule Commander Gus Grissom's previous spaceflight ended in the sinking of the Liberty Bell 7 capsule in the Atlantic Ocean, Grissom decided to name his capsule the Molly Brown, after the Broadway musical, The Unsinkable Molly Brown. The United States aviation industry is a significant contributor to the nation's economy, boasting annual sales in excess of $36 billion and providing nearly one million jobs. However, with all of these benefits, one major drawback continues to be aircraft noise. In an effort to help alleviate excessive noise, NASA has developed the Quiet Aircraft Technology Program. This program is finding new and innovative ways to reduce noise created by aircraft. Jennifer Pulley finds out more. Noise generated by aircraft is already a major issue in airport neighbor communities. As airports expand to increase productivity and capacity, the noise issue will become even more critical. Noisy aircraft not only affect the people in communities surrounding the airport, but also the crew and passengers inside the planes. In an attempt to solve many of the noise issues associated with aircraft, 
NASA has embarked on an intriguing new mission to quiet our skies, called the Quiet Aircraft Technology Program, or QAT. This program will develop technologies to reduce aircraft noise by 50% in five years, and begin working on the technologies to reduce aircraft noise by 75% in the next 20 years. I spoke with Andy Powell at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. Well, on takeoff, most of the noise that you hear is due to the engine, both the fan in the front of the engine and the jet exhaust noise out of the rear engine. Now, what most people don't know is that on landing, a lot of the noise that you hear is actually due to the airframe passing through the air itself. Uh, this is because that on landing, the engine power is cut back, and a lot of parts of the aircraft are extended into the airflow and create turbulence. Now, the major sources of this airframe noise is the landing gear, the flaps on the trailing edges and slats on the leading edges of the wings. In a recent government survey, noise was listed as the greatest environmental concern at airports. It is estimated that in the last 20 years, approximately $4 billion has been spent on or around airports to reduce noise pollution. This includes adding sound insulation to homes and schools in close proximity to an airport. Unfortunately, these techniques only help if you are inside an insulated building. Researchers at NASA realize that in order to fix the noise problem, they must first start at the source, the planes themselves. By designing and testing low noise producing aircraft parts and structures, NASA researchers are developing the technologies to reduce aircraft noise by half in five years and by as much as three-fourths by the year 2020. Andy, what are some of the things you're working on here at NASA to make aircraft quieter? First, we do studies to look at the sources of noise to try to determine which are the dominant sources so that we can know which sources to work on the hardest. Then we do other studies to try to determine the physical phenomena that are creating the noises and what we can do to reduce the level. And then we go out and test concepts, either in wind tunnels or in the laboratory, and in some cases, in actual flight tests to validate those concepts. Some of the things that we're doing is to look at advanced fairings to put around the landing gear, to smooth the flow around the landing gear so that you don't have as much turbulence and therefore reduce the noise. We're also looking at other fairings that we can put on the slats so that you don't have side edges to create noise. We're also modifying the fan blades so that they're actually quieter from the design of the fan blades. If you can smooth the airflow around these parts, then reducing that turbulence will reduce the noise considerably. Andy, what about the exhaust noise coming out of an aircraft? Okay, well, one of the things that we did was look at what we call chevron nozzles. These are actually scallops in the back of the exhaust pipes, or essentially, of the aircraft. And as hot exhaust gases come out of an aircraft engine, then they mix with the surrounding air, and this turbulence, when they're mixing, creates a lot of the noise that you hear. Now, by putting these chevrons uh, along the edges, we're changing the shape of the turbulence so that you raise it to a higher frequency, which then is absorbed more by the atmosphere than the low-frequency normal jet noise. The chevron nozzles have actually been test flown full-scale on a major aircraft. Uh, and we expect that these will actually be coming in on the production of aircraft engines in the very near future. We've talked about engine and airframe noise. Are there other ways to reduce noise without major design alterations to an airplane? Yes, we're actually looking at new ways to fly the aircraft around the airport so that they minimize the exposure of people to the aircraft noise. For instance, around a lot of airports, they fly noise abatement procedures to get the flights away from schools and houses. But in some situations, if the wind is blowing, these flight paths may not be the optimum flight path because of the effects that wind has on the sound propagation. So we're doing studies on improving the prediction of sound propagation to include the effects of wind, weather, and this way we hope that we will be able to reduce the noise and have the planes fly optimal paths. And finally, what are your overall hopes for the QAT program? Well, one of the three elements in NASA's vision is to improve life here on planet Earth. And we think through this quad aircraft technology program, we're making a major contribution to improving the life for people uh, and the environment around airports, both in the nation and throughout the world. Ultimately, NASA would like to reduce airport noise so that no one outside the airport boundary is adversely affected. There is no doubt that spacesuit design has come a long way. Early U.S. spacesuits were adapted from pressure suits designed for pilots of high altitude military and experimental aircraft. Today, modern suits are a reliable and mobile unit that astronauts depend on during spaceflight. Our own Johnny Alonzo found out more about spacesuits and how they work. Space is an incredibly brutal environment. 
Not only is there no atmospheric pressure or oxygen to sustain life, but human explorers must also deal with intense radiation and extreme temperatures in order to perform even the most basic tasks. Inside a spacecraft, the atmosphere can be controlled so that special clothing isn't needed. But when outside, humans need the protection of a spacesuit. In 1961, astronaut Alan Shepard wore one of the first suits designed for spaceflight aboard the Freedom 7 spacecraft. This suit was actually a modified version of a Navy high-altitude jet aircraft pressure suit. Spacesuits have come a long way since then. The current Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or EMU, is the result of many years of research and development, and is also a powerful tool for operations outside the International Space Station and the shuttle. Now, I spoke with engineer Phil West to find out how it works. Most people have this preconceived idea that a spacesuit is pretty simple heavy cloth and things, but sure. it's really a mini spacecraft that lets you step out into this very harsh environment. What are the consequences of not wearing a spacesuit? Well, it's a bad day if you don't wear your spacesuit. Yeah. First of all, there's a vacuum in space, right? So just like when you open a soda bottle, it's going to fizz, right? Sure. Your body will do the same thing. And literally what's happening is your, your body fluids, your blood and everything are going to boil, all right? And it's not because of temperature, it's because of pressure. Remove the pressure and whoosh, that stuff wants to come out. So then you've got temperature extremes. And I don't mean temperature of space. You need molecules to have temperature. But your temperature, the spacecraft temperature, could get very cold or very hot, depending on whether you're in the sun or in the shade or the things around you. Sure. OK, and then there's little particles of natural or human-made stuff that fly around space at high speeds and could, yeah. could literally hit, your, hit you, yeah. Or micrometeoroids, natural stuff that comes in from elsewhere. What are modern spacesuits made out of? Think of the spacesuit as a balloon shaped like your body. All right, and we've got to have a layer to make that balloon. So we use this urethane coated nylon. Okay, that's like camping tent material, but it's got a coating on it to seal it up. And that's the basic layer that holds all the gas in. We put that and we make it the shape of your body. We call it the bladder. Now, what would happen to a balloon if you inflated it too much? And it'll pop. Right, pop, which is bad. So in a spacesuit world anyway. Right. So we got to constrain it. We got to make sure it's the right shape. So we use this polyester layer to give it structure and strength and make sure it's the right shape of your body, the right size, arm length, etc. So that's the first two key layers of the spacesuit. Then remember temperature extremes we talked about? Yes. Okay, we have five layers of aluminized mylar. So now think of the spacesuit as a thermos bottle. You know how a thermos bottle works? It's got a vacuum sure. between an insulator and a glass jar with a silvery coating on it. So that's for thermal protection. And then a real tough layer of what's this? Nomex with Teflon coating on it. I feel that's kind of slick, right? Yeah. And it's got Kevlar woven into it, a very strong fiber. Okay. And that's so you don't get tears and you protect all these other layers very well, right? You don't want to get a hole in here because you don't want to get a hole back here in your you bladder. Don't, right. Phil, how do these spacesuits operate? Well, you've got a control pack on the front and a life support system on the back, all right? And that life support system is more than just oxygen. It's got batteries for power, a radio for communications, um, computer, sure. and a bunch of plumbing and things okay. to keep you alive. Okay. And that's all controlled up in the front here with this control pack. And so we've got some places for the astronaut control, like their communications equipment. You can open that valve if your suit pressurizes. There's a little huh. dial there to change your communications mode. And a little display to tell you, hey, you know, Johnny, you've only got 3% battery power left. Not a good Pack up your toys. And yeah bring it on in, <laughs> and then controls in the front here for volume and your, your position, whether you're inside or outside the spacecraft, is uh, up here on the front. And what's this dial? Well, that's for temperature. Remember, we're inside a thermos bottle, okay? And you're, you're a heat engine. You're actually producing heat. You're not just sure. like hot chocolate. Okay. Hot chocolate in a thermos bottle stays warm, but it doesn't get any hotter. You would get hotter, right? You'd overheat. Literally, your own body heat would be your downfall because your body heat is, is going to have nowhere to go. It's going to be trapped in there with you. Right. That's, what, that's what happens in a spacesuit. So literally what we'll do is pump cold water all over your body through long underwear like this. Check that out. All right. And so that is plumbed. This connects inside the suit. And then this dial controls the temperature of the water that flows over your body through all these tubes. There's enough tube in there to stretch the length of a football field. Really? And you can actually see the water. See the air bubbles in there? Yeah, There's a few air yeah, bubbles. Sure, sure. It's all charged right now. So Phil, um, off the record. Yeah. How do you relieve yourself from one of these? Good, good question. <laughs> you know, well, you've got a drink bag, so you're going to want to drink some water, and eventually that's got a place to go. Well, it's pretty technical. It's a diaper. Lovely. The whole idea was, let's save money, let's use adult off-the-shelf diapers. We sell extra material into them. They work great if you can get past the idea that your mom told you not to go in your pants. Hey, Phil, thanks a lot. You yeah. Know, give us all the info about our spaces. Sure. Listen, I was wondering, um, can I get like a souvenir off this? Oh, man. <laughs> I wish I could, but there's no so really, you know, it's cool. pretty nice stuff. We really can't wait. Let me think. Well, you know what? Actually, we don't, this is used. We don't need the diaper anymore. You can have that. <laughs> That's all for this edition of Destination Tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time.
Coming up on Destination Tomorrow, NASA is preparing new Mars exploration missions that might help explain many unanswered questions about the red planet. Plus, a new device developed at NASA will give parents a second set of eyes, keeping their children safer. And we meet a retired NASA engineer whose revolutionary design helped launch America into the space age. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. Welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. In the near future, NASA is planning a series of new Mars exploration missions aimed at finding out more about the Red Planet. Newer, larger, unmanned rover vehicles will be able to travel much farther than previous missions, acting as geological surveyors exploring the surface of Mars. NASA planners expect to land two identical rovers in different regions on the planet's surface. The twin rovers will be exploring Mars climate history while searching for organic materials and signs of water and life. Tonya St. Romain finds out more about NASA's new Mars rover and its incredible journey to the Red Planet. For hundreds of years, humans have dreamed of exploring the planet Mars. One important reason for this is that, other than Earth, Mars is the planet with the most hospitable climate in our solar system. The climate on Mars is so hospitable, in fact, that many scientists believe that liquid water may have once flowed over its surface, harboring primitive bacterial life. In an effort to investigate these intriguing possibilities, NASA's planned several new Mars exploration missions. NASA planners hope these missions will help explain many unanswered questions about the Red Planet and how those answers will affect us here on Earth. I spoke with Preysen Desai from NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. In mid-2003, two Mars exploration rovers will be launched to explore the surface of Mars. You may remember the Pathfinder mission from a few years ago. Uh, these are very similar, but have some major differences. The Pathfinder mission had a lander, which acted as a base station, and a small rover, which was about a foot and a half in length. The 2003 rovers have many more instruments and will be able to traverse much longer distances on the surface of Mars. These new rovers will act like mobile field geologists. This mission is actually very exciting compared to previous missions. For the first time, the rovers will be able to go much greater distances away from the lander. And for the first time, we could also get, go to a hill on top of it and see what's over it. And so we would be able to cover a lot more different areas and see different geological features to try to get a better understanding of how Mars is evolving uh, in those regions. Preysen, what's the process of getting the rovers to Mars? Well, Tonya, the rovers will be launched on Delta rockets in June and July of 2003. The rockets will provide the appropriate speed needed to get the spacecraft to go to Mars. The spacecraft consists of a crew stage, which uh, supply the communications and power during the seventh month journey to Mars, and a lander, which has the rover inside it. Upon arrival at Mars in January 2004, the landers are separated and enter the Martian atmosphere. Once the lander enters the Martian atmosphere, the aeroshell design will slow the entry from 12,000 miles per hour to about 900 miles per hour. A parachute will then deploy, further slowing the spacecraft. Then, airbags will inflate around the craft to cushion the landing. About 600 feet above the surface, retro rockets will fire, slowing the craft even further. Once the spacecraft stops rolling, the airbags will deflate and pedals will open up, bringing the lander to an upright position. Since the rovers carry all of their instruments on board, they'll be able to start exploring the planet almost immediately without having to stay close to the lander. How will the rovers be commanded? Will they be driven by remote control from Earth? Actually, the controllers from, from the Earth will only command the rovers to specific soil and rock targets. It'll be up to the rovers to find their own way to get there. The reason we have to do this is because a signal from Earth takes too long to get to Mars to have us operate them by remote control. 
As a result, the rovers must be able to operate autonomously. We will uh, decide from, based on the information we get from the cameras and instruments that are sitting on the rover, where are good sites to go to and then command the rovers to go there. We hope the rovers will be able to travel up to a half a mile from the landing site. Okay, so once a rover gets to a rock of interest, how will it examine it? The rovers have many different uh, instruments on there that allow us to examine the rocks down to the microscopic level. Uh, once we analyze this type of information, we can tell a lot of different things about the rock themselves, like their mineralogy, uh, elemental chemistry, uh, their surface texture. This type of information will give us evidence of ancient environmental conditions and the possibility of some type of biological activity occurring. Recent satellite images of Mars show geologic features like channels, which support the theory that liquid water once flowed over the surface. Today, the Martian temperature is too low and the atmosphere too thin for liquid water to exist on the surface, but many scientists believe that liquid water may still exist below the surface of Mars where temperatures are not as harsh. If the rovers find convincing evidence of liquid water on Mars, then it's also possible they may find proof of life on Mars as well. There is a lot of evidence that there's frozen water just below the surface of Mars, and a lot of these missions that we're trying to go to Mars in the next few years trying to get a better understanding of how much water is, is there and is it in the liquid form near the surface somewhere. Three billion years ago, Mars and Earth were very much alike. You know, Mars was at that time much wetter and much warmer than it is now, and something has happened. So by trying to get a better understanding of how Mars' environment has evolved, it will give us a better understanding of potentially how the Earth's environment would evolve and give us an idea of how uh, it's going to change in the future. So by studying Mars, it may be able to tell where our future is headed on this planet? Exactly. The reason we are exploring Mars and other places in the solar system for that matter is to help answer the two fundamental questions. One, to explain the formation and evolution of our solar system and the Earth within it. And two, to seek the origins of life and its existence beyond the Earth. During the next decade, Mars will be the solar system's most popular travel destination. There are plans for nearly a dozen Mars missions being planned by three countries, the United States, Russia, and Japan. Coming up, a new device developed by NASA might help parents and caregivers keep an electronic eye on their children. But first, did you know that the Viking 1 spacecraft was the first craft to land on the Martian surface on July 20th, 1976? With its companion craft, Viking 2, the two landers analyzed atmospheric and weather conditions, collected soil samples, and took over 56,000 pictures of the planet's surface. Unfortunately, in recent years, there has been an alarming increase in deaths of infants and small children after being left unattended inside a vehicle. A new device developed at NASA may help to stop this disturbing trend from growing further. Inspired by aircraft flight test technology, the Child Presence Sensor has been designed to help prevent these tragic deaths from ever occurring again. Jennifer Pulley finds out more. According to a national nonprofit safety organization called Kids in Cars, 81 infants and small children died last year while being left unattended in and around a vehicle, up nearly 100% from the previous year. In many cases, parents simply forget they've left their children unattended, while others leave their children in a car for a few minutes to run errands. Unfortunately, leaving a child in a car for even a short time can end tragically because temperatures inside a car can soar or plummet in just a matter of minutes. In an effort to combat this deadly problem, NASA has developed a safety device called a child presence sensor. This sensor alerts parents who inadvertently leave their children strapped in car seats. I spoke with Chris Edwards of NASA Langley's Laser Systems branch to find out more about this fascinating innovation. Well, the inspiration for the child safety sensor came from an incident that happened that I read about uh, where a child had died from being left in a vehicle. I really wanted to develop a technology that would prevent this from happening, uh, sort of a second set of eyes and ears. And I looked at technology that was out there and realized there really wasn't any. Uh, there's nothing a consumer could purchase to prevent that from happening. And I looked at how the incident occurred and then realized that that could really happen to anybody, uh, being that a change in routine, something like that. It's usually a series of events that happen. I really wanted to break that chain of events. so. We decided to go ahead and form a team, uh, Terry Mack of Lockheed Martin, Ed Milan of Langley, and develop the technology. 
and, uh, and make it affordable and easy to use for the average person to be able to just install it in any car seat, in any vehicle, uh, and, and give them and that child a second chance. This is how the child present sensor works. A thin sensor is placed between the cushion and the frame of the baby seat. The sensor, or switch, has a large activation area with a sensitivity of about 8 ounces. Attached to the switch is a transmitter that mounts on the baby seat. The sensor switch triggers immediately when a child is placed in the seat and deactivates when the child is removed. The sensor will detect weight once the child is placed in the seat and transmits a unique code to a keychain alarm module with a corresponding radio frequency. If the driver moves too far away from the vehicle, a small alarm built into the keychain sounds 10 warning beeps. If the driver doesn't return within one minute, the alarm will beep continuously and cannot be turned off until it is reset on the transmitter. How did NASA contribute to the development of this child safety device? At NASA we have a 757 uh, aircraft as a flying laboratory that we use for aviation safety and they have an experiment on there that takes data that dealt with the uh, stresses on the landing gear and transmitting that data back into the aircraft with a radio frequency link. And we took a similar approach with the child safety sensor and that we monitor the, if the child is in the seat and we send that data to the receiver which is on the keychain that a driver would hold. So we, we were able to use that technology uh, and it inspired us to develop the child safety sensor. So what are your hopes for the future of this invention? Well, the main goal is to save lives. Uh, we're currently seeking commercial partners to license the technology. Uh, we've designed it to be inexpensive. It'll cost, uh, it depends on how many units are produced, but certainly the 20 to $30 range is reasonable. And that's what we're currently shooting for. So if we can get a commercial partner, uh, a lot of the technology, most all of it's been developed, so it should go to market fairly quickly. I, when I started this, I really wanted uh, anybody at a, a department store or whatever to, to come and be able to pull this off the shelf, put batteries in it, place it in their car, and provide that second chance. Today, most of us take the idea of manned space flight for granted. But during the late 50s and early 60s, the idea of manned traveling in space was an exciting challenge to be conquered. In the early days of the space program, engineers knew very little about the effects of space travel and re-injury into the atmosphere. But one man, Dr. Max Faget, came up with a revolutionary design that helped launch America into the space age. During the late 50s, engineers debated over which type of craft should be used to launch man into space. The debate centered on whether the U.S. should continue refining the X-series of rocket planes or to build an entirely new type of craft to achieve orbital flight. While this debate was occurring in the U.S., the Russian space agency successfully launched Sputnik, the first satellite into space, in October of 1957. The space race had begun, and the U.S. was already far behind. After hearing about the successful flight of Sputnik, Engineers began to design and test new spacecraft at a frenetic pace. The U.S. had some expertise in building long-range ballistic missiles, but was having difficulty designing a vehicle to carry man into space and bring him back safely. One day while playing pinochle after lunch with a co-worker, engineer Max Faget began sketching out a design for a new spacecraft on his napkin. This new craft had a blunt-shaped bottom and was designed to fit on top of a ballistic missile. With his idea in hand, Faget began a series of crude experiments to test his design, one of which included tossing a paper plate out of a window to test the basic aerodynamic principles of the design. Faget's idea for a blunt-shaped craft was ill-received by many aerodynamicists of the time. Researchers thought the most effective way to orbit and return to Earth would be in a low-drag aerodynamic vehicle. Although this vehicle had merit, Faget knew that an aerodynamic aircraft would create excessive amounts of heat, causing major structural and safety problems for the astronauts. Well, everybody that had to do anything with flying through the air would always try and keep the drag down as much as they could. So, so the original versions of ballistic missile reentry vehicles were all highly streamlined, and, and uh, they had everybody working on ways to keep them cool. Faget alternatively proposed that his new blunt body design should be used instead. He reasoned that his design would create a huge shock wave around the spacecraft, moving the heat away and keeping the craft cooler upon re-entry. Faget began to push his idea as the best one to get the job done quickly and safely. 
that particular shape, it, it wasn't really an invention. That, that, that's just a piece of nature. There isn't any shape that'll have less heating than a Merkur shape. It, it, it's it. After a series of wind tunnel tests, his blood-shaped vehicle was proven to be the most successful design. Paget's space capsule design was adopted in the late 50s. Astronaut Alan Shepard became the first person to fly in the Mercury spacecraft designed with a blunt shape. This design proved to be so successful that a variant of this craft was also used in both the Gemini and Apollo space programs. Paget's foresight and tenacity overcame many technical challenges and helped launch America into the space age. Dr. Faget not only designed the Mercury spacecraft, but he also played a major role in designing virtually every U.S. crewed spacecraft since that time, including the Space Shuttle. Coming up, Destination Tomorrow looks at revolutionary new concepts in micro-vehicle designs being developed by NASA. But first, did you know that the first Mercury flight, Freedom 7, was not Alan Shepard's only flight into space? Shepard also commanded the Apollo 14 flight on February 5, 1972, becoming the fifth man to walk on the moon and also the oldest at age 47. In recent years, a goal of many researchers has been to develop products that can not only improve safety, but also save money. Researchers in the Small Unmanned Aerial Vehicle Lab, or SWAV lab at NASA Langley, have been working on revolutionary micro-vehicles that have been designed not only to save money, but also to save lives. Derek Leonidoff explains. Unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, may look like typical toy airplanes, but this technology should not be taken for granted. UAVs are being used for a variety of different tasks, including law enforcement, search and rescue, and specific military operations. Currently, researchers in the Small Unmanned Aerial Vehicle Laboratory, or SWAV Lab, at NASA Langley are developing unique UAVs to perform in high-risk situations that may be too dangerous or costly for humans. I spoke with Mike Logan at NASA's Langley Research Center to find out more. Primarily what we're trying to do is solve problems for people. They will come to us with a particular problem and we try and design and develop a small airplane to help solve that problem. In some cases we may use brand new technology that we're developing here at NASA to incorporate in these small airplanes that help us to solve those problems. So they can come to us where they wouldn't be able to go anywhere else and get those problems solved. So what kind of configurations do UAVs come in? Well, as you can imagine, different problems require different solutions. For example, uh, we had a group come to us and wanted a backpack observation vehicle where it could fit into a backpack. They could take it out, unfold it, and toss it in the air and fly it. It would radio back video images. In this case, the wings fold underneath, and this fits into a 15 by 15 by 5 inch box. Very light, very compact. We also test configurations before we actually make a flying model. Uh, this is a wind tunnel model of a small single seat general aviation aircraft that we call the channel bug. It has these unique configurations called channel wings and it lets this vehicle take off and land in a 50 foot runway. And of course if you want it even smaller then we have a smaller vehicle that would be capable of flying into a building. And how is one of these created? What is the, what's the process that goes into developing a UAV? Well, the first thing we do is we try and analyze the problem and we use a lot of computer-aided technologies to help us with that. Once we get a design that we're happy with, then many times, for example, this is a mock-up of that same configuration. It was done using a process called stereolithography, where the computer divides up this model into little slices. It traces each slice onto a vat of photoreactive resin that hardens it. It builds it slice by slice, and then it comes out as a solid piece. So we can take this mock-up to make sure that it's gonna be the right size and shape that we want, and then we can turn it into a flying vehicle by using those same CAD files, milling a mold to make the little skins for this vehicle, and turn it into a real airplane, similar to what you see here. So what are some of the advantages that a UAV has over a regular piloted aircraft? Well, there's actually a number of advantages that UAVs have over piloted airplanes. One of which is the ability to fly lower, longer, and into more hazardous airspace than any pilot would dare. Much like robots are used to handle explosives in many police or SWAT situations, 
the UAV can be placed in high threat situations, perform exceptionally, and complete its mission with little or no risk to human operators. With advances in audio and video electronics, real-time television images are possible to help guide a pilot around dangerous situations or gather valuable intelligence. One of the problems we were presented with was a problem of trying to look at what's inside of maybe a partially damaged building. For example, in the case of an earthquake, you really don't want to risk a whole team of people going into that building, but you'd like to know if there's someone inside that you need to go rescue. So when presented with this challenge, we worked up a little prototype. And that's what you see here. This is a little vehicle that would carry a camera. It takes off vertically. This is what's called a VTOL, or vertical takeoff and landing. It takes off vertically. Wings pitch forward for forward flight. But then when it needs to hover, it can stop and hover. It can turn by moving the wings differentially. And it can be flown by remote control by using a display that actually shows the picture of the camera in the nose. So you fly it remotely from the camera. All without risking the pilot or anyone uh, uh, remote controlling the vehicle? Correct. Another problem that we're looking at is trying to use these small unmanned air vehicles to detect forest fires. That's clearly a big problem. Finding and fighting forest fires now is very, very expensive. The average cost of fighting forest fires in the United States is over $800 million a year. One reason that fighting forest fires is so costly is that by the time many fires are detected, they are already unmanageable. Although 98% of all forest fires are caught and extinguished quickly, it's a 2% that turn into wildfires, costing taxpayers millions. This is where the idea for the UAV comes in. The plan is to place hundreds of these low-cost UAVs on current or abandoned forest fire lookout stations around the country. The vehicle would remotely take off, land, and recharge autonomously up to six times a day from the lookout tower. It would travel over a section of the forest and use onboard sensors and cameras to detect smoke. If smoke is detected, it would send out a warning message to the Forest Service with the exact GPS coordinates pinpointing the fire. This would enable firefighters to respond much faster, potentially reducing firefighting costs dramatically. So Mike, what does the future hold for UAVs? Well, we're looking at a whole range of activities and things that these small airplanes can actually do beyond just saving money, but defending our country, saving lives, solving problems. That's what the Suave Lab is all about. Flight simulators are valuable tools in helping pilots and engineers test new ideas and new systems in aircraft. Simulators continue to improve aircraft safety and benefit the entire aviation industry not just one pilot. These complex machines display extremely accurate representations of the aircraft controls and the environment around them. But how does a modern flight simulator work? For some answers, we turn to Johnny Alonzo. One of the most effective tools pilots and engineers use when learning about aircraft is the flight simulator. The simulators have been around almost as long as airplanes have. In fact, in early models, pilots would practice flying by sitting in wooden barrels suspended off the ground. The simulators have come a long way since then, but the basic idea of making flying safer hasn't changed. Today, they are incredibly complex machines that are used not just to help pilots learn to fly, but are used to run experiments or tests, which can be too expensive or too dangerous to attempt in flight. I spoke with Marshall Smith at NASA Langley Research Center to find out how they work. So Marshall, what are the differences between NASA flight simulators and other simulators? Well, the difference between NASA flight simulators and other simulators are mainly in the training uh, environment versus engineering and research. Other types of simulators are used for training, and so they benefit one pilot or the pilots that are out there learning to fly airplanes, but our simulators are used for uh, developing engineering concepts or things that make, uh, make flying safer. So, what are some real-world problems that simulators have solved? Some of the problems are related to safety. For example, uh, wind shear detection and avoidance was a big problem. Wind shear is, occurs when you have a real strong downdraft and it could occur from thunderstorms or can occur, occur near mountainsides or even in clear air. But basically what happens is it causes the plane to lose lift and crash. And 15 to 20 years ago, a lot of planes were crashing because of uh, wind shear problems, but engineering simulators were used at NASA particularly, to detect 
uh, wind shears and also give them guidance as to how to get out of a wind shear condition and actually land the plane uh, safely. Uh, wind shear is rarely a problem anymore. So that was like 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, what are some current things that you're working on today? Okay, some of the problems we're working on today involve uh, synthetic vision where we're trying to give the pilot an out the window picture of what the world looks like if he can't see. Flying through clouds or it's really uh, low visibility, he can look down at this display and see what he would see if there was clear air outside of him. Other things that we're working on are keeping planes properly spaced apart if they're doing parallel approaches or on the ground. If, pilots are t if planes are taxiing around and an air traffic control inadvertently tells somebody to go in front of a plane, uh, he has another method where he can determine something bad is happening. So how have simulators changed over the years? Over the past 15 to 20 years, simulators have changed dramatically, and that's largely due to the computer revolution and uh, changes in graphic systems from the entertainment industry. Uh, these simulators have gotten much more accurate and detailed, the simulations themselves, to the point that uh, we can do a simulation and then go out and fly the real aircraft and really find no differences uh, in the two. So are pilots the only ones using flight simulators? Well, absolutely not. Uh, actually, our simulators are used by researchers who are engineers uh, and technicians who are developing all of these programs so that we can determine whether they'll be good for the aviation industry or not. And then pilots are brought in actually at the end of the program so that they can be used as test subjects to determine whether the information then is going to be good enough to take onto the airplane for further tests. Pilots also help us develop the uh, test as well. So Marshall, can you show me how the simulator works? Sure. We're actually at Dallas-Fort Worth right now and we're going to take off from Dallas-Fort Worth and uh, you're going to do it for us. So you take your throttles, Give it a try. move them all the way forward, your flaps are already set and okay. you're ready to go. Start with this, right? There we go. All right. And as your airspeed gets up to about 150, okay, you can pull back. Wow. Go ahead and pull back. There you go. All right, now you can push forward a little bit. And you just took off. <laughs> this is amazing. If it's in the real aircraft, it's in this simulator. This particular simulator is a copy of the of our 757 aircraft that we have at NASA that we use for research. It's a copy of the forward nose section. So we actually have, if we have a particular research instrument in the aircraft, we'll put it in the simulator as well. You guys must have fun working up here. It's a blast. Look at me saying up here. We're nowhere. <laughs> this is cool. Thanks a lot, Marshall. This has been so much fun. Hey, it's been my pleasure. You can come back anytime. Thank you. I will. I just have one question. Okay. Where do I put the quarters? Oh, that goes right over here. <laughs> yeah. Got me. <laughs> That's all for this edition of Destination Tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. up on Destination Tomorrow. Find out about one of Saturn's moons that has one of the best chances for life to exist outside of Earth. We'll also see how spacecraft are placed into orbit around faraway planets. And Johnny Alonzo finds out how advanced materials are keeping us safer. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Brad Breckenridge, filling in for Steel McGonagall. And I'm Kara O'Brien. Welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. We begin with a look at a fascinating moon called Titan, which is orbiting around the planet Saturn. 
this moon has become the subject of much scientific speculation in recent years since it was discovered to have an atmosphere roughly four times thicker than Earth's. About half the size of Earth, this small planet-like moon has an atmosphere that contains large amounts of nitrogen and carbon. This is important because these chemicals are considered by many scientists to be the building blocks for life as we know it. Little is known about Titan's surface because its thick atmosphere hides it from view. To help us learn more about Titan, NASA scientists have launched an intriguing mission to explore this distant moon. This mission, called Cassini-Huygens, was launched from Kennedy Space Center on October 15, 1997. Once at Saturn, the Cassini-Huygens spacecraft will not only study Saturn's atmosphere and its other moons, but will also drop a small lander onto the surface of Titan. While Cassini-Huygens will dramatically boost our knowledge of Titan, it will likely lead to more questions about this interesting moon. Tonya St. Romain spoke with researcher Dr. Marianne Rudisil to find out more about the current mission and possible future missions to Titan. One of NASA's stated goals is to search for life and life-enabling conditions such as water and lifelike chemistry throughout the universe. In recent years, the task of searching for life has become much easier with the development of tools like the Hubble Space Telescope and advanced sensors aboard spacecraft. With these technology advancements, NASA scientists are now able to better identify so-called hotspot locations in the universe. A hotspot location is simply a celestial body, that is, a planet or a moon, that may have conditions that are conducive to the origin and existence of life. Scientists have located a number of potential hot spots in our solar system, but one of the most intriguing is a moon orbiting the planet Saturn named Titan. Titan is very exciting because unlike most moons in our solar system, it actually has an atmosphere. In fact, many scientists believe that Titan's atmosphere closely resembles early Earth's atmosphere three and a half billion years ago when life was just beginning on our planet. The chemicals that make up Titan's thick, hazy atmosphere include nitrogen and carbon, elements considered by scientists to be the building blocks or raw materials for life as we know it. With this in mind, NASA and European Space Agency scientists are working on a mission called Cassini-Huygens, which will study Saturn and some of its moons, including Titan. The Huygens probe will descend into the thick Titan atmosphere to study its composition and look for signs of prebiotic chemistry. I spoke with Dr. Marianne Rudisil at NASA Langley Research Center to find out why this distant moon is such an important place to study. Titan's a really interesting place to explore for a number of reasons. It's a very large moon. It's larger than um, two of our planets, Mercury and Pluto. But the most interesting thing about it actually is that um, Titan has a very dense atmosphere. And this atmosphere has a lot of chemistry, interesting chemistry going on. Um, most of the atmosphere at Titan is nitrogen, a lot like Earth's. It has um, methane, but it also has a lot of complex um, organic types of molecules going on. And it has well as well and so we think that um, potentially there are actually clouds on Titan that kind of rain organic uh, molecules down onto the surface and kind of lay out an organic sludge along the surface of Titan. Um, so a lot of scientists believe that in some important ways Titan might actually be um, very much like what Earth was like in, in its early days prior to life on our planet. So it's an interesting place to go to to kind of look at those processes and, and, and understand how life originated on our planet in that type of physical environment. One of the reasons Titan is of great interest to scientists is because it's the only moon in the solar system known to have clouds and a thick planet-like atmosphere. Because Titan's atmosphere contains nitrogen and high percentages of smog-like chemicals such as methane and ethane, it may actually rain gasoline-like liquids onto the surface, forming shallow methane-filled lakes. Although the smog-like atmosphere would be harmful to humans and other forms of complex life on our planet, the organic nature of Titan's atmosphere is much like the prebiotic environment from which life arose here on Earth. Simply put, these conditions may actually be laying the foundation for life on Titan sometime in the future. Dr. Odissell, is there potential for life on Titan? Well, that's a really interesting question, actually, and maybe yes and maybe no. And I say that because of this. Um, maybe yes, because Titan has, as I said, some really interesting and complex organic chemistry going on. 
But the problem is that chemistry isn't all that it takes to have life. Titan is very far away from our sun, and so it's a very, very cold place. So the problem is that everything is ice. And life as we know it needs access to liquid water. And it also needs a source of energy. So on the one hand, yes, the chemistry could potentially support early life on Titan, but it, it, it's not warm enough, it's too cold, and it doesn't have access to water and energy that it would need. But you could speculate about some other ways, perhaps, that it could have liquid water. Um, we know, for example, that meteorites have um, come to Titan and hit the surface, bringing, generating heat and bringing energy with it. And perhaps for certain amounts of time, then that would mean that there could be pools of liquid water there. So it's really interesting to think about and speculate about the possibility of life in other parts and other locations of our solar system. And Titan is a very interesting place to look into those questions, and that's why we're going there. Once the spacecraft gets to Saturn, how will it collect data? Will it use rovers like the Mars rovers? No, actually, um, it's going to be rather different from the Mars mission. We're not sending rovers like Spirit and Opportunity. It won't be trundling around on the surface like we did on Mars. First, we're sending uh, the Cassini spacecraft, and it's an orbiter, and when it reaches Saturn, it'll actually spend the next four years there kind of doing a grand tour through um, the Saturn system. And one of the things it will do is about 40 flybys um, near Titan collect information, kind of a big picture view of Titan. But then in addition to that, we have a Titan probe, Wiggins probe, and that was developed by the European Space Agency. And it'll drop down through Titan's dense atmosphere and all the way down, um, the instruments will be taking all kinds of measurements like um, the density of the atmosphere and the temperature and altitude and things of that sort. And of course, it's going to be taking a lot of data, a lot of information about the chemistry of Titan's atmosphere, what kinds of things are there and how much. And it'll take about two to two and a half hours to get all the way down through the dense atmosphere. We don't know what it will land in but it will be able to stay on the surface and then in its local area kind of take some measurements and also radio that information back to the orbiter and back to Earth. The next generation of science missions to Titan will probably be much different than the missions of today. Because little is known about the moon's geology, one type of mission concept recently developed by NASA would rely on a dirigible type craft to move through Titan's atmosphere, taking multiple measurements over time. This blimp would float above the surface and deploy a small probe to sample Titan's atmosphere, methane crater lakes, and crater rim ice. The probe would be able to analyze the samples on the spot and then relay the information to scientists back on Earth. With Earth nearly 800 million miles away, the probe would need to be almost completely autonomous. This type of craft could conceivably float through Titan's atmosphere for many months, gathering valuable evidence about Titan's chemistry and geology and what that means for us back on Earth. Realistically, what are your expectations? Are you expecting to find life on Titan? Scientists try to be very objective, you know, and only have attitudes and opinions based upon what we know, of course. And so I think a lot of people are, are holding back and saying, 
Um, I don't expect to find life there. It's too cold. Even though we have extremophiles here on our planet that can live in very dry or very cold conditions, it's really cold out there, you know, and there isn't liquid water. So we're not expecting to see anything there. But the nice thing would be is if we could find, I think a lot of people would be very, very happy if we saw some serious complex organic chemistry going on. Prebiotic, you know, clearly prebiotic chemistry would just be wonderful. Going to other destinations in our solar system and then gathering this kind of information could really help us understand um, how our planet formed and how life originated on our planet. And these were really profound questions, not just to scientists, but to everyone. And so I think it's really interesting and great that NASA can send spacecraft and gather these kinds of data to help us answer those kinds of questions. Many astrobiologists are skeptical as to whether life as we know it exists on Titan. Although many of the building blocks for life are there, temperatures average a numbing minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. However, Titan might provide a habitat for life if scattered sources of heat from geysers or volcanoes are discovered. Coming up, we'll find out how NASA has been using a technique called aerobraking to insert spacecraft into extraplanetary orbits. But first, did you know that Saturn's density is the lowest in the solar system? Although Saturn has a diameter of about 75,000 miles, it's made up of primarily hydrogen and helium gases. The presence of these gases makes Saturn's specific gravity at about 0.7, less than that of water. In fact, Saturn's density is so low that if it were placed in an imaginary gigantic bathtub, it would float. In the past, entering into orbit around a planet or moon required precise navigation and the ability to slow a spacecraft with thrusters. Of course, thrusters require large amounts of fuel to slow the craft down to orbital speeds. The fuel carried on these missions takes up valuable space, which can be used to store science instruments. To help reduce costs and create more room, NASA researchers have developed an alternative to using fuel to slow the craft, called aerobraking. Aerobraking uses the atmosphere of the target planet as both a brake and a steering wheel to slow the craft. Jennifer Pulley spoke with Dr. Mary Kay Lockwood to find out more about aerobraking and how NASA is using this technique in space travel. The sight of spacecraft flying out of the atmosphere on the way to a distant destination is a familiar one to most of us. In order to break free of the Earth's gravitational field, a typical spacecraft needs to be traveling at speeds close to 25,000 miles per hour. Once the spacecraft does break free, it is able to continue traveling to its destination at high speeds because there is very little friction to slow it down. Once the craft reaches its destination, the craft must decelerate from very high speeds to much lower speeds in a relatively short period of time. In the past, additional thrusters would be fired to help the craft decelerate as it approached its target. But a major problem with this method is that the fuel needed for these thrusters takes up valuable space and weight, which could be used to house additional science instruments. More recently, NASA has been using an aero-assist technique called aerobraking, which adds the use of atmospheric drag to slow the craft rather than using thrusters alone. This technique allows additional science instruments to be delivered to a distant target while also reducing costs. I spoke to Dr. Mary Kay Lockwood at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. Well, when we first approach a planet on a trajectory from Earth, we do a small firing of the thrusters and capture into a very large elliptical orbit about that planet. We then do uh, several passes through the upper atmosphere of that destination to slow the spacecraft down into the final science orbit. Aerobraking is accomplished when a vehicle makes multiple passes around a planet or moon and uses the atmosphere to slow down the vehicle. This process is very slow, sometimes taking several months because the vehicle is only exposed to the upper layers of the atmosphere. This procedure is very similar to how a rock reacts when it is skimmed across the top of water. With each skip, the rock slows down until it finally stops. The spacecraft is similar because with each pass through the atmosphere, it slows down more and more until it finally reaches the appropriate orbital speed. Has the aerobraking technique ever been flown on a mission? 
Well, aero braking was first demonstrated in the Magellan mission at the very end of the mission at Venus. And it has since flown in two successful Mars missions, both the Mars Global Surveyor mission and Mars Odyssey. It's also going to be used in the future on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission. Once a vehicle nears its destination, how does the atmosphere slow it down? Well, an atmosphere slows a vehicle down in the same way that uh, if you were to put your hand out the window of a car while it's moving, you can feel the force of the air on your hand. And that is the same force that's slowing the spacecraft down when it passes through the atmosphere. Aerobraking is a good way to slow a vehicle down at a destination and capture into an orbit, but we're also looking at another approach called aero capture. Aero capture is similar to aerobraking because it uses the atmosphere to slow a vehicle down. But unlike aerobraking, which only skims the top layers of the atmosphere, the aero capture technique allows the vehicle to go deep inside the atmosphere of the target. The vehicle maneuvers through the atmosphere using drag to decelerate to the desired orbital speed. After the vehicle exits the atmosphere, a very small thruster firing occurs to achieve the desired orbit around the target planet or moon. One of the major differences between aero braking and aero capture is that for aero capture we need an aero shell. And an aero shell is very much the same as the aero shell used on the Mars Exploration Rover missions you may be familiar with. But for aero capture, of course, we're maneuvering through the atmosphere and then exiting the atmosphere and finally achieving an orbit at a destination, where with the Mars Exploration Rovers, we were landing on the surface of that destination. For aero braking, you do not need an aero shell because you're passing through the very upper part of the atmosphere. So the heating environment on the vehicle is not nearly as severe as it is with aero capture. So do different planets need different shaped aero shells? Or will one design work in all situations? The aero shell shape for the aero capture missions at places like the Earth or at Mars or at Titan um, can be very similar to those that are used with the Mars Exploration Rover missions. But if we're going to destinations such as Neptune, that would require a different vehicle shape, different aero shell shape, and that would be more shaped like a bullet that flies at an angle. To achieve a successful aero capture, we have to stay within a very um, narrow corridor. Um, if we don't stay within that corridor, we would have a flyby. We wouldn't capture into the orbit. Um, or on the other side, we would land. And so it's very important to stay within a particular corridor uh, through that destination. At Neptune, the corridor is narrower. It's kind of like a little highway? It's kind of like thing? a little highway. And so um, at Neptune, in order to make the highway bigger, um, we need to have a different shape. So Dr. Lockwood, in addition to aeroshells, what are some other techniques that can be used to slow a vehicle down? Well, we're looking at other techniques that might be second generation techniques uh, that would use an inflatable aeroshell or even a balut. A balut basically looks like a giant donut. It's got tethers similar to a parachute, um, but it has a giant ring behind it. And that allows the spacecraft to fly shallower in the atmosphere to still slow down. We are always working to achieve the science and exploration goals for NASA and being able to reduce the cost of these systems and being able to improve the performance of the systems is a very important part of achieving that goal. And it's very exciting and challenging work. Coming up, we'll find out how specialized materials are saving lives. But first, did you know that aero braking was first tested on the Magellan mission to Venus in 1994? Although the Magellan mission used propulsion to slow the craft, aero braking was tested at the end of the mission to validate the theory. With the success of this test, NASA researchers decided to use aero braking as the primary deceleration method on one of its next missions, the Mars Global Surveyor. On February 4, 1999, history was made when the Mars Global Surveyor successfully obtained stable circular orbit of Mars using aero braking as the primary method of deceleration. Researchers at NASA have a long and significant history of materials technology development. With an impressive list of new lubricants, lightweight alloys, and composites, these materials have revolutionized our world. Since the 1960s, the process of creating new materials has rapidly advanced. Today, NASA scientists are continuing to develop new materials that are hundreds of times stronger than steel at a fraction of the weight. These advanced materials are becoming so strong and lightweight 
They can stop bullets and even keep debris from puncturing space vehicles. But how are these materials made and what else can they be used for? Our own Johnny Alonzo finds out how it works. Specialized protective clothing has been around for thousands of years. From ancient warriors to medieval knights, protective garments were worn to help prevent injuries and save lives. The materials that were used to make these types of clothing, like metal and leather, worked well in those early days. But as weapons became more sophisticated, the usual materials began offering less protection. The types of materials that were used to make protective clothing remained relatively unchanged until about the mid-1960s when a research scientist named Stephanie Qualick introduced a revolutionary new material called Kevlar. This material was not only lightweight and durable, but was about five times stronger ounce for ounce than steel. With this development, the world of protective materials changed forever. Today, stronger, lighter synthetic structures have opened up new and exciting avenues in the development of protective materials. These materials are being used in everything, from sporting goods to space applications. To help shed some light on how these materials have changed our lives, I spoke with Dr. Jeffrey Hinckley at NASA Langley Research Center to find out how it works. If you look at the history of materials in humankind, you see the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and then the Age of Steel, which is sort of the Industrial Revolution. We're in the course of another revolution now of high-performance materials that can combine the strength, the stiffness of steel with other properties electrical conductivity, the ability to be formed in plastically, and uh, to even stop bullets. Another example is Kevlar, which is used in uh, armor protection for our troops. And of course glass fiber is familiar to some people, and glass fiber boats, and so on. So we've talked about Kevlar. Uh, how does a thin material like that stop bullets? You have here the flexibility of a fine fiber, very tough, resilient material, and twice as strong as steel at a fifth of the weight. And Kevlar is also a, a good material for penetration resistance, cut resistance, uh, because of the way it's fabricated. Actually, the molecules that make up the polymer are stretched and aligned such that in order to break this material, you actually have to break the molecules. To understand how a flexible material like Kevlar can stop bullets, just think of a net on a soccer goal. The net strands are interlaced together, which are in turn attached to the frame of the goal. When the ball is kicked into the goal, each tether extends from one side of the frame to the other, dispersing the energy from the point of impact over a wide area. This forces the ball to stop. The same basic principle applies to bulletproof vests. The vest is made up of layers of fabric containing incredibly strong fibers. When a bullet hits this material, the energy is dissipated, forcing it to stop before it can penetrate the vest. Why is NASA interested in using these materials? Kevlar, as a bulletproof vest material, is essential to protecting the astronauts and the equipment, for example, on the space station. Space is a very hostile environment. Extreme temperatures, radiation, and small meteorites can make working there very dangerous. For example, the International Space Station is orbiting the Earth at close to 18,000 miles per hour. At these speeds, even a piece of debris the size of a grain of sand can damage the station. To help decrease the chance of an object penetrating the outer skin, the space station wears a type of bulletproof vest Layers of aluminum, ceramic fabrics, and Kevlar form a blanket around each module's aluminum shell. If an object strikes the station, this blanket of protective materials helps to dissipate the energy of the object, helping to keep the crew safe inside. I know that composite materials are still relatively new. Um, how do you think they will change in the future? Maybe one of the most exciting examples is carbon nanotubes. These are pure carbon and unbelievably small but they're in the form of a fiber. This is a material that was in, discovered in the 1990s and is probably stronger than anything we've known up till now. It's perhaps stronger than diamond. The trick is to figure out how to make something useful out of these tiny, tiny tubes. This is 10,000 times smaller than a human hair. And so the trick is to use this material, which even under a microscope just looks like soot into a strong, lightweight, composite material. And so our chemists are working on that. An idea that's really on the drawing boards is the idea of a self-healing material. You can imagine a spacecraft that's going to be in orbit for 20 years. It would be nice not to have to service it. So uh, we conceived the idea of a material that would heal itself after it was damaged. And I have an example here. This is a sort of a conventional plastic material that was 
struck by a nine millimeter bullet. And, and as you can see, it shattered and left a hole that's just a little over nine millimeters in diameter. Uh -huh. Here's a new material that was invented here at NASA. And this also was struck by a nine millimeter bullet. The bullet went right through, the bullet was not stopped, but there's no hole. We can imagine that self-healing materials would be useful on aircraft too. Um, right now, when an aircraft is brought in for service, they look all around it for cracks. And they're looking for a critical crack, which on some commercial jets is, might be as much as four inches long. When they get to the critical crack size, they repair it. Well, we can imagine a composite material made with self-healing matrix, self-healing plastic, that could heal itself and the cracks would never grow. The exciting thing about working for NASA is that it, it is always something new. And we get to sometimes see the results of our work coming into commercial use. So the next time you hear about somebody getting their life saved by a bulletproof vest, you know how it works. I wonder if these things work well with paintballs. That's all for this edition of Destination Tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brad Breckenridge. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. Coming up on part two of this special two-part destination tomorrow, we take a look at food technology and how it is used by NASA. We'll see what the future holds for food technology on long-duration missions to planets like Mars. Plus, Johnny Alonzo speaks with astronaut Mike Fole to find out what it is like to live and eat in space. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Kara O'Brien and welcome to part two of this special edition of Destination Tomorrow. In part one, we found out how NASA researchers have made improvements in the types of foods astronauts have eaten since the beginning of the space program up to today. On this program, we will be discussing future food technologies and how they'll be used on long duration missions. Recently, it was announced that NASA is planning to send a crewed mission back to the moon and to Mars. Obviously, huge technological challenges will need to be overcome before these missions can be successfully accomplished. NASA researchers realize that trips like these will require building the appropriate type of spacecraft, having flawless life support systems, and will need the right tools to perform work once we arrive on these distant worlds. But a major concern that often gets overlooked by the general public is what types of food will be eaten by our astronauts on these long missions. Fortunately, Previous missions to low Earth orbit in the space shuttle and longer missions aboard the International Space Station have helped NASA better understand how food and the astronaut interact. But not much is known about how food will fare on these long missions. The primary goal of the food systems in these long missions will be to provide a palatable, nutritious and safe food for our explorers while also taking up as little room as possible. Food is vital for survival here on Earth but is even more important in some respects in space. Its preparation, quantity, and quality are critical and can affect astronauts on a physiological level. One of the most crucial problems on long missions is bone loss. Typically, astronauts lose 1 to 2 percent of bone mass each month that they are in space, especially in the lower halves of their bodies. In the weightless environment of space, 
there is almost no stress on the skeletal system. Bones are no longer providing support to walk and are not being used to maintain body posture. This lack of stress on the bones may be a key factor in an astronaut's progressive bone loss in space. Other problems like fluid shift and space motion sickness must be taken into account when providing food to the astronaut crews. Meals must be chosen that can help slow many of the problems faced by astronauts. Another major concern for NASA food scientists is the stability of food that is packaged for these missions. It's vital that the food remain edible for years at a time, staying safe and stable aboard the spacecraft. This is perhaps one of the most important factors of the planned long-duration missions. If the food spoils, there are no options currently available to astronauts for nourishment. With missions to Mars requiring at least three years to complete, stored food must remain shelf-stable for that time, preferably longer. In the short term, food systems that are currently being used aboard the shuttle and space station are suitable for transit to another world. But once astronauts arrive, other alternatives need to be considered. With these thoughts in mind, researchers at NASA are developing new ways to help crews eat well in space. In addition to storing food aboard the spacecraft, many at NASA believe that growing food in space or on planetary surfaces will need to be perfected to help feed astronauts on these long missions. Coming up, Jennifer Pulley speaks with Dr. Michelle Perchonik at NASA Johnson Space Center to find out about foods of the future. But first, did you know that freeze-dried ice cream sold in many museums today is not really eaten by our astronauts in space? In the mid-1960s, scientists blended and froze a mixture of coconut fat, milk solids, and sugar, then ground and compressed the mixture into cubes under high pressure, making a freeze-dried ice cream. This concoction was only taken into space once. In 1968, the Apollo 7 astronauts tested it while orbiting Earth. Although it is not known exactly what the crew thought of the ice cream, it's telling it was put on only one mission. Incidentally, the product sold today in the museum is produced differently. It is simply ice cream cut into cubes, then freeze-dried. One of the biggest challenges facing NASA in the development of long-duration space missions is food. In centuries past, explorers could almost always find food in their surroundings, even if they were thousands of miles from home. Of course, this same luxury will not be afforded to space travelers. They will have to rely solely on food that is taken with them, or that can be grown during the mission in the vehicle or on the planetary surface. Although this may seem daunting, Researchers at NASA are now developing viable systems to help keep our astronauts well-fed on long space missions. I spoke with National Space Biomedical Research Institute food scientist, Dr. Michelle Perchonik, here at NASA Johnson Space Center to find out more. Well, we have several goals. First is safety. We have to make sure the food is safe so that the crew doesn't get sick. Second of all, we have to make sure it's nutritious. The crew is getting all of their nutrition from the food. And thirdly is acceptability. If the food isn't acceptable, the crew is not going to like it. And we know that as the duration of the missions get longer, we need to make sure that that food is acceptable to them. And we do testing, and we'll be doing testing here at Johnson Space Center on the acceptability of the food with the general Johnson Space Center public and then later with the actual crews. So what are some of the challenges that you'll have to overcome? Well, first of all, it's going to take us six to eight months to get to Mars with the current propulsion system. And yes, there are engineers here at NASA trying to get, them, get the propulsion systems improved, but right now it's six to eight months. And of course, six to eight months home. And because of the way the, the planets align with each other, it's going to be 18 months on the surface. So the mission is going to be somewhere on the order of two and a half to three years long. So what that means is we're going to have two kinds of food systems. The first is a transit food system. On the vehicle, because of microgravity, it is very difficult or almost impossible to do any sort of preparation or cooking of the food. So we're going to have a food system that's very similar to the ISS food system, prepackaged foods. Most likely, they'll be stored at, at room temperature, so we won't have a refrigerator or a freezer. Well, that gives us some challenges because it's very difficult to find some foods that have a three to five year shelf life at room temperature and that you're not keeping it frozen or even at refrigerated temperatures. The other part of the challenge is looking at 
the packaging materials to make sure that we have the barrier properties to provide us with that three to five year challenge. So we have that issue. Now, think about it, six months, you've got all these packages of food because at each meal, you've got about three to five packages of food for each crew member times three meals and snacks. How do you store all this? Not only are you storing it at ambient or room temperatures, but you have to keep track of it. Inventory management and tracking and knowing where it is and how much you've used and when you've used it. So the challenges are unbelievable even just for the transit mission. Right. And even though we've done it already on ISS and shuttle, we've got that many more challenges to go after for this. One of the main challenges for NASA planners will be to provide food that will help keep crews healthy and happy, while also helping the astronauts' bodies acclimate to the rigors of space travel. During these long missions, astronaut physiology will need to be taken into consideration. The human body has adapted to the effects of gravity here on Earth. But once gravity is reduced, the body slowly begins to adapt to its new surroundings. During this adaptation process, weight loss, dehydration, constipation, electrolyte imbalance, bone loss, and a myriad of other problems may occur. To help prevent or alleviate many of these problems, researchers are investigating the levels of nutrients each astronaut may need. Proper diet and exercise should counteract many of the problems associated with the physiological changes. So that takes care of the transit of mm -hmm. getting to Mars. Mm -hmm. Once they're there on Mars, then what? Well, then we have the opportunity to use the gravity of Mars. Mars has one-third gravity. So that's a little bit of gravity, enough to keep things down towards our feet. And with that, we can start looking at processing and preparing food. Now, we may be growing some of these crops, or we may be bringing up these items in bulk, such as soybeans or wheat. Uh, we will have to grow the vegetables and fruits because those don't have the shelf life we need. When I talk about bulk, what we're saying is we're going to bring up uh, in large quantities unprocessed foods that you would then add in either through processing or maybe in the recipe. So for example, we would bring up large quantities of soybeans and then we could use those soybeans to process into texturized vegetable proteins or maybe we make it into tofu. So we would have that opportunity for more variety, therefore more acceptability in the processed food system. We'll also be bringing up items that will help us do the preparation in the galley, such as dried herbs and spices, or dried non-fat dry milk, or maybe dried egg whites, because it's going to be hard to bake a cookie or a cake without those kinds of ingredients. In, in addition to the baking soda and baking powder. So we're looking at all those different ingredients, what the quantities might be, and whether they will also last that three to five year shelf life, and how we're going to store them. We think we'll have to store the soybeans and the wheat berries at refrigerated temperatures, and probably in a non-oxygen atmosphere. Oxygen's not food's friend, and we want to keep the oxygen away from those bulk ingredients until they're used. Other than providing bulk foods, there is also a plan for astronauts to grow food once they arrive and set up planetary bases. The plan would consist of crews growing crops hydroponically, which means to grow the food by using water rather than soil. Having fresh crops would not only provide variety in the menu, but would also offer great psychological benefits to the crews as well. With both fresh foods and bulk ingredients, crews would be able to process many of the foods that they would be eating. Processing food would consist of taking one type of food and making it into many different types of foods. As Michelle mentioned, foods such as soybeans could be processed and made into tofu, soy milk, soy oil, soy flour, and many other items. Other foods that would be ideal for processing include potatoes, wheat, rice, tomatoes, and peanuts. With the right equipment, crews could potentially grow and process large amounts of the food they would need to survive on site, rather than solely relying on food from Earth. Well, processing is, is not so hard down here, but now we need to worry about not bringing up too much weight, too much volume, and trying to be multifunctional with the equipment. For example, maybe a piece of equipment will not only make pasta but it'll also mill wheat berries and it may also make cereal for breakfast. Crew time is an issue. You don't want the crew to be spending all their time processing and preparing the foods because they want to be out there exploring and doing real science.
weight is going to be a major factor in getting crews to other planets. Knowing this, NASA planners are deciding if they should provide multifunctional processing equipment or if they should rely on age-old proven methods of food processing. For example, how do we make bread? Well, we could do the, the more modern way of putting everything into the bread maker and letting it happen, or we could actually just go the old-fashioned way, mix all the dough up, knead it, let it rise, knead it again, let it rise again, and then bake it. And we're going to have to be looking at where that fine line is on crew time versus automation and, and the mass that we would have to uplift to the Mars surface. They're not at Mars to do cooking. You know, they can do that at home. They're there to explore. To help make NASA's exploration goals a reality, NASA planners are also relying on outside help. Many colleges, universities, and other entities are performing experiments on food and processing equipment that may someday be used in the space program. The expertise that is being provided will help focus and quicken the development of technologies that will make exploration possible. We are a small group here, and we're not the experts in everything, so we go externally. For example, we have a researcher at UC Davis looking at developing, and he's actually built a prototype on a multi-purpose fruit and vegetable processor, testing it using tomatoes, but again, a multi-purpose piece of equipment that will dice, cut, concentrate the tomatoes or anything else. One of our uh, faculty fellows actually has looked at radiation issues. We know that radiation is going to be an issue. We know it for the crew as well as, we believe, for the food. But we don't know at what extent. So Dr. Wilson's been working on how radiation affects soybean functionality. And he's looking at it on two sides. Again, the safety side. If you're going to bring up bulk ingredients, you need to make sure they're clean and safe before you bring them up. Then he also is looking at what kind of radiation they may incur during a mission to Mars. We don't have the atmosphere here on Earth on Mars. So he's looking at how that's affecting, for him, the tofu man at processing or manufacture. And he's finding that, yes, at higher levels of radiation, the tofu isn't made quite as firm. And it has an off flavor and aroma to it because we get that rancidity from the oil. Well, Michelle, it seems like you and your coworkers really have your work cut out for you. We do. It's going to be a huge challenge, but we're going to do it. Although the Mars mission is more than 25 years away, we're still going to be able to potentially use some of the technologies that we're working on here on Earth before that time. So what we're learning today will not only help our astronauts, but will help the people here on Earth also. With proper cultivation, many of the technologies that are being developed to help our astronauts eat well in space may also someday be used to help feed people back here on Earth. An added byproduct of plants being grown on permanent planetary bases is that plants will not only be eaten by astronauts, but they will also be providing oxygen. In a moment, we'll meet an astronaut who will give us a first-person account of what it is like to live and eat in space. But first... Did you know that the first time solid food was eaten in space was on Gemini 3? Astronaut John Young carried two meal packages to sample on his five-hour mission. While in orbit, Young surprised fellow astronaut Virgil Grissom when he presented him with a corned beef sandwich on rye, which had been purchased at a delicatessen in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Although Grissom enjoyed the gesture, he did not finish the sandwich because it was producing so many crumbs. Many of us have only dreamed of going to space, but only a few of the best and brightest have actually had the opportunity. But an even smaller amount have spent long periods of time there. The experiments and data collected from these pioneers is helping scientists and future astronauts learn more about the effects of long-duration missions on the human body. One of these pioneers that has spent significant time in space helping lead the way is astronaut Michael Fole. A veteran of six space flights, Fole is credited with four spacewalks totaling almost 23 hours. He's also spent time on both the Russian space station Mir and was the commander of Expedition 8 aboard the International Space Station. He currently holds the U.S. record for time spent in space at 374 days, 11 hours, and 19 minutes. So who better to help us understand what it's like to actually live and eat in space? Johnny Alonzo spoke with Dr. Fole to find out how it works. The International Space Station is without doubt one of the most amazing structures ever built. 
Orbiting Earth some 242 miles above us, its stated goal is to teach us how to live in space for long periods of time. Although there are many areas of scientific study being researched, one of the most important is food technology. Understanding how the human body interacts with food and microgravity will be one of several key questions that need to be answered when we travel outside of Earth's orbit for long periods of time. Who better to ask about food in space than an astronaut who spent over a year on both the ISS and the Mir eating a variety of different foods? Astronaut Mike Fole will give us a skinny on what it's like to live in space and to find out how it works. Eating in space is a, a treat. Um, basically, you get hungry, you get thirsty, just like we do on Earth. I think after the first day in space, when you get launched to space, your stomach lifts up into your a little, lifts up a little bit as you float. Okay. And so, for the very first hours after arrival in space, there isn't a desire to eat. And that is because you're finding some vestibular issues, some nausea. But those pass, and they pass pretty quickly. In my case, two or three hours. After about two orbits, an orbit is one and a half hours, okay. 90 minutes. After about two or three orbits, you're starting to get ready to take off your spacesuit that you used to launch into space. In, this, in my last flight, it was on a Soyuz rocket. You get out of this cramped space, stretch out, you change clothes into something soft, not this bulky, awkward spacesuit. And then you think about eating. There are many different types of fare, food fare, I mean, uh, in space. On the Soyuz rocket, which is probably the most meager food cuisine I've come across in my uh, career, okay. the Soyuz simply has uh, dried foods and juices. This food is really not made for a real meal. Uh, however, it's enough to get us by for the two days it takes to get to the International Space Station. I have a turkey with uh, crab apple and cranberry sauce. You get to Space Station after two days, and oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful sight. Because you know, not only there are friends there, there's more places to stretch out and move about, big windows, yeah. but there's also food. Real food. Real food. <laughs> and they're talking to you about it. You know, they're saying, hey, what should we put on for you? Yeah. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was I remembered my experience of Russian foods and American foods that we shared 50-50. Yeah. Where we keep our food. The red boxes are Russian food. The blue boxes are American food. Why do we have so few American boxes? That's a good question. I'm not sure what I'm going to have tonight, but I think it's going to be American. Ah, got chocolate pudding cake. I'm not sure I want that just yet. Uh, I don't know. Try something else. One of the worst things to eat in space, but they still keep sending it, both Americans and Russians, they send crackers. And you eat crackers and they go, <laughs> and you have all these crumbs flying out. And yeah. the whole issue is to somehow put the cracker into your mouth and then sort of seal your, your, your lips around it. And then crunch on it so the crackers, the uh, crumbs don't explode out of your mouth. Tell me, does food in space taste differently than it does here on Earth? The whole issue of taste in space uh, is one of, I think, research. In my personal experience, I don't believe my tastes, my sens sensation of taste really changes in space. I did notice on my first long duration flight on the space station Mir, over time I started to want or crave salty foods more. So Mike, uh, when it's time to eat, do you guys, you know, all get together at the table, or do you sit by yourself? What's the procedure? Well, the most important thing I think anybody does in a day is eat. And what do we do? We're social creatures, human beings, and we like to eat together. Yes. And that's where social events normally occur, is around food or drink. Same is true in space, and uh, as the commander of the International Space Station, I understood very, very clearly that I was not going to let us, just two of us for most of the time, Sasha, Kaleri and myself, eat at different times. Because then we would start to come apart, we wouldn't understand it, there wouldn't be the exchange, it would just be very, very poor. It's hard enough living for six and a half months in a small space with only one other person sure. far away from everybody else. Yeah. So I said, Sasha, we're going to have breakfast, we're going to have maybe you know, a coffee break about 11, and we're going to go to lunch, sure. and we're going to have fixed lunch, and we're not going to let the ground bother us and we're going to make it clear to the ground we don't want to be bothered Good. then we're going to go to tea at about you know, like four yeah. and then we go to evening meal at about seven and sure enough we then got this routine going
This is a good example of a space shuttle tray, not often used, simply because the tray really is designed to hold your food. Now here, in front of you, it's very convenient for me to just hold the implements that I would use to talk about eating. But actually, on the International Space Station, or indeed on the Space Shuttle, there's so much Velcro patches around that you can always use the same food implements or items to simply stick your food to whatever Velcro is near you. And it'll, any wall, any surface, generally has some Velcro nearby. And it attaches just with a little Velcro uh, circle. They always make a point on this space station or on the space shuttle to have hook Velcro on the items that you would attach. And they always have pile Velcro on the walls. Okay. Pile is softer, it doesn't scratch your skin for yes. one thing, so it's just more comfortable to be around everywhere. Yes. And then you make hook Velcro, the stuff that's just kind of small and specific. And so uh, I'm holding right here um, minestrone soup. I notice there's a barcode. Uh -huh. There's also soup minestrone, which in, is in Russian, yes. and I read that for you. Um, the barcode is used uh, in the case that we have to do any food logging experiments. They know exactly how many calories, what the food value is of this packet. And we have food specialists who know exactly what's in this. All the vitamins, all the calories, fats, etc., and cholesterols. If we're going to drink water, for example, sure. we would still log it. Even though there's no calories in it, we would scan the, scan the packet right. and we'd fill it with the right amount of water. So we've been talking about all this food. I mean, how do you control your weight in orbit? Obviously, you eat more or you eat less and, and your weight will change. Sure. Uh, in space, the initial reaction, the first two days, is for you to go to the toilet a lot and you lose a lot of fluids. Um, you probably lose five to 10 pounds just in the first two days, just through fluid loss. And a lot of the fluid is coming from your legs. It's also shifting up into your upper body. And that's why when you see people in, uh, on television from space, they kind of have a slightly puffed up cheeks. I do believe we actually lose that fluid shift somewhat in our faces because we've basically just lost fluid. So that's a change in the body. And so you have lost weight at that point. And we measure our mass every two weeks. And the first month of my flight, we talk to our flight surgeons, our doctors, every week about how things are going. And generally, it's always a, how are you doing? You know, nothing's wrong, etc. They want us to eat enough so that our mass, our weight on Earth, stays the same. And it's, they know that when you come back to Earth, those astronauts, and we've, we've had many different types of flight, many different cases, those astronauts that have not kept their weight on orbit but have lost weight, do very poorly recovering on Earth. Um, they don't get the fluids back into their body quick enough. They aren't strong enough to move around easily. So I was being told by my flight surgeon, Mike, eat. And I went, yes, I will. <laughs> so it was simply a license to eat. So that's how it works. So if you're in the really expensive takeout, I got the stuff for you. Mm, minestrone. That's all for this edition of NASA's Destination Tomorrow. I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time.
coming up on Destination Tomorrow. Painless dentistry becomes a reality with a new dental probe designed by NASA to detect periodontal disease. We'll also see how future technologies might allow planes to fly like a bird. And we'll meet the man who enabled efficient supersonic flight to become a reality. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steel McGonagall. And I'm Kara O'Brien, and welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. We begin with an issue that affects all aircraft that fly in our atmosphere. The formation of ice on airplanes is not only an issue on the runway during cold weather, but can form on airplanes in flight. This problem can be a dangerous situation for any piloted aircraft. Fortunately, NASA has been conducting research on icing with a unique wind tunnel facility that creates icing conditions on aircraft. Jennifer Pulley takes Destination Tomorrow behind the scenes to see how this icing research tunnel is helping engineers combat icing conditions on aircraft. Thanks for the ice. You know, there's nothing like a beverage chilled with ice during a long flight. Inside an airplane, ice is something passengers desire. However, outside an airplane, ice can be dangerous, especially if it forms on the wings or engines. I had the opportunity to speak with Judy Foss Van Zanti at the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. She's researching the effects of icing on aircraft at a unique facility called the Icing Research Tunnel. Researchers at this facility study the formation of ice on the exterior of aircraft. So while flying, the only ice you'll need to worry about is the ice inside your cup. Well, I'm standing right here in the Icing Research Tunnel. Right here we create on Earth what it's like for an airplane to fly through an icing cloud up there. To do that, we've got to make it windy, cold, and wet. Now right now I'm standing in front of the fan. We have the fan to create the wind and in the test section, which is a much smaller cross-sectional area, we can get winds up to 400 miles per hour. So that's about as fast as a plane might fly through in an icy environment. We create the cold with our heat exchanger, 1,700 ton. It can cool 500 homes. That's how big it is. Uh, we can get from zero Celsius down to about minus 20, which is where the icing might occur in nature. And we have spray bars. The spray bars is what makes the icing tunnel. We create the rain. We create a mist uh, that the airplane would fly through. Now the thing about the spray bars is the researchers need to control both how much water is in the cloud, the liquid water content we call it, and how big the drop size is. And we have spray bars specially designed to create those conditions. So in our test section, we create what it's like for a plane to fly through an icing cloud. So why did NASA build an icing research tunnel? As it turns out, during World War II, the Allies lost more aircraft to icing than enemy fire as they were trying to fly supplies over the Himalayas. So the Air Corps turned to NACA, that's NASA's predecessor, and asked them to build an icing research tunnel so we could understand what was going on and how to fix the problem. So what do you test in the icing research tunnel, or the IRT? What we test in the IRT is, is what makes sense to test. Now if you think about it, if you're in an airplane flying through an icing cloud, what surfaces are most critical to keep ice free? Well, it's the wings, which provide the lift, get you off the ground, and it's the engine inlet, which provides the forward thrust. So we typically can test just those components, just the wing or the engine inlet. So what happens when ice forms on an airplane's wing? Well, ice can disrupt the airflow over a wing and will eventually cause the airflow to separate. This separation of airflow creates more drag and less lift. If ice continues to form, the wing will no longer produce the appropriate amount of lift needed to keep the airplane in flight. In some cases, Ice creates airflow separation over movable parts, like an aileron. This could create handling or control problems, and the plane could suddenly roll. As the wing is flying through the air, the ice only accumulates around the leading edge. So that's why ice protection systems only wrap around the first part, the front part of the wing. The, the biggest factor in how the ice grows is, uh, is temperature. So if it's really cold, the water droplet comes in, hits the front part of the wing, and freezes on impact. And you get this nice pointy rhyme shape. The more dangerous ice comes 
during the warmer conditions, those closer to freezing, where the water comes in, hits the leading edge, and actually runs back a little bit. If that happens, the next droplet might come in, see that droplet that is frozen, and start to grow. So you might get these ram's horns that grow upstream. Now that significantly disrupts your airflow, and that is not, that's way off design, and that's very bad. Judy, tell me a little bit more about the icing protection system. Do all planes have it? There's what we call an anti-ice system where you don't allow the ice to grow at all. That's if you've got a very hot leading edge. You see that in jets. Then there's a de-icing system which has pneumatic boots that the boots will uh, wrap around that leading edge. They'll inflate and pop the ice off. So you let the ice grow and then you've got to get it off. The pneumatic boots are typically what you see with turboprop aircraft. Does icing affect planes in, say, a warm climate? Icing occurs everywhere. You've got you've to be um, aware of it. I've got a pilot friend who told me the worst icing he encountered was flying from Florida to the Caribbean in July at 16,000 feet. The worst icing he ever saw. But icing really can occur anywhere and anytime. One of the things we do here at NASA is to have better designs. So maybe um, a system that would automatically turn on the ice protection system if, if a sensor goes up. The short-term solution is to train the pilots and educate them about how to detect icing, how to be aware of it, train them how to get out of the icing environment if and when they need to. Ideally, icing is, is a non-issue in the future. We're working to get there. In 1987, the Icing Research Tunnel was designated an International Historical Mechanical Engineering Landmark for its leading role in making aviation safer for everyone. Coming up, we'll see how a new dental probe designed by NASA will make going to the dentist a little easier. But first, did you know that during World War II, the Allies lost nearly 1,000 planes over the Himalayan mountains due to icing? Flight conditions here were so treacherous that pilots called this dangerous route the hump, or the aluminum trail. When you hear the word dentist, what word immediately comes to your mind? Pain? Unfortunately, pain and dentistry have always been synonymous with each other. Throughout history, dentists and engineers have attempted to make dentistry more comfortable by making tools and equipment more patient-friendly. Now, NASA and its research partners have made pain-free dentistry a reality. Jennifer Cortese examines how a new dental instrument, which was originally designed at NASA, will finally make a trip to the dentist a painless experience. Have you ever had this experience at your dentist? It seems most people do not like to visit their dentist regularly. Why? Pain. To some people, the sight of dental instruments often invokes feelings of anguish and fear. In fact, most dental instruments are not pleasing to the eye or to your mouth. Until now. NASA and its partners have developed an instrument that will help keep periodontal disease, which is the leading cause of tooth loss in adults, in check. This technology was originally designed to help detect cracks in airplanes, but is now currently being used to design and manufacture a revolutionary dental instrument called the ultrasonographic periodontal probe. The technology that's in the probe is ultrasonics. These are the sound waves that we use to probe inside materials, such as the aircraft wings. Ultrasonics is very high frequency sound. We at NASA use high frequency sound to actually look inside materials. We like to be able to assess the health of a material, just like a physician would assess the health of a person. When you look with ultrasound inside a material, you can find defects. Defects such as internal damage, defects such as corrosion that would lead to a loss of strength of a material that might cause a mission failure. Now, how did you discover the specific problems that the probe solves? The specific problem was actually discovered while we were trying to assess the integrity of aircraft. Ultrasonics could characterize the disbonds and microcracking that occurred near rivets on aircraft. That same ultrasonics could be used to find disbonds between the teeth and the gums. In other words, periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is an infection of the tissues that help anchor your teeth. If left untreated, it can lead to tooth and bone loss. Currently, the most widely performed method to measure periodontal disease is not the most comfortable. It involves the insertion of a small, blunt probe between your tooth and gum to measure the depth of the periodontal pocket. 
This process is highly invasive, uncomfortable, and inconsistent. This new instrument, developed by NASA Langley and its partners, uses ultrasonic sound waves that interact with your teeth and map the periodontal pocket. NASA works very closely with medical people during the technology transfer that allows us to take what we have learned in studying materials and apply it to materials that are human tissue. We've had many people contribute to its success. One of those individuals is John Companion. John worked at NASA Langley Research Center for 27 years and now works in the Applied Science Department at the College of William and Mary. We met up with John at the Dental Hygiene Research Center at Old Dominion University. The new probe simply touches the surface of the gum and slides along and the only coupling between the gum and the probe is just water. So it's totally non-invasive, doesn't hurt at all, should provide more information because of the way the information is gathered and it should be faster. The problem that you have with the current technology is one obviously is it's highly invasive and this hurts. Ultrasound doesn't. No sensation, no penetration. They simply run it just along the edge of the gum and you get a nice little image on the screen of a computer that shows you a map. All the information retrieved by the probe can be archived on a computer. A physician can then compare real-time data and past data to diagnose the condition of the patient. And the nice thing that the dentists like about this is they can show the map to the patient so he can actually see what's going on in his gum. And of course, if you can evaluate the disease, you can also evaluate the treatment. So when they start treating it, you can go back and you can check on it and see, is this particular treatment doing any good? Do we need to modify it? Do we need to do something different here? And because this will all be computerized, you only need one person to do it. Right now, you have to have one person to take the measurement, one person to write down the measurement. There's time savings, there's money savings. The patients like it. I liked it. I've actually used myself as a guinea pig. I've had all three types of probing done by several different dentists now. And let me tell you, the ultrasound is the only way to go. <laughs> the use of ultrasound in dental diagnostics provides an alternative approach to conventional probing. Patient discomfort and the need for drugs like Novocaine are virtually eliminated. This technology could eventually touch every person who visits the dentist regularly. Today, many planes break the sound barrier with relative ease. But it wasn't too many years ago that the sound barrier was just that, a seemingly impenetrable, invisible wall. In fact, many aerodynamicists thought that the sound barrier may never be broken by man until one man named Richard Whitcomb developed a theory called Area Rule that enabled efficient supersonic flight to become a reality. Before October of 1947, attempts to break the sound barrier usually ended in disaster. That was until Chuck Yeager and the X-1 flew through the sound barrier on October 14, 1947. The sound barrier had finally been broken. But there it was what I call a brute force approach in the sense that your rocket just rammed that airplane through the speed of sound. But the drag was so high that they used up all the fuel in just about five minutes. So it was not practical supersonic flight, but it did accomplish the breaking of the barrier. There needed to be a more efficient way to break the speed of sound. Dick Whitcomb set out to find a way. Whitcomb found that when a plane reached near supersonic speeds, the drag around the wings would increase by as much as a factor of five. He saw that much like a bullet, the fuselage was extremely aerodynamic without the wings, but when the wings were added, an aerodynamic bump was causing incredible amounts of drag that was slowing the plane down. It became obvious to him that he had to find a way to take the bump out of the equation. Whitcomb's tests showed that when he added the entire area of wings and fuselage together, the drag, or aerodynamic bump, was exactly the same as the drag of a fuselage with wings. He worked tirelessly to find a solution, when one day, as he was thinking about the problem, the solution hit him like a bolt of lightning. He must indent or pinch in the waist of the fuselage. This new shape of the fuselage would closely resemble the shape of a Coke bottle. Whitcomb was astonished to find that by changing the shape of the fuselage, he took the bump out of the equation and allowed the plane to become as aerodynamically smooth as a fuselage without wings. 
This very simple fix came to be known as the area rule. I had the idea. Then we built some models to try and demonstrate it. We built uh, airplanes with the Coke bottle state shaped fuselages and lo and behold, the drag of the wing just disappeared. Now there was when I was really thrilled. I, I, that was far, that was a year or two before anything flew, but there the wind tunnel showed that it just, it worked perfectly. It was not some oddball theory, it was pr a practical means of reducing drag. When the area rule concept was flight tested on the newly converted F-102 fighter, the plane soared through the sound barrier with ease. Whitcomb's discovery revolutionized the way that supersonic fighters, bombers, and transports were built from the 1950s through today. In fact, the area rule concept is still used on many modern planes, including the B-1 bomber and the Boeing 747. Dick Whitcomb's intuition and daring led to a revolution in air technology that has forever changed the history of flight. For his effort in developing the area rule concept, Dr. Whitcomb won the prestigious Collier Trophy, which is awarded annually for great achievement in aeronautics and astronautics in America. Coming up, we'll see how NASA researchers are working on a morphing technology that will allow future aircraft to fly like birds. But first, did you know that Jacqueline Cochran was the first woman to break the sound barrier? Cochran broke the barrier May 18, 1953, in an F-86 Sabre jet. At the time of her death in 1980, she held more speed, altitude, and distance records than any other pilot, man or woman, in history. Imagine how most people felt the first time they heard that one day man would be able to fly, or that we hope to actually land a man on the moon. Those ideas seem pretty crazy at the time, but today we know just about anyone can fly in an airplane, and we have astronauts actually living in space. Now what if I told you that one day we would be able to fly in an aircraft that could bend, twist, and maneuver just like a bird? Sound crazy? Well, I spoke with Anna McGowan at the NASA Langley Research Center, who's working to incorporate something called morphing technology into aircraft. And these morphing technologies could turn those crazy ideas into reality. Morphing is looking at really advanced materials and other technologies that will make airplanes even better than they are today. We got the word morphing actually from the word metamorphosis. The word morph means to change and we're using a lot of advanced materials and technologies to make airplanes change from one configuration to the other. Our task at NASA Langley is to look 20 years into the future. Some of our challenges are making the airplanes even safer, making them more efficient, meaning you could you know, fly farther on the same tank of fuel, or carry more passengers, for example. And we're working on making airplanes you know, as versatile as a bird is. So we're look, taking some lessons from nature. To get aircraft to perform with bird-like agility, first you have to understand how birds fly. Efficient wing design, feathers, and hollow, lightweight bones allow birds to fly better than any man-made machine. By drawing on the inspiration of birds, Langley researchers are hoping to develop technologies that will enable aircraft to perform with bird-like agility. For example, synthetic jets will cover parts of the wing and replicate the effects of feathers. These technologies can alter the airflow over the wings for superior maneuverability. Microspheres will replicate the bird's hollow bones and allow lightweight wings to be manufactured for increased performance and efficiency. Sounds like science fiction, but in fact, these technologies are real. We make airplanes as efficient as birds by trying to replicate or mimic some of the characteristics birds have. As an example, birds use feathers to control the airflow over the wings. We are doing that by using what are called synthetic jets. Synthetic jets suck in their own air and then pump it out very quickly creating a fluctuating plume of air. This little plume of air basically simulates what a feather would do. On a bird, the feathers are used to adjust the airflow over the wing of the birds so that the bird flies optimally no matter what the air conditions are outside. Now on an airplane we do the same thing. We put these jets inside the wing of the airplane and say for example we had a gust of wind coming into the airplane, we would turn on very specific jets at the right time and at the right frequency. And by doing so, then we can adjust the airflow over the wings of the airplane, thereby making the airplane very stable and comfortable and maneuverable at, at all flight conditions. 
We also want to be able to mimic the porous inside section of a bird bone because that porous inside section is lightweight, but it adds extra strength. We do that by using what are called tiny microspheres. We would take these microspheres and actually inject them into a composite material. And once we inject them in, we would use heat to fuse them together. So therefore, we could achieve a lightweight structure that is also very strong, which is the same thing that birds use when they fly. Anna, besides birds, are there any other designs inspired by nature? Well, we're also looking to the water for some inspiration from nature. Fish and shark and whales swim very efficiently in the water. And the flow of water over the skin of a shark is very similar to the flow of air over the wings of an airplane. If you look at shark skin under a microscope, you'll actually see a bunch of little teeny grooves. So our hope at NASA Langley is that perhaps our material scientists can create the same groove-like material and we can apply that to the skin of airplanes and make them much better flyers. We're also looking at flapping wing airplanes, believe it or not. This design was inspired by the wings of a hummingbird. If you use an airplane that does not have flapping wings, you have to have two things, an engine and wings. Flapping wing airplanes do not need an engine. The wings will provide you forward motion or thrust as well as lift which goes up. So Anna, tell me how you design a flapping wing without using an engine. We actually use what are called smart or active materials instead of using an engine. And why is it referred to as smart material? Well, smart materials actually move on command. These are materials that when you apply a stimulus like electricity or heat or in some case magnetism, they actually move. Another very common one that we've just developed is called a macrofiber composite. The macrofiber composite works by, when you apply electricity to it, it will move in the direction you'd like it to move. So what we would do is when we ad adhere this, or if you were embedded inside an airplane wing or the tails of a fighter airplane, it would actually absorb the vibration. As a consumer, you can put these in your washing machine to absorb vibration. You can put it in your cars. You can even use it to absorb sound. So we think that these materials like this one are really going to revolutionize how we build things in the future. We're also looking at a material called a shape memory alloy. We would use this material to bend and twist airplane wings. Now, you might wonder why we'd want to do that kind of thing. Well, birds also bend and twist their wings in flight. Now, being able to bend and twist airplane wings is really difficult because airplane wings tend to be very stiff. If you bend this material, the shape memory alloy, it will actually go back to its original shape. So if you bend this, I'll show you what it looks like. Then I'm going to apply this lighter to it, and you can watch it go back to its original shape. Now this simple little material can pull around 700 pounds. So by placing a couple of these in an airplane wing, we can make the airplane bend or twist. We hope that by flying more like a bird does, we can save a lot of money on fuel, as well as reduce the complexity of the mechanisms within the airplane wing. So we're using a lot of these biologically inspired materials and technologies to make aircraft and spacecraft a lot safer to fly. Ground and wind tunnel testing are currently underway in the Morphing program to bring these fascinating technologies to fruition. Sensor technologies have been around for quite some time. In fact, sensors are virtually everywhere. But what are they, and how do they work? For some answers, we turn to Johnny Alonzo. Sensors, sensors, sensors. They're just about everywhere. Most people probably couldn't live without them. Have you ever slammed the snooze bar on your alarm, open your garage with a remote control, set your car alarm, or change the channels on your television with a remote? Sure you have. They're all controlled by sensors. With today's technology, most sensors are extremely small or invisible to the naked eye. Heat, light, sound, pressure, or a particular motion can trigger a sensor to perform a specific action. There are sensors in our cars, our homes, offices, even in our own bodies. But what exactly is a sensor, and how does it work? For some answers, I spoke with Dr. Gary Gibbs at NASA Langley Research Center. A sensor is a device that detects physical phenomena such as light, heat, airflow, pressure, temperature, even sound. And generally speaking, how do sensors work? Well, they, they work through a mechanism called transduction, where we're converting one form of energy into another, maybe a form of energy that's less useful into, say, electrical energy. And an example would be like a solar cell, where it takes energy from the sun and converts it into electrical energy that we can use. 
All sensors utilize transduction to convert energy such as light or heat into typically electrical energy. Another example might be a telephone button, which when pressed converts mechanical energy from your finger into an electrical signal in the form of a tone. So Gary, what are some typical examples of sensors that we use every day? Sensors are around us everywhere. In fact, when we go to the grocery store, there's barcode scanners to detect the barcodes on the products we buy. In fact, in our car, there's the sensors to detect a crash to open the airbags. And in fact, the um, telephones that we use every day have, have sensors called microphones that sense the sound of our voice. So it would be safe to say that there are millions of sensors out there, right? Absolutely. Really? Do they all work the same? No, they actually work quite differently. We've got quite a few examples of microphones today, and they were designed for different reasons. Okay. In fact, uh, the first item we see here is an, an ancient telephone from the 50s. Yeah, I love it. And you can see here uh, a typical microphone from a CB radio or intercom type system. Sure. In fact, this is a microphone like you might see on our, your home computer. Mm -hmm. And we have a cell phone here. It even has a very tiny microphone that senses the sound of your voice. And they all sense the same kind of phenomenon, but each one is designed specifically for a particular purpose. They're all configured quite differently. So a microphone is a sensor? Yes. Okay, so how does a microphone sense sound? Well, we have a laboratory-grade microphone here connected to an oscilloscope, which is a device that uh, shows the electrical signal produced by the microphone. And you can see when I whistle, <laughs> it displays a sine wave. Yeah. A microphone is constructed with two plates, one thick and one thin, and the sound from our voice, for example, strikes the thin plate, causing it to vibrate. Okay. And that vibration produces an electrical signal similar to what we saw in the oscilloscope. Okay, so earlier I mentioned biological similarities between sensors and human senses. Right. Okay. How is a microphone similar to the human ear? That's pretty interesting because sound travels through the ear until it strikes the eardrum, okay. causing it to vibrate, similar to the plates in the microphone we talked about earlier. Oh. This vibration is transferred through tiny bones to the cochlea, which contains small hair follicles that vibrate, producing an electrical impulse, similar to the microphone. So the hair follicles are like sensors? Yes. Well, Gary, thanks for your time and uh, for showing us sure. how sensors work. Thanks for coming out to the National Language Research Center. No problem, man. No problem. I guess that's a wrap. Hey, is this thing still on? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Destination Tomorrow. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. And for all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. tomorrow we take a look at food technology and how it is used by NASA we'll find out about packaging and processing food for short and long duration space flights and we'll see what types of foods astronauts are enjoying in space all this and more next on destination tomorrow Hello everyone, I'm Kara O'Brien. Welcome to this special edition of Destination Tomorrow. On this episode, we'll be focusing on food. Not just any type of food, but the food used in the space program. Food is obviously one of the most important factors for sustaining life here on Earth. Throughout history, its abundance has helped civilizations rise to great heights, while the lack of it has led to collapse. The abundance of food also played a major part in the role of early explorers and conquerors alike. One major problem that was faced by these groups was how to preserve the food that was brought on long journeys. Although techniques like pickling and salting helped keep some foods preserved, hunting and foraging accounted for the bulk of the food that was eaten. For example, during the Lewis and Clark expedition, the men in the Corps of Discovery generally ate about nine pounds of meat apiece each day. The bulk of their food came from fresh game killed along the way rather than from food stores that were brought with them. When game was scarce, they often traded beads and trinkets with local Indian tribes for fresh meats like grizzly bear, buffalo, and when all else failed, dogs. Having large amounts of food on hand played an important role in military campaigns as well. During his reign, Napoleon Bonaparte constantly found that providing food for his soldiers was often a harder task than fighting the battles. Napoleon famously stated that an army travels on its stomach, soup makes the soldier. 
In fact, Napoleon was so committed to finding a way to preserve food for his soldiers that a prize of 12,000 francs was offered to the first person who could invent a method to successfully preserve food. After years of trying, a Parisian named Nicolas Appert came up with an idea that worked. Appert successfully preserved food by partially cooking it, sealing it in glass bottles with a cork, then immersing the bottle in boiling water. This process allowed the remaining air to be expelled through the boiling process, keeping the food fresh. A pear's preservation technique proved so successful that he was awarded the 12,000 franc prize by Napoleon himself in 1810. This represented the origination of the modern canning process for food. Not to be outdone, by about 1812, the British Army was preserving food in tin cans rather than in glass bottles. Tin cans were much more durable than glass and proved to be easier to store. By about 1818, the British Navy was storing over 40,000 pounds of food preserved in cans on board its ships, keeping crews well-fed and healthy. This military use eventually trickled down into everyday civilian life, helping the general public live healthier lives as well. The preserving process became even more widespread in the late 1800s with Frenchman Louis Pasteur's work in germ theory. This theory proved that tiny living microbes caused food to spoil. In his research, Pasteur determined he could gently heat foods and liquids to a temperature that would kill the microbes without altering the taste. Then chilling the foods and liquids would prevent any remaining microbes from multiplying. This process is now known as pasteurization. Food preservation became even more interesting with the development of spaceflight. In order to undertake manned missions in microgravity, NASA scientists needed to understand the relationship between food and the astronaut in space. In the early days of the space program, scientists were unsure if the human body could physically even swallow food in space. The proof they were looking for came on the third Mercury flight when John Glenn consumed applesauce from an aluminum tube. Most of the early food items packaged for space were chosen more for utility than for taste. This is because in the pressurized weightlessness of space, things like crumbs, liquids, and odors do not simply go away. They float around the spacecraft, decreasing the air quality, while also being potentially distracting. To help alleviate this problem, most food was stored in aluminum tubes that look very similar to toothpaste tubes. There were also packages of small bite-sized cubes of food that were approximately half an inch in size. These cubes consisted of a high-calorie mixture of proteins, such as fruits and nuts, coated with an edible film to prevent crumbs. Although the meals contained the appropriate daily amount of calories, the food was not appealing to most astronauts. Often, crews would return from space having lost weight because they did not eat all of their assigned meals. To help find new ways to make food in space more acceptable, NASA scientists began experimenting with new types of food, new packaging, and new processing procedures. To help us understand how food is now prepared and packaged for spaceflight, Tonya St. Romain spoke with Connie Ertley at Space Food Systems Laboratory at NASA Johnson Space Center. Food plays a very important role in everyone's life. We all have a comfort food or a favorite food that helps us get through those stressful days. But many of us also have foods that we find objectionable for cultural reasons or simply for the way it tastes. This is true for astronauts in space as well as for us down here on Earth. But in the confines of a spacecraft, your food choices are somewhat limited. Because food is much more than just sustenance, affecting our mental happiness as well as our physical abilities, NASA researchers have worked hard to prepare meals that astronauts look forward to eating. But space is a unique environment, so the food not only has to taste good, it also has to have a long shelf life, it has to be able to be stowed effectively, and it has to be able to withstand the rigors of space. To help us understand exactly what goes into preparing food for space, I spoke with Connie Ertley in the Space Food Systems Laboratory at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Food for the astronauts has changed extensively over the years. The days of mercury are certainly gone. Cubes and tubes are no more. Um, astronauts eat a food system that's very similar to what they eat here on Earth. It's very familiar, all kinds of food items. They can eat steak, shrimp cocktail, chocolate pudding cake, you name it. They eat all kinds of food. Here we have 
peanut cubes and sugar cookie cubes? How do you eat these? Or what? Well, again, these are from very early in the space program, and so these literally these packages would be cut open. They would put these cubes in their mouth um, and consume them. These are one of the not so appetizing things, and this is how far our food okay. has advanced. The only thing that they have now that they just cut open and pop in their mouth would be something like candy coated peanuts or cookies or something like that. The rest of these food items, um, rehydratables have to be rehydrated and heated before consumed. These types of food items, they also are heated before they are consumed and they're just simply pouches are cut open with a pair of scissors and the astronauts eat right out of it with regular utensils so it's just like eating at home. Providing an acceptable food system is very important to us. Food fills a psychological need for the astronauts so we take our jobs very seriously when we work to provide nutritious and tasty foods for the astronauts. So visual aspects of food is very important as is taste. Um, food has to taste and look good for someone to want to eat it. So we take that very seriously. We've changed that from the beginning days um, from tubes and cubes and we provide things from tomatoes and eggplant and butterscotch pudding um, all the way to peanut butter and cinnamon rolls. When developing we don't just have something that meets the astronauts nutritional needs. It has to look good and taste good and when they open a pouch you want them to smell. Oh that smells just like meatloaf and that takes me home. Connie, how many items are in the menu? We have over 250 different food items on our food list, um, a huge variety of foods. All of these foods are shelf-stable food items. They do not need to be refrigerated or frozen. That is the driving factor in our food system. We have freeze-dried foods. Freeze-dried foods make up a big portion of the food system, specifically on the space shuttle. They are foods that have had the moisture removed, and before they can be consumed, they have to add water added back to them. And the labels on the food give the astronauts instructions on how to rehydrate the food properly. This is our most favorite dish, shrimp cocktail. We had uh, three ounces of cold water from the galley, and you can see the little rotary dial where you select the uh, amount of water. You see two switches there, the yellow is the hot and the blue is the cold. Then you kind of squish uh, the water into the shrimps and wait about 10 minutes for the shrimp to totally rehydrate. And uh, it actually comes together and forms a nice sauce. Now on Earth you might eat with a knife, spoon, and spork. And spork in space, scissors and a spoon is all you need. And we use the scissors to open up the food tray. And uh, one of the features of all of our food is it has a lot of heavy sauce, which kind of holds it together. And then we just use our spoon, and uh, because of the sauce, it doesn't float away. The surface tension holds it there. It's, it's real nice. Okay, so we have a little Italian vegetables here, but we've got chicken. How do you not need to refrigerate? The chicken salad. <laughs> because the moisture has been removed in the food, um, that's what renders it shelf stable. There is nothing there um, that would spoil. And when you add water to these, do they grow? Do the sizes grow like a sponge? S slightly. There is a vacuum on all of these packages, um, so all the oxygen has re been removed from the package, and that also helps extend its shelf life. Um, so water is introduced through this septum, and it does fill out this pouch. This actual portion won't expand. The pouch will expand a little bit once that moisture is introduced, but this is the actual size. Freeze drying removes the water, but doesn't disrupt the cellular integrity of the food so you can add water back and you get exactly what you started with. This isn't a condensed version, it's just literally just missing the water. And the portion sizes are fairly small, why do you keep them that way? Things do look small and that is one of the questions that we get often, but when you're actually weighing food um, and giving what is a recommended serving size, they tend to be smaller than what the average person considers. So you can't do the biggie size in space. No super size, that's right. And so there are no leftovers. That's very important. What they do have in a serving size, they do need to consume it because what they don't consume out of a package, that becomes trash. And that becomes something that has to be maintained and not to mention, it could smell. If you don't eat an entire, say you're eating tuna fish and you don't eat an entire package of tuna fish, that's a smell you're gonna have to live with for a long time. So it's to your advantage to consume the entire contents of the package. And this is interesting, there's a cinnamon roll in here. 
There is a cinnamon roll in here. This is an extended shelf life bread product. It also lasts at room temperature for a couple of years, which is very different from most of the bread products you can think of because bread molds in a couple of weeks. These have been formulated so that the water activity, which is the amount of free moisture that would be available to microbes if they were present. This has been lowered so much that if there was anything present, it couldn't spoil the product. And this is one of the older, you were saying, um, it's come a long way. There, there aren't well, cans as much anymore, is that correct? That's right. We have moved away from the can. Um, we have very few items that are in cans right now. Off the top of my head, I can think of about three or four. We have moved to the pouch. These foods are thermally processed. It's another word for canned food, um, or we also call it retorting. And the food inside of this container has been heat treated so that the food is what is called commercially sterile. Um, we use this pouch for several reasons. This is a technology from the military. This is what looks like their meal ready to eat packages. However, these are our formulations in these packages. And the pouch is great because, one, when processing, um, it's not so rigid like this can, and in order to heat treat this can, you might end up over processing the food item. In this pouch, which is nice and flat and uniform, products don't get over processed, so you end up with a high quality food item. Also, what's really nice is they stow very efficiently. This pouch takes up a lot less room than a bulky, rigid can, so we can stow more food items much more efficiently um, and use our container space as best that we can. And then last, it's a means of trash management. A can, again, is very bulky. You have an empty can to deal with in the trash. It takes up a lot of space. This just folds completely flat, and you can store a lot of empty pouches um, in a lot less space than you can store bulky cans. And the drinks, all of our beverages are powdered. All of them come in this type of package. They also have a label, which tells them the name of the product plus how much moisture needs to be added to the product before consuming. What's unique about this is you have to have a special straw to consume this beverage. And this straw is inserted into this package. It actually opens up a septum, which it opens up one-way valve. And so in microgravity, liquid's wanting to come right out of the straw. So we have a clamp on the straw to keep the liquid in. And then when the astronauts are ready to consume, they release the clamp. The liquid flows into their mouth, they have to clamp it off, and then they have to remember that above the clamp, they need to get that liquid out too or else they've got some free liquid floating around. And the astronauts are encouraged to keep their fluid intake up. It's very easy to forget to drink in space and so they're encouraged to do that often and they have plenty of drinks to keep them very well hydrated. We also offer every combination of coffee and tea that you could imagine, so they have a wide selection to choose from. But I say before you get the M&M's, they have to eat their spinach. <laughs> In a perfect world, you would. We do plan um, menus for all of the astronauts so that their nutritional needs are met. But when it comes down to it, when they get ready to eat in space, they eat what they want to eat. Coming up next, we'll find out why all the food flown into space has special cooking instructions. But first, did you know that the Space Shuttle Discovery took its name from Captain Robert Scott's famous Antarctic exploration vessel? The RRS Discovery was built in 1901, designed specifically for an extended Antarctic expedition. Because the vessel would be in Antarctica for over two years, it was required to carry enough food and equipment to support the 40-man crew until she could be resupplied. With about 35,000 pounds of preserved meats and another 42,000 pounds of flour, the Discovery left for Antarctica on August 6, 1901. Although there was a large supply of food aboard, the crew would also hunt seals and penguins, which helped prevent a common ailment of the time, scurvy. The Discovery returned from Antarctica on September 10, 1904, and in 1986 was opened to the public as a museum ship. It is now permanently moored in Dundee, Scotland. Let's rejoin Tonya and Connie back in the Food Systems Laboratory at NASA Johnson Space Center. All of the food packages have a label on them and it identifies the food and it has some rehydration and heating information. This is vegetable quiche and it actually says to add 50 milliliters of hot water and to heat for 5 to 10 minutes. So there are guidelines, they don't have to guess. Um, this amount is so that the food properly hydrates and 
this time is so that it has the time to properly hydrate and then it's at its optimum for consuming. The fuel cells used on the shuttle not only provide energy to run vehicle systems, but also produce water as a byproduct. Rather than dispose of this water, astronauts use it to help rehydrate their food. This system works so well that about half of the food and beverages now consumed aboard the shuttle are in the freeze-dried form. To help food move from the freeze-dried form to an edible meal, a piece of equipment called a rehydrator is used. The rehydrator measures the correct amount of water needed to be added to each food or drink packaged and allows the crew member to choose either hot or chilled water. Once the water is added to the food, it can be eaten in a matter of a few minutes. Although this might not sound very appealing, most crews give high marks for the food that's prepared for their missions. Why are some of these items packaged differently than others? The different types of food items determine what type of package the food is packaged in. All of our freeze-dried rehydratables are in this what we call an EDO package. It's this clear package that has a septum so that the food can be rehydrated. The other types of foods that are in clear packages are what we call our bite size or just natural form foods, granola bars, cookies, candies, nuts. They're all in these clear types of packages. This is what was developed for the food system. However, these types of food packages are not 100% oxygen and moisture impermeable. They're actually overwrapped in these types of foil packages. We also provide condiments. Peanut butter is actually one of the condiments that we provide. Very popular. We also have mustard, mayonnaise, ketchup, Tabasco sauce, relish, you name it. If we don't have it as a standard condiment, we'll get it for a crew member if they request it. Specifically, if they're on the space station and they request it, we want to keep them very happy. We also have salt and pepper. Um, not your regular salt and pepper, though, um, because if you had a regular salt and pepper shaker, it would go everywhere but the food, and that would create a huge mess. So we have liquid salt and pepper, and this is a saline solution, just salt and water. And then this is pepper. Um, it's a pepper extract in vegetable oil. We are in Houston, so tortillas are a specialty, I assume. Tortillas are very special. They might be one of the most popular food items that we have on the menu. They not only serve as a food item, they actually work as a tool also. They have replaced bread, and the astronauts use tortillas to make every combination that you could dream of. So is all the food made here at Johnson? Not all of the food is made here at the Johnson Space Center. There are some food items that are what we call COTS, commercially off-the-shelf items, things like candy-coated chocolates or granola bar or crackers that we will actually buy from a food service distributor or from the grocery store and then they're repackaged. Those are food items that don't need to be developed specifically for space flight. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Do you put any special markings or anything on the packages so everybody knows whose food is whose? All of the food items are actually color coded. Each astronaut has a color that belongs to them. Right now, the station astronauts have red, yellow, and green dots. And so all they have to do is look on their food package. And in this corner of the label is a color dot. And so if you're red, you can look for your red food. Now, if it's regular menu food, you might not be so hurt if someone happens to eat your red carrot coins. But if it's bonus food that you've specifically picked out for yourself, you're not going to be so happy when someone eats something that has a red dot on it or came out of a box that had your name on it. Okay, some astronauts say that food actually tastes different once they get up there than what they've had down here when they were eating it. How do you compensate for that? That is true. Some astronauts do note that food tastes different in orbit as opposed to what it tastes like here on the ground. One of the reasons that that could happen is there is a fluid shift when astronauts are in microgravity and so because of that fluid shift it might actually lessen their taste and smell perception. Also most of what when you're eating most of what you're tasting comes from actually from what you're smelling so if there is that fluid shift um, you might not be smelling as much therefore not tasting things that um, may not appear to be as flavorful but we do actually take some measures to compensate for that. We offer Tabasco sauce, we offer picante sauce and hot sauce, things to jazz it up, spice things up a little bit. Some astronauts taste change from Earth to when they are in orbit. Someone says that they can't live without orange juice for breakfast, then when they get into space they can't stand orange juice. 
there's not necessarily an explanation for it. It just sometimes happens. Or some astronauts don't particularly like something on the ground. And when they're up there, they can't get enough of it. When an astronaut's getting ready to go into orbit, how do they decide what they're going to eat? How do they pick the food and create a menu for themselves? The astronauts come to our lab and they actually go through a process called approbation where they consume the menu the way it has been planned for them. So they will come to our lab and they will eat breakfast, they'll eat the entire, entire breakfast that's planned for them, then they'll eat lunch and that gives them the opportunity to eat the food as they would in space and see how much they like it. Because when they're in our lab going through a food evaluation session, they're only eating one or two bites of each food item and that's not a good indicator um, or a very good indicator of how well they like a food. When they come in and they sit down and they eat breakfast and they eat an entire serving of scrambled eggs or an entire serving of waffles, then they can say, yeah, I like it that much. I definitely want that on my menu or no way. Just a bite or two is enough. I'm not eating that. Or they might decide that they like something so much that they want it to repeat more than once on their menu, so that gives them the opportunity to taste everything again, give feedback before their menu is finalized, because it is very important that the astronauts eat exactly what they want and they're never given something that they don't like. On early missions, shuttle crews were all given the exact same meal to eat. Although always nutritious, astronauts would sometimes be stuck with a food they didn't like. NASA scientists soon realized personalized meals made more sense. So after the seventh shuttle mission, NASA began allowing each astronaut to choose their own menu. Currently, International Space Station astronauts can choose from hundreds of different food items to make up their personal menu. When an astronaut's menu's been chosen, it's analyzed by a dietitian to make sure it's nutritionally appropriate. Once the menu's approved, the meals are packaged and placed in containers for spaceflight. This is a food container that they use on the International Space Station. This is what all of their food items are stowed in. Um, it's labeled on three sides with labels. All of the American food that is on the space station has a blue label, and all of the Russian food containers have red labels. And each label has a lot of information on it. It describes what kind of food container it is. We've broken foods down into different categories. This actually is a meat and entrees container. It has a container number, so for inventory tracking purposes, we have that. Barcode also serves for that purpose. A big number nine that shows what ISS Expedition crew um, gets this container. So when they're unloading and moving around containers, because space is at a premium on the space station, it's a lot easy to identify your missions increment number and of course bilingual labels so we have things in Cyrillic. Food items are stowed in these containers very efficiently. Um, every bit of the space is utilized and what's unique about these containers is they're actually collapsible. These pins remove from these containers and these walls collapse so it encourages the crew members to break these containers down. They're actually recyclable containers. Each one of these food containers actually holds enough food for three crew members for one day. So that gives you an idea of how much food is required and just how much space it takes up. With feedback from the crews, the food being processed for space is moving even closer to being as Earth-like as possible. The most requested food item for astronauts in space is shrimp cocktail. Some other favorites include steak, lemonade, and brownies. Coming up on part two of this special edition of Destination Tomorrow, Jennifer Pulley speaks with Michelle Perchonik about how NASA plans to feed astronauts in the future. And Johnny Alonzo speaks with astronaut Mike Fole about what it's actually like to live and eat in space. But first, did you know the term a square meal came from the fact that early British soldiers carried a small square cutting board with them to be used at mealtimes? When a soldier had enough food to cover the cutting board, he had a square meal. That's all for this edition of NASA's Destination Tomorrow. I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time.
Coming up on this episode of Destination Tomorrow, we take a look at a new device that may help give doctors a type of X-ray vision. We'll also find out about a unique spacecraft designed to help scout out locations on Mars for future human missions. And we take a look back at the history of the space shuttle. Plus, Johnny Alonzo finds out how sonic booms work. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Kara O'Brien and welcome to this edition of Destination Tomorrow. For many years now, NASA planners have been sending different types of spacecraft to Mars to answer basic questions about the Martian atmosphere, mineralogy, and of course, to find out if life exists there. Although these missions have been very successful in answering key scientific questions, it has been determined that we need to change our focus towards issues relating to human factors. With the agency's new push to have human crews at Mars by around 2030, there's a need to begin looking at the challenges associated with getting crews there. Researchers will need to spend a great deal of time looking for suitable landing sites that are free of dangerous obstacles, have sufficient amounts of water, and are scientifically interesting. To help in this task, a spacecraft called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been designed to help pave the way. Jennifer Poli finds out more. Although the first planned human missions to Mars probably won't take place until about the year 2030, NASA planners are already beginning to gear up for them. Literally millions of key decisions are now being made to help ensure the success of human flights to Mars in the future. Of course, one of the most important decisions that must be determined early on is where to land our crews. Planners need to find a landing site that is not only free of dangerous obstacles like boulders and craters, but there must also be scientifically valuable points of interest and of course water close by is a definite plus. To help prepare the way for these human missions, NASA planners have developed a unique spacecraft called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or MRO. Now this spacecraft will use advanced science instruments and high resolution cameras to scout locations of interest and possible landing sites for these human missions. To help us understand how the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter will work, I spoke with Scott Streepy here at the NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. Well, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is a multi-purpose spacecraft that's designed and built for the next NASA mission to Mars. Uh, basically, the orbiter will continue NASA's exploration theme of follow the water. It will be on a very small science orbit. It will be looking for water, ice, vapor, and liquid water on the surface, in the atmosphere, and even below the surface. Also, it'll be able to take some of the highest resolution pictures ever taken of Mars, and from that, NASA scientists can evaluate potential landing sites for future robotic and human missions. Also, after the primary science mission is completed, it will become a communication relay for future Mars missions. So how is the MRO mission different from other missions to Mars? Well, this particular mission has a high-resolution camera on board. It will take more detailed pictures than we've ever been able to take before. Carrying the most powerful telescopic camera ever flown to another planet, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter will be able to show surface features on Mars as small as a kitchen table. This high-resolution camera will provide a wealth of information about possible landing sites by photographing the Martian surface in unprecedented detail. Now, how is this high-resolution camera different from other cameras used on other missions? Well, this will be able to show uh, things on a much smaller scale than we've ever been able to get on Mars. Uh, you can get details of boulders and surface features that we've not been able to take with pictures. Uh, for example, uh, they will leave me investigations to try to go and find the Mars rovers that are currently there, and maybe even look for some of the spacecraft that we lost previously to see if we can better understand why those didn't complete successfully. Because the camera and five other science instruments will produce huge amounts of data every day, the MRO has been designed to send information at ten times the rate of any previous Mars mission. An added benefit to the MRO is that it will continue to be used as a communications platform for robotic missions of the future, long after its initial 24-month science phase is complete. It also has a new suite of instruments that we've never brought, uh, except for some instruments that will continue to look at the weather patterns of Mars to understand how uh, the weather impacts the motion of the water on the surface and in the atmosphere. Now, Scott, what is your role in the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission? Well, I lead a team of NASA engineers that supports the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's navigation team during the aerobraking phase. 
Um, here at NASA Langley, we have unique capabilities in aerodynamics, aerothermodynamics, thermal analysis, and flight mechanics. We're bringing all that in to help the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission during that critical aerobraking phase. Aerobraking sounds like aeronautics and braking. I'm assuming this has something to do with slowing the vehicle down? Aerobraking is a technique that you can reduce the size of a spacecraft's orbit without using very much fuel. Uh, and in fact, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, when it arrives at Mars, will use its engines to put itself into a fairly large elliptical orbit. Uh, instead of using additional fuel to make that a smaller orbit, what it will do is skim the upper atmosphere of Mars over a period of six months. And every time it goes through the atmosphere, it'll lose some of its orbital energy through atmospheric drag. But you have to be careful, because if you go too deep in the atmosphere, you could cause the major components to overheat and thus damage them. By using aerobraking at Mars, MRO is able to save hundreds of pounds of fuel. Uh, what that means is we don't have to send all that weight from Earth to Mars, and we can use maybe a smaller rocket or use that weight for something else like the science instruments. So Scott, what is the expected length of this mission? Well, after aerobraking finishes, um, the primary science mission lasts one Martian year, which is about 24 Earth months. After that's completed, that's when it will become a communication relay for future missions. Now the term reconnaissance means that you're looking for something. You said you're looking for water. What else are you searching for? It'll help the NASA scientists investigate future potential landing sites for other robotic missions, but also for the human missions that are coming. So Scott, finally, what are your overall expectations for the MRO mission? I'm really excited about the MRO mission. Not only do you have subsurface radar, very high resolution images, the search for water in all three forms, looking at the weather patterns, and the ability to send detailed information to and from future landers. I think MRO is uniquely positioned to be able to not only expand our knowledge of Mars, but also continue our recent success at Mars. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is scheduled to take about seven months to reach Mars, and an additional 21 months to take its measurements. But researchers believe that it will continue to be a valuable communications platform for many years to come. Coming up, we'll find out about a new device that may give doctors a form of X-ray vision. But first... Did you know that one big concern for future human missions to Mars is the Martian dust? Because Mars has a very thin atmosphere and has about one-third the gravity of Earth, the dust on Mars reacts differently to wind than the dust here on our home planet. The smallest dust grains on Mars are as fine as cigarette smoke and can simply hang in the air, potentially causing breathing problems for astronauts if it gets introduced into the spacecraft. This dust can also form into tornado-like dust devils that can reach as high as five miles, producing huge storms that can engulf the entire planet. NASA is known for its breakthrough technology in aeronautics and space, but few people realize how important NASA research has been in advancing medical technologies. Although this research rarely specifically attempts to develop these technologies, many of its discoveries are spun off and used in the creation of new medical devices. One of the latest inventions that has benefited from research performed at NASA is something called Artemis. This new device has the potential to make some surgeries much safer and will help to save lives. I had the opportunity to visit the laboratory at Analytical Mechanics Associates to help understand how Artemis will work. The history of medicine has a somewhat checkered past. From its earliest history until just before the beginning of the 20th century, many of the earliest practitioners were only able to provide the crudest forms of medical assistance to patients. For years, spiritual healing, bloodletting, and herbal remedies were generally the only form of medical help available to the average person. But this began to change in the late 1800s as advancements in medical practices began to move at a rapid pace. Perhaps one of the most important advancements during that time was the development of the X-ray in 1895. With this device, doctors finally had the ability to peer inside the human body without having to perform surgery. Since that time, this unique machine has proven to be invaluable, allowing doctors a two-dimensional view inside of the patient. Although this technology has been a revolution, the two-dimensional pictures were not appropriate for all types of soft tissue imaging, such as those used in cancer diagnosis and in heart procedures. So, in 1973, the introduction of the CAT scan again revolutionized the way doctors could see inside patients. This device, for the first time, allowed doctors a three-dimensional view of the body and was especially helpful in looking at soft tissue. 
So what's the next revolution? Currently, researchers using NASA technology are developing a device that could give doctors a type of X-ray vision. Using a CAT scan in conjunction with virtual reality, researchers have developed the augmented reality technology for minimally invasive surgery, or Artemis. This system may soon be helping to make surgeries much safer and much less invasive. I spoke with Bishan Shanawas of Analytical Mechanics Associates to help us find out how Artemis may be used in the future. Artemis is a state-of-the-art technology that fuses augmented reality technology with fiber optic shape sensing. The augmented reality part takes 3D images of a person's anatomy and superimposes it over the real patient itself. So this enables doctors and physicians to be able to take these 3D images and look at them exactly where they are on the real patient. The fiber optic shape sensing portion allows the doctor to see the shape and hence the tip of the needle or the RF catheter or whatever device he chooses to insert into the patient. So can you explain to me exactly how this will work? The patient goes into a CAT scan machine, you get, you get CAT scans of the patient, you assemble that into a 3D model. You then take the 3D model and project it onto the screen. You then register the 3D model over the actual patient and then the doctor can see where exactly the organs are. You then stick the needle in with this fiber optic shape sensing technology from Luna Innovations. You insert it into the patient. Once the doctor inserts the needle into the patient, the doctor can see where the needle is going. The doctor guides the needle to the exact spot burns out the tumor, extracts the tissue, does whatever the procedure demands. What are the issues these days with the way doctors are using CAT scans in some surgeries today? The problem today is that the doctor has to look away from the screen and look at the CAT scans or 3D images without looking directly at the patient. So he's trying to poke the patient, but he's looking at something else. If you ever try to do something while looking at something else, you'll kind of realize what the difficulty is. But that's the general problem, is that you cannot see where you're going. You cannot look at what your target lesion is or what your target organ is, and you cannot, look at, you cannot see your needle once it's been inserted. It's kind of like, it's pretty much groping in the dark. That amount of pressure, so we reduce pressure. The Artemis system holds great promise for use in minimally invasive surgeries. Because these surgeries generally use probes, catheters, and needles to perform the work, the real-time virtual look inside the body will improve the quality, safety, and efficiency of procedures. With tens of thousands of minimally invasive surgeries being performed each year, the addition of the Artemis system will undoubtedly save time, reduce cost, and most importantly, help save lives. This device gives the doctor direct x-ray vision into the patient. So the glasses are what you use to see the stereo image. What happens is the system draws one image as if it's been seen with your left eye. It draws another image as if it's been seen with your right eye and it shutters it fast enough and the glasses shutter in sync so that you're looking at your right eye, you're looking at your left eye and your right eye and when you look at them together it does it so fast and it syncs it together. That way it looks like you're looking at a 3D image in real life. Now what types of NASA technology was used to help you develop this? As you know with NASA we've used virtual reality and visualization for ergonomic design of the space shuttle and for different other types of uh, aerospace concepts. We've decided to take that technology and extend it to you to the realm of augmented reality and apply that to medicine. I'm very excited about this technology. It's actually we are, we're pretty sure that it can actually make minimally invasive surgical procedures a lot safer. It's going to make uh, medical care from that perspective a lot less expensive. It's going to minimize the time for people to wait and, we, uh, and the time for these operating procedures. And we envision that at some point it can be applied to things such as beating heart surgery. That's kind of like the holy grail. So there's so many things that we're looking forward to actually doing with this and we're very excited over here. Towards the end of the Apollo program, NASA officials were already thinking about what would be next for the American space program. At that time, the rockets used to place astronauts and equipment into space were designed to be used only once. Although effective, NASA planners decided that they needed a system that was less expensive, reliable, and perhaps most of all, reusable. The idea of a reusable space shuttle that could launch like a rocket and land like an airplane was appealing and would soon change the way astronauts were traveling into space. 
The space shuttle was born on January 5, 1972, when President Richard Nixon authorized the development of reusable vehicles for space exploration. The project became known officially as the Space Transportation System, or STS. It was based on a piloted spacecraft boosted into orbit by a reusable launch vehicle that could return to Earth like an airplane, ready to be used again on short notice. This new vehicle consisted of three primary elements, a delta-winged orbiter spacecraft, two solid rocket boosters, and one external fuel tank. Over a 10-year span, five orbiters were built, including the test vehicle named Enterprise and the four space orbiters, Columbia, Discovery, Atlantis, and Challenger. On April 12, 1981, after years of testing and construction, the first shuttle, Columbia, reached orbit piloted by astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen. The first four shuttle flights were collectively called the Orbital Flight Test Program and demonstrated how the spacecraft performed under real spaceflight conditions. During these first four flights, NASA tested the shuttle as a launch vehicle, habitat for crew members, freight handler, instrument platform, and aircraft. After the fourth landing, NASA declared the shuttle ready for operation. Since that time, the shuttle program has performed well over 100 missions and has accomplished a number of monumental achievements. In June 1983, Sally Ride became the first American woman in space. The shuttle launched the Magellan spacecraft to Venus, the Galileo spacecraft to Jupiter, and the Ulysses spacecraft to study the sun. The shuttle also has deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, the Gamma Ray Observatory, and the Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite. Another key milestone came in 1998 when astronaut John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, returned as the oldest man ever to reach space as a member of the crew of Discovery on a nine-day mission. The shuttle has also been instrumental in constructing and outfitting the International Space Station while also being used to carry large payloads to and from orbit and perform servicing missions on satellites. The design, now approaching its third decade, is still state-of-the-art in many areas, including computerized flight control, airframe design, electrical power systems, thermal protection system, and main engines. Even though the sophisticated shuttle program suffered the devastating losses of the Columbia and the Challenger, its successful missions have made great strides in space travel and exploration during its short history. More than 100 documented NASA technologies from the space shuttle are now incorporated into the tools we use, the foods we eat, and the biotechnology and medicines used to improve health. Although plans are now in the works to retire the fleet, the space shuttle program will forever hold a special place in the history of space travel, not only for its unique design, but for the history and technologies it brought to all of us. The Space Shuttle has been one of the most valuable and important tools in our quest to increase our understanding of space. It is scheduled to go out of service in the near future, being replaced by the new Crew Exploration Vehicle. Up next, we'll find out exactly how sonic booms work. But first... Did you know Enterprise, the first Space Shuttle test vehicle, was originally to be named Constitution in honor of the U.S. Constitution's bicentennial? However, viewers of the popular TV science fiction show Star Trek started a write-in campaign urging the White House to change the name to Enterprise. Designated OV-101, the newly named Enterprise was rolled out of the assembly facility on September 17, 1976 to begin its work as a flying test bed. Although it never flew in space, the Enterprise flew eight captive flights attached to the 747 shuttle carrier and five free flights that landed at Edwards Air Force Base. The Enterprise was enormously successful helping test and prove technologies that would be needed in future space shuttles. In November 2003, Enterprise was moved to the Smithsonian Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center near Washington Dulles Airport, where it is now on permanent public display. Today in our busy world, one of the key prerequisites for many people in personal and business life is speed. This is especially true when it comes to aviation. Although air travel is almost always the fastest means of travel, many would like it to become even faster. Though the technology exists for aircraft to fly at speeds faster than the speed of sound, 
Today's aircraft don't because of the problem with sonic booms. To help lessen the impact of these booms, NASA researchers are attempting to find a way to help aircraft move faster without causing disruptions on the ground. Our own Johnny Alonzo spoke with researcher Dr. Kevin Shepard at NASA Langley Research Center to learn what a sonic boom is and find out how it works. In the early days of flight, having an aircraft that could fly even as fast as 30 miles per hour seemed revolutionary. But a goal that pushed virtually every aircraft designer, engineer, and pilot at that time was to find a way to increase the speeds of their aircraft. As new designs began to emerge, aircraft were continually getting stronger, safer, and above all, faster. By the mid-1940s, aircraft technology had advanced to the point that breaking the sound barrier was finally in sight. After numerous attempts and failures, the world's first sonic boom was heard on October 14, 1947, when Chuck Yeager flew the X-1 aircraft into history over the desert near Edwards, California. From that point on, military and civilian test pilots were regularly breaking the sound barrier in fighter aircraft and in specialized test vehicles like the X-15. But it wasn't until 1976 that civilian passengers finally got their chance to fly supersonically with the introduction of the famed Concorde. The Concorde had the ability to fly at over 11 miles high, 1,350 miles per hour, and travel from Paris to New York in only three and a half hours. Unfortunately, one of the major drawbacks from the Concorde's incredible speed was the amount of noise it produced. Not only was it noisy when taking off and landing, but once it reached supersonic speeds, it created a very loud sonic boom. Sonic booms are so disconcerting to most people on the ground that commercial aircraft have only been given the clearance to break the sound barrier over water. So, are we just relegated to flying below the speed of sound? Well, maybe not. To help us understand what causes a sonic boom, and if there's anything we can do to lessen its impact, I spoke with Dr. Kevin Shepard at NASA Langley Research Center to find out how it works. Any vehicle traveling faster than the speed of sound creates a sonic boom. Um, what actually happens is shock waves, which are pressurizes and develop near the airplane, and as those travel to the ground, what we perceive as a noise, in fact, is this sudden pressure jump, um, much like a rifle crack or a balloon popping, in fact, what you hear are two booms, closely separated in time, boom, boom, and you could visualize it as two rifle cracks or as two claps of thunder, sure. closely spaced in time. What is the speed of sound, and uh, well, how do you measure the speed of sound? We, we like to say Mark 1 okay. is supersonic, everyone knows that expression, Mark 2 is twice the speed of sound, Mark 3, three times, and so forth. Um, the actual speed depends on the atmospheric conditions, so if you're Near the surface, where it's typically quite warm, um, speed of sound is 700, 750 miles an hour. When you're at altitude, where airplanes fly, it's a little lower, maybe 600 miles an hour. So, for example, Concorde traveled at Mark II, 1,200 miles an hour is roughly the speed it traveled at. A common misconception about the sound barrier is once it has been broken, there is just one quick noise, and then the noise dissipates. One reason this misconception is so prevalent is that most people hear a sonic boom when they're standing in a stationary position on the ground. What actually happens is when the aircraft breaks the sound barrier, it continues to break it as long as it's flying supersonically. Any observer on the ground, you know, hears the airplane go by. Uh, it's a, if you picture a boat in the middle of a creek and the bow wave from the boat, you watch the boat go by, and a little while later, that bow wave passes you on the riverbank. People further down the riverbank have the exact same experience. So what's happening is, in the case of the airplane, it's dragging this boom carpet behind it all the way across the country. Depending on weather and altitude, the sonic boom created by the aircraft can be heard in a path of about 60 miles wide for the entire distance of the flight. So, if an aircraft is flying from New York to Los Angeles, the sonic boom will be heard consistently across the country in a 60 mile wide path. This is the foremost reason supersonic flights are not allowed to fly over land in the United States. Yeah, most people find the sonic boom unacceptable. These are the two loud sounds, um, they're startling, they're annoying, um, they tend to shake buildings, rattle windows, and so based on experience with Concorde, for example, um, it just doesn't happen. There is no commercial overland supersonic flight. But revolutionary steps now being taken by NASA may change that in the future. So Dr. Shepard, are we stuck with the fact that we'll never be able to fly over land at supersonic speed? We're hopeful that's not the case. Uh, the current programs we're working on are aimed at allowing supersonic overland flight. Um, the hope we have is based on a recent flight test which demonstrated that we can in fact shape the airplane in such a way that we can shape the sonic boom and it sound different, sound more acceptable. 
Um, this has been known in theory for 40 plus years, but it was only demonstrated within the last couple of years with a real flight vehicle. Now that's part of the story. The real issue is can we get the boom low enough for people to find it acceptable? We think we can reduce it. Can we reduce it enough? We're hopeful and we're hoping we'll have a flight demonstrator within the next few years. So Dr. Shepard, how do you test sonic booms? I mean, is it always in flight or can you also test it on land? We'd love to do it in flight. Okay. But building vehicles, as you can imagine, is very expensive and you don't get to do it very often. So if you've got a theory that this kind of vehicle will make a different kind of boom than this, yeah, we'd like to build the vehicles, but that's not going to happen. So in terms of figuring out what people might find acceptable, we simulate the sonic booms using ground-based simulators, which are basically loudspeaker systems, where we can produce the sounds that would be developed by certain vehicle types. Sure. And that's the simulators that we have here at Langley. They're being used for that, because we hope that will guide the design of the airplanes to ultimately lead to a, an acceptable sonic boom. Can you give me some examples of what you test in these simulators? These simulators are basically loudspeaker-based systems, so we can make sounds, and we can design them to make sounds that sound very much like real sonic booms. Um, we bring in human test subjects, members of the public, and in essence, they give us their opinion. You know, this sonic boom versus another, which actually corresponds to one airplane versus another, because we're trying to design airplanes to give us the right sonic boom. And so the characteristics of the boom is what they're assessing with their ears. If we can solve the sonic boom problem, then we can have supersonic flight over land. People and goods can get from place to place quicker, because our overall aim here is to make the air transportation system more efficient, safer, in this case faster, but also environmentally acceptable. That way we save time, we save money, we have a more efficient system. That's it for this edition of NASA's Destination Tomorrow. I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. Coming up on Destination Tomorrow, a unique ballistic parachute system might help pilots and passengers potentially survive a catastrophic accident. And we visit the Andoya rocket range in Andenes, Norway, to find out how NASA is investigating the Northern Lights. Plus, we'll take a look back at how NASA research helped change the shape of America's air superiority in World War II. And Johnny Alonzo finds out how air traffic controllers keep a watchful eye on our skies at all times. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien and welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. 
The Northern Lights are a celestial phenomenon that have amazed people for centuries. The scientific name for the phenomena is Aurora Borealis, which is Latin and translates into the Red Dawn of the North. Although they are incredible to watch, the particles that make up the auroras are actually a type of electricity that can cause electrical surges and disrupt satellite operations in space and communications here on Earth. To better understand these problems, NASA has been working with researchers and engineers at the Andoya Rocket Range in Andenes, Norway. Sophisticated rockets are launched into the atmosphere to collect valuable data that might explain the secrets of the auroras. Jennifer Pulley spoke with Dr. Sten Odenwall at the Andoya Rocket Range in Andenes, Norway to find out more. The Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, is one of the most beautiful, natural occurring phenomena known to man. These shimmering currents of light which are normally seen near the Arctic Circle, have intrigued and inspired observers for thousands of years. Until the late 19th century, many still believe that the Northern Lights were driven by supernatural means, rather than by natural means. Although these old beliefs are intriguing, we now know that the auroras are actually caused by energized particles colliding with the Earth's magnetosphere. Until recently, the auroras had little direct impact on life here on Earth. But with almost every person on the planet now relying on satellites and electricity as part of their daily lives, the need to understand auroral activity has increased. This is because those same particles that collide with the magnetosphere to create the northern lights can also severely damage important satellites and cause outages in electrical power grids around the world. In an effort to better understand these events, NASA is using innovative technologies to learn more about the northern lights and how they affect us here on Earth. I spoke with NASA Goddard's Dr. Sten Odenwald here at the Andoya Rocket Range in Andenes, Norway, to find out more. It's a very complicated process that leads to an aurora. Uh, once you see it, it's, the whole process is sort of hidden from view. You know, we understand a little bit about how the particles get from the outer parts of the magnetic field of the Earth and into the atmosphere, but we, we don't see the details, you know, how the particles go from one kind of a system into another, how they get boosted in energy. Even at this late stage, we don't exactly know what the particles are that produce the aurora. Tracking them from where they're produced and where they're energized all the way down to the atmosphere is still something of a mystery. And that's why we have satellite and rocket experiments that are trying to fill in those missing pieces of the puzzle. To understand why it is important to study the Northern Lights, we must first understand how they work. The sun is constantly emitting streams of electrically charged particles in all directions. This stream of charged particles is called the solar wind. Since the sun is 93 million miles away, it takes about three days for the particles to reach Earth. As the solar winds flow by the Earth, it causes a disturbance in the Earth's magnetosphere. This disturbance energizes currents of particles which are steered by magnetic forces towards the Earth's poles. These energized particles collide with oxygen and nitrogen atoms in our atmosphere which produce the colorful light that we see in the aurora. Although beautiful to watch, these currents of particles are actually a form of electricity which can generate up to 800 gigawatts of electrical power. This electrical energy flowing in the upper atmosphere can cause currents to flow in the ground, producing disruptions in communication, electrical outages, and fuel leaks. The high energy particles flowing in space that often accompany these storms can also hit satellites, damaging their sensitive electronics and creating false commands. This can wreak havoc on television, pager, and other communication services here on Earth. NASA researchers hope to find new ways to predict not only when these storms will hit Earth, but also hope to find ways to reduce their destructive effects when they do. What are some of the tools you use to study the Northern Lights? We have satellites that seem to be able to look at everything that goes on with a solar storm and the production of aurora, literally from cradle to grave. Uh, we have satellites that uh, watch the solar surface for the big leaps of matter and energy. We've got uh, satellites that look at the wind in between the planets to watch what that's doing. We also have satellites that are in tighter orbits to the Earth so that they can look at the poles of the Earth and see the aurora happen. They can also measure electric fields in space and magnetic fields in space. So they can also see the invisible flows of particles around the Earth. And then finally, we have rockets that 
go up into the aurora from the bottom at the same time that the satellites are passing overhead. So we can kind of see the physics in between flows of particles inwards, and the rockets see the electrical fields that are set up by these things. And you know, we get this complete picture uh, from rockets and satellite observations. So why is Norway such a popular place to study the Northern Lights? It turns out that Norway is uh, in a place that's very favorably located to actually see the aurora directly overhead. So you can launch the rockets directly up very quickly to get into the aurora at the time that they're changing. Dr. Odenwall, how do you think NASA research is helping us better understand the aurora and its impact on Earth? Well, NASA's invested an awful lot of time and effort into providing scientists with the technology and equipment they need to really make powerful and, and, and insightful discoveries about how aurora work. And that feeds into our knowledge of the environment that we live in in space and how that affects human technology, our, our billions of dollars of satellites that we have there, the health of astronauts because of the energetic particles. It, it's all, it all works together. And it, it, if we can deeply understand space weather effects uh, with the help of NASA technology, uh, it's going to be much easier for us to operate in space. And that's the direction that we want to go as a civilization. Auroras occur around both the northern and southern geomagnetic poles. While the northern lights are known as the Aurora Borealis, the southern lights are referred to as the Aurora Australis. Coming up, we'll find out about an innovative new parachute system which is attached to the plane rather than the person inside. But first, did you know that solar flares can be very dangerous to astronauts outside the Earth's atmosphere? In August 1972, an intense solar proton event occurred between the flights of Apollo 16 and 17. If the Apollo 17 astronauts had been on the way to the moon during that time, the astronauts would have absorbed lethal doses of radiation within 10 hours of being exposed. Currently, there are well over 250,000 active general aviation airplanes around the world. These small aircraft are not only a very popular form of transportation, but are also relatively safe. Unfortunately, about one in every 300 of these planes are involved in an accident every year. To make general aviation flying safer, NASA has funded an innovative new parachute recovery system, which, when deployed, may actually allow pilots to walk away from what could have been a catastrophic accident. Tonya St. Romain finds out more. The sight of small aircraft flying around our skies is a familiar one to most of us. These small general aviation, or GA planes, are favorites of private pilots, small businesses, and flight schools because of their relative low cost and the freedom they provide. Although these aircraft are very safe, about 1,600 of them are involved in accidents every year, and quite often, these accidents can be fatal. In an effort to prevent many of these accidents from becoming fatal, NASA has funded an innovative program which uses a ballistic parachute mounted on the plane, which when deployed can actually save the plane and the passengers from a catastrophic accident. I spoke with Lisa Jones at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. Parachute recovery systems are not new. They've been used to return our astronauts from the moon, the Apollo program, for instance. They've been applied to the military aircraft, such as the F-11 crew escape module. It floats down on a parachute recovery system. Now they're being applied to general aviation aircraft. And in the structural designs, this is a good way to save money and weight because you can actually design a structure to support the parachute system. The parachute works like this. During an emergency event, if the pilot feels that he's about to lose control of the aircraft or has lost control, he must turn off the engine, then simply pull firmly on the parachute release handle located above his head. The parachute, which is propelled by a solid fuel rocket motor, is released from a special opening on top of the fuselage. Three Kevlar straps connect the parachute to the airframe and help slow the aircraft, guiding it through a level descent. Although the parachute system already has 155 saves with ultralight aircraft, the first save in a general aviation plane came in October of 2002, with the aircraft suffering little damage and the pilot walking away from the crash with no injuries at all. So Lisa, is this parachute system just for new aircraft or can it be retrofitted on older planes? Parachute system design can be incorporated into older aircraft designs. It just you would have to do some modification to the structure, make sure that the structure could handle the loads the system puts on the airframe, 
and also be certified for it. Lisa, what are some situations where a pilot would need to use this device? As a pilot can tell you, there's many times when things would go bad quickly when flying. So there are many different scenarios where the system may be deployed. Some situations where a parachute recovery system could be used are loss of control of the aircraft due to icing, engine failure, and airframe structural failure. One of the most common causes of general aviation aircraft accidents is pilot disorientation. Many pilots are only rated to operate an aircraft under visual flight rules, or VFR. But in order to fly in bad weather, a pilot should also be able to fly under IFR, or instrument flight rules. If a visual flight rules rated pilot encounters weather where he can't see visual landmarks outside the plane, then spatial disorientation can occur. When this happens, the pilot literally cannot determine if his plane's in level flight or if it's turning or banking. Very frequently, the VFR pilot will rely on his instincts rather than his instruments, which can lead to a catastrophic outcome. With the parachute recovery system on board, no matter what the situation, the pilot has one last best option to save not only the aircraft, but most importantly, the lives of everyone on board. I know this is being used for general aviation aircraft, but is there a chance that it could be used on larger planes? I think it can be applied to some of the business jets where you're talking about uh, 10, 12, 14 passengers perhaps. Uh, that would have to be really, really investigated closely. But for an application to a transport, you're not going to see that. The structural requirements for the aircraft would be enormous to handle that, as well as the design characteristics for the chute itself to be able to take the energy of a large transport. So you're not going to be able to use this efficiently on anything of much size greater than the general aviation aircraft. So Lisa, why is NASA working on this type of project? NASA has a program called the Aviation Safety Program. And in that, we are looking at different types of things to improve safety everywhere. Some of that in the early part of the program was focused on general aviation. There are a thousand lives a year lost to general aviation accidents. And this type of system can really improve those numbers and hopefully get those down where we see a lot more people walking away from accidents. When looking back at American fighter planes of World War II, an impressive record of aerial victory stands out. This is especially true in the later stages of the war when American air superiority dominated both the Pacific and European combat theaters. But surprisingly, this was not the case in the beginning stages of the war. Early American fighters could not always match the speed and maneuverability of the enemy aircraft that they were facing. To help find a way to improve the aircraft American pilots were flying, U.S. military planners turned to NASA's predecessor, NACA, which they hoped could find a way to help the United States gain air superiority over World War II's battlefields. On the eve of World War II, with the prospect of war looming in the United States, military planners began an exhaustive look at the preparedness and equipment that it would use to fight a war. One area where the United States had fallen noticeably behind to its future enemies was in aircraft. Many of the aircraft that U.S. pilots were flying were much slower and less maneuverable than the aircraft that they would soon be facing in combat. With this knowledge in hand, a concerted effort was made by the U.S. government to find ways to quickly improve the American aircraft situation. Since NASA's predecessor, NACA, or the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, was the preeminent aeronautics lab in the country, a large part of this examination fell to them. NACA researchers knew that they could improve an aircraft's performance by simply reducing the amount of drag the aircraft experienced. This was called drag cleanup. The Navy's XF-2A Brewster Buffalo was the first of many military aircraft tested by NACA in an effort to improve performance. Researchers at the NACA Langley Research Center took only five days to determine several key areas in which the Buffalo could be improved. To the untrained eye, the Buffalo appeared aerodynamically clean. However, the wind tunnel information showed a very different picture. Many parts, like the gun sights, the engine cowling, and landing gear on the Buffalo protruded into the slipstream, causing increased drag, which slowed the aircraft tremendously. The researchers at NACA modified these problem areas, which increased the Buffalo's speed by an impressive 10%. Such a performance improvement without raising engine power or reducing fuel efficiency immediately caught the eye of many aircraft designers. Extra speed for a fighter plane, 
even as little as 15 miles per hour, could determine who won or lost in an aerial dogfight. When Langley researchers streamlined the U.S. Navy's F-4F Wildcat, it was able to fly a full 45 miles per hour faster. The F-4F's successor, the F-6F Hellcat, was also streamlined, making it faster and more maneuverable, able to reach a maximum speed of 375 miles per hour. This extra speed proved valuable in combat, allowing Hellcat pilots to destroy nearly 5,000 enemy planes in aerial engagements. NACA Langley proved a key stopping point for dozens of aircraft on their way to combat duty in World War II. During one month alone in July 1944, 36 U.S. Army and Navy planes were evaluated in detailed studies of stability, control, and performance. NACA Langley tested 137 different airplane types between 1941 and 1945, either in wind tunnels or in flight. While NACA's pioneering drag cleanup work helped save the lives of many American pilots during World War II, it also shortened the war considerably and saved the lives of countless others around the world. During the World War II era, NACA researchers also worked on a series of wing designs called the Low Drag Series. These wing designs were so successful in improving aircraft performance that they are still being used by airplane designers today. Coming up, we find out how new satellites may help scientists better understand the Earth's atmosphere. But first, did you know that Charles Lindbergh shot down a Japanese fighter in World War II? Although Lindbergh was not in the military, he was secretly asked to teach American pilots how to increase the range of their P-38 Lightnings. During a training mission on July 28, 1944, Lindbergh encountered a Japanese Sonya aircraft. As the Sonya turned to attack, Lindbergh fired a short burst, sending the Sonya down in flames. Understanding the Earth's atmosphere can be very difficult. A mixture of global weather patterns, greenhouse gases, and airborne particles can make the overall picture for scientists very confusing. To help provide a better picture of how all of these variables affect the Earth's atmosphere, NASA researchers are developing new atmospheric satellite systems. These new systems will not only work to provide a better understanding of the Earth's atmosphere, but will lead to better prediction models. Stephanie Nevin finds out more. In recent years, researchers have seen an alarming warming trend in the global climate. Reports of increasing temperatures, thinning glaciers, and rising sea levels have led to widespread speculation that global warming is being caused by greenhouse gases that result from man's activities. Climate models that predict the Earth's future climate patterns indicate that global warming could continue to increase if the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere continues to rise. Even though these climate models are powerful tools in predicting future global climate, a more detailed understanding of clouds and aerosols could lead to more accurate climate prediction models. Researchers may be able to determine why the climate is warming, if it is being affected by greenhouse gases, and what we can do to change it. That is why researchers at NASA are preparing six innovative satellite systems, which when launched will provide key information about the Earth's atmosphere. Two of these satellites, Calypso and CloudSat, will focus primarily on aerosols and cloud structures, providing much more information about how clouds and aerosols interact with each other and how they are affecting the atmosphere's radiation balance. I spoke with Lamont Poole at NASA Langley Research Center to find out more. It's important to study clouds and airborne particles, which we call aerosols, because both of them have significant effects on the Earth's climate, just like greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. But unlike greenhouse gases, which warm the planet, airborne particles and, and clouds can either have a warming effect or a cooling effect, depending on their type and their altitude. Because of these complicating factors, it's very difficult to represent cloud and aerosol processes accurately in climate models that are used to forecast the, uh, the climate in the future. So the data that, that we will be collecting from CloudSat and Calypso will provide a more, much more accurate picture of cloud and aerosol processes. So what are the differences between the Calypso and CloudSat satellites? They're going to be launched on the same rocket and when they get to altitude, they will separate into different, but very closely matched orbits. In fact, as uh, Calypso and CloudSat orbit the Earth, they will be uh, within 10 to 15 seconds of each other in their orbit. A CloudSat and Calypso are going to be flying as part of a formation of satellites that's called the Afternoon Constellation, 
or the A-Train for short. The A-Train will actually consist of six separate satellites flying in close proximity to one another. Once in orbit, each satellite will cross the equator within minutes of one another, taking specific atmospheric measurements. Although each satellite has a unique mission, the data retrieved will be combined together, providing detailed observations about the condition of Earth and assisting scientists with making predictions related to climate change. By combining information from the different satellites, scientists will be able to gain much more information about the condition of the planet than they could from any single mission alone, greatly improving prediction capabilities. Once these systems are in place, what do you hope the outcome will be? Our ultimate goal is to provide accurate scientific information to decision makers and, and governments worldwide so that uh, informed and balanced decisions on how to mitigate or adapt to climate change can be made. And NASA is going to play a very crucial role in this process because of our capabilities in developing and flying uh, new technologies such as Calypso and CloudSat. <laughs> NASA researchers are not only studying the Earth's atmosphere from space, but are also making airborne measurements by using specially adapted aircraft. By the year 2010, the FAA, or Federal Aviation Administration, estimates approximately one billion passengers will travel on board commercial planes. As air travel increases, pilots are faced with more congestion on the ground and in the air. And while pilots are ultimately in control of their own aircraft, it is the air traffic controllers who are directing them the moment the plane leaves the gate keeping in constant communication as the plane travels en route. Our own Johnny Alonzo finds out how this complex system keeps our skies organized and our planes on schedule. During peak air travel times in the United States, there are about 5,000 airplanes in the sky every hour, which is about 50,000 aircraft operating in our skies every day. From the time the plane pushes back from the gate until it arrives at the gate of its final destination, it is being handled by air traffic controllers. These controllers must coordinate the movements of thousands of aircraft, keep them at safe distances from each other, and direct them during takeoff and landing from airports. Air traffic controllers are also responsible for directing aircraft around bad weather and ensuring that traffic flows with minimal delay for both commercial and private aircraft. And I spoke with Gary Laura from NASA Langley to find out how it works. An air traffic controller is primarily tasked with separating airplanes. However, they do provide other services such as traffic advisories, weather information, and, and other status types of information uh, for the national airspace system. What are some of the tools used by air traffic controllers? The primary tool used by controllers for separation services is called radar, which stands for radio detection and ranging. And essentially what happens is from an antenna, a radio beam is transmitted, it bounces off the aircraft, and is returned to the radar antenna. Uh, and there's a presentation on the radar display of which your position is based on that return. You can see behind us there's a display which is part of the radar system that controllers use and your position as well as the position of other aircraft in the system will be presented on display and give the information the controller needs to provide tra air traffic services to you. So does one controller handle my plane while it's in the air? There are a number of controllers that will handle your flight as you move throughout the system. Once you depart, your flight will be handed off to yet another controller, and that, that process continues throughout the duration of your flight. The primary delineation of what a controller is responsible for in a radar environment is called a sector. So as a controller works you through his or her sector, you'll be transferred to another sector where another controller will work you. All right, all right so Gary, wait, walk me through this. What happens from departure to arrival, from gate to gate? Assuming there aren't any delays, you'll taxi out to your departure a runway and there's a controller that issues taxi instructions and deconflicts you from other airplanes on the ground. There's a controller that will issue a takeoff clearance for you and yet another controller uh, that, will, that will work you as you're, you're climbing to your uh, cruise altitude. As a matter of fact, several controllers. As airplanes move from one sector to the next, there's a transfer of what we call uh, control and there's a transfer of communication so that you'll be in communications with each controller along the way. And this process continues all the way to your destination airport and you may talk to 10 or 15 uh, different controllers and reach your destination. Prior to descending into the terminal area at your destination airport, there are several controllers involved in sequencing inbound to that airport and assigning the, uh, the arrival runway. Uh, once you get there, you'll land, uh, you'll taxi clear the runway, and you'll be issued taxi instructions. They'll take you right to your gate. But that's basically how the process works. Wow. And I thought that the pilot was in control of the whole flight. 
Well, the, the pilot is ultimately responsible for the safe operation of his or her airplane. Yeah. However, they are required to adhere to air traffic control instructions. Just like when you're driving your car, there are certain signs along the way that basically tell you what, you, what you're required to do. Uh, as you get to a busy intersection, you may have to slow the car down. If there's a red light, you have to stop because you're trying to accommodate other cars because you're not the only car out there. And that's pretty much the way your air traffic control system works. Sure. There are control instructions that are issued because you're not the only airplane out there. Do you get tickets? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> so in the future, will air traffic control be much different than it is today? I think so. Uh, we're, of course, not building more airports. Uh, we're not building many more runways either. So we have to optimize the use of the facilities that we currently have. Uh -huh. And to that end, NASA is looking at cutting edge concepts and technologies to make better utilization of those facilities, both in terms of capacity, that is to say the number of airplanes you can get in and out of an airport at a given time, and safety as well. And these are just some of the concepts that have been explored uh, by NASA and, are, and continue to be explored. Really? I got a question. How do you um, change the channel on this? I mean, do you have cable on this thing? <laughs> That's all for this edition of Destination Tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time. up on Destination Tomorrow, we'll discover that playing video games might help people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder control their behavior. We'll also see how new technologies are making air travel safer and more efficient. And we'll meet an engineer who developed a wingless vehicle that revolutionized spacecraft designs. All this and more next on Destination Tomorrow. Hello everyone, I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. Welcome to Destination Tomorrow. This program will uncover how past, present, and future research is creating today's knowledge to answer the questions and solve the challenges of tomorrow. The International Space Station orbits the Earth every 90 minutes and will provide an orbital laboratory in a reduced gravity environment for long-term research. This microgravity environment gives researchers an opportunity to study the fundamental states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, and the forces that affect them. A unique facility at NASA Glenn is able to conduct microgravity research here on Earth. NASA researchers can study how the lack of gravity will affect the experiments before they are brought into space. Jennifer Pulley takes us inside NASA Glenn's 2.2 second drop tower. <laughs> Now, you've all seen astronauts and objects floating around inside an orbiting spacecraft, seemingly free of Earth's gravitational field. But these images are misleading. In fact, these objects are actually not floating, but in a state of continuous freefall. Any object in freefall experiences microgravity, or weightlessness, which occurs when the object falls towards the Earth. Before NASA researchers send experiments on board shuttle missions or to the International Space Station, they often test them here on Earth. But how do you replicate microgravity here on Earth? NASA Glenn has been conducting microgravity experiments since the 1960s in drop towers like this. 
These facilities rely on free fall of the experiment to produce a microgravity environment. Here, NASA can test experiments in a reduced gravity environment, similar to orbiting in space. The 2.2 second draft tower is one of two microgravity facilities here at the Glenn Research Center. This facility is just under 80 feet tall. We can draft experiments in this facility weighing up to 350 pounds. Uh, they'll reach a terminal velocity of almost 50 miles per hour just before they hit the airbag at the bottom of the tower. We create microgravity for 2.2 seconds here. You said microgravity. Do you mean weightlessness? Yes, that's exactly right. Microgravity is weightlessness. Uh, astronauts experience that in orbit all the time. But we need to create that down here on the Earth, and we can do that here in the 2.2 second drop tower. This is how a drop tower experiment works. Researchers place their experiments inside an aluminum frame, also called a rig. Experiment rigs are then placed inside a drag shield, but are not attached to it. Once assembled, the experiment package is lifted to the top of the tower, then released. When the experiment is dropped, it experiences microgravity, or zero G, for 2.2 seconds. The drag shield protects the experiment from aerodynamic drag during the drop, which allows the experiment rig to fall freely a distance of seven and a half inches. The experiment experiences weightlessness, similar to what would be expected in space. Here in the drop tower, what happens is the experiment falls through the tower inside the drag shield. The drag shield is being slowed down by the aerodynamic drag as it approaches 50 miles an hour as it nears the bottom of the tower. Uh, the experiment inside, however, is falling through seven and a half inches inside the drag shield and is unaware of the aerodynamic drag that's occurring around it. There's three kinds of microgravity experiments we perform. Most of our work is centered on combustion. All the experiments are basically the same internally. There's a power system, there's a computer system on board to control the experiment as it falls through the tower. There's a diagnostic system on board which takes the imaging or the pressure or temperature data from the experiment as it falls. And this is the experiment itself, the thing that's actually burning or the liquid that's moving around inside the experiment. And we get all this ready, raise the experiment to the top of the tower that we have now, and we close it up, package it up, do a countdown. Stand by for go. Three, two, one. And as the experiment falls through the tower, it's in microgravity. That's when the experiment runs. Why do we conduct microgravity experiments here on Earth when we can easily conduct them in space? Well, actually, to conduct them in space is quite expensive. The numbers I've heard is about $10,000 per pound just to lift the experiment into space. Not to mention the cost of having the astronaut operate the experiment while it's up there. Now, here in the drop tower, it's quite a bit less expensive to do that. And if we make a mistake, we can go back and run the experiment again quite rapidly. Um, our researchers set up the parameters for the experiments that do go up to space right here in the drop tower. So how do the combustion experiments that you conduct here at this facility? in microgravity affect me, the general public. Well, the whole idea here is to understand combustion at the fundamental level. Once we understand that, we can go out and make cleaner burning engines, cleaner burning power plants, which means less pollution in the air. So we're less fuel dependent and we have a cleaner environment. The 2.2 second drop tower was originally built in 1948 to house a distillation tower for making jet fuel. In the mid-1960s, the need to perform reduced gravity research in support of the space program saved the facility from being torn down. Now coming up, we'll see how playing video games can help people overcome attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But first, did you know NASA uses a specially adapted plane nicknamed the Vomit Comet that creates microgravity here on Earth? When the plane reaches the top of a parabolic trajectory, the occupants temporarily become weightless, experiencing what it is like to fly in space. It seems like video games are just about everywhere. People have them in their homes, on their computers, and even small handheld versions. NASA uses simulators, which are similar to video games, to train and help pilots stay focused while flying a plane. Derived from this research, NASA researchers have incorporated the use of video games to help treat patients with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Linda Beth Bureau explains. <laughs> Have you ever met someone with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD? Chances are that you have. It is estimated that as many as 6% of all Americans suffer from this problem. Common symptoms of ADHD can include poor attention span, impulsive behavior, and in some cases, hyperactivity. 
Currently, drug treatment is the most widely used approach to control the unwanted behavior associated with ADHD. But would you believe that playing video games might help people with ADHD control their behavior? Researchers at NASA Langley Research Center and Eastern Virginia Medical School have been conducting research which shows that the use of a specially adapted video game controller in conjunction with something called biofeedback may drastically change the way we treat ADHD. We came up with this idea for a way to treat ADHD in children with our work in flight simulators where we were interested in pilots' attentiveness and how to improve that. We connected their brain waves to the flight simulators so that it affected how much control they had over the flight simulator. We decided that this might have some usefulness in brainwave biofeedback training and we substituted video games for the flight simulator and that brought the element of motivation, the entertainment value into biofeedback training. Biofeedback is a treatment technique that teaches patients to train and control normally involuntary body functions, like brain waves, by using displays of signals from their own bodies. With the aid of a biofeedback machine, patients with ADHD can learn to train the brain waves that are associated with focusing. Patients train these brain waves by increasing the strength of high frequency beta waves and decreasing the strength of low frequency theta waves. Practicing these brainwave changes has been shown to lead to an improved ability to pay attention. These brainwaves can be trained much like an athlete trains his muscles. For example, when a pitcher throws a ball towards home plate, if he is off the mark, then he must adjust his delivery the next time he throws the ball. Biofeedback training works similarly. If a patient's brainwaves are not on target, then the patient must adjust his brainwaves to meet the desired goal. So, just as the pitcher uses his muscles to adjust his delivery, the patient uses his mind to adjust his brainwaves. Video games uh, offers the element of motivation. Uh, they make the training, biofeedback training, entertaining for children. Biofeedback training typically is just showing children displays of their brainwaves and asking them to control that. What we've done is embedded that in an entertaining, enjoyable activity. This technology works by connecting a child's brain waves to a video game controller. In the NASA EVMS study, several off-the-shelf video games were linked to the biofeedback signal from the patient's brain waves through the handheld controller that guides the game's action. When the game was activated, the patient's brain waves actually became a part of the game. It works like this. While a patient is playing a car racing game, for example, the sensors pick up high-frequency beta waves and low-frequency theta waves from the player's brain. If the biofeedback machine reads a higher percentage of theta waves, it sends a signal to the controller which lowers the top speed that the player's car can reach. To increase his top speed, the player must increase his percentage of beta waves. The player learns through trial and error to produce more beta waves and not limit his car's top speed. With enough training, changes in the patient's brain become automatic and can lead to improved attention and behavior all the time. I would like to see this available to people to be able to bring into their home and enjoy the benefits of biofeedback training through entertaining activities. Home versions of this technology are currently being developed that would incorporate sensors embedded into a helmet to measure players' brain waves. If this technique continues to prove to be effective, one day, kids may actually have a good excuse to play video games. We've all seen the space shuttle taking off, but most of us take its design for granted today. It wasn't too many years ago that this unusual design shape was considered impractical. That was until a resourceful engineer from NASA named Dale Reed began working on design shapes called lifting bodies, which would change the shape of reusable spacecraft. The lifting body concept evolved in the late 1950s as researchers considered alternatives to the simple ballistic design of space capsules. Many felt that astronauts should have a more sophisticated vehicle that they could fly back and land on Earth from space. The lifting body idea was unusual because the vehicle didn't have any wings. The shape of its body alone had sufficient lift to fly. Despite favorable research on lifting bodies, there was little support for a flight program at NASA headquarters. Engineer Dale Reed decided that a flight demonstration was needed before wingless aircraft could be taken seriously. So, in February 1962, he built a model lifting body and launched it from a radio-controlled mothership in his backyard. While Dale flew the model, 
His wife took home movies of these flights, which helped Reed convince his boss to give the go-ahead for the construction of a full-scale version. But they would have to build it without funding support from NASA headquarters. There was very little confidence among uh, NASA uh, headquarters planners of um, spacecraft missions in the lifting body uh, concept. It was strictly a theory and an idea that a few technical people had. We felt, we flight test people felt that if we were to fly one of these and demonstrate that they can fly, then they would be cons the lifting body would be considered for future designs for future uh, spacecraft. NASA craftsmen and engineers took on the task and began building this new vehicle that they dubbed the M2 F1. It was built with a tubular steel interior frame and a mahogany plywood shell. We did this on an informal basis. I was allowed to uh, select uh, my team of uh, engineers and technicians that uh, had had experience in building home-built airplanes. And we proceeded uh, with the uh, design and, and construction of the vehicle in that fashion. Once the vehicle was done, Reed and other engineers towed the M2F1 across the desert runway with a souped-up Pontiac convertible. On April 5, 1963, Pilot Milt Thompson lifted the M2F1's nose off the ground for the first time, proving the lifting body concept. Later tests were done with a NASA C-47 that lifted the M2F1 to about 12,000 feet and released it. The lifting body dove toward the ground at 150 miles per hour, but the landing was smooth and the lifting body program was on its way. That was probably the most exciting thing in my career, with Milt Thompson being released at 12,000 feet, doing a successful uh, flare out of a very steep approach and coming very softly on the lake bed. I feel very proud of the fact that we accomplished a very major milestone in history by demonstrating an airplane that can fly without wings and that can be applied to exciting uh, designs of the future, especially in the spacecraft field. More than 400 ground tows and over 100 aircraft tow flights were carried out on the M2F1. The lifting body research was used heavily in the design of the space shuttle and is still being used today to design new vehicles like the X-38. The lifting body program has proven to be one of the most valuable programs in NASA history. During the course of the original lifting body program, six different lifting body shapes were flown a total of 230 times, eventually reaching an altitude of 90,000 feet and a speed of Mach 1.86. Coming up, we'll see how NASA researchers are developing new technologies that will make flying safer and more efficient. But first, did you know that the M2F1 was very inexpensive to build? The budget for the project was only about $30,000. In comparison, it is more expensive to operate an F-15 fighter for five hours. Have you ever been delayed at the airport? Chances are that you have. Most of us assume that flight delays are just an unfortunate part of traveling. Well, researchers at NASA are working on a program called Aviation Systems Capacity that just may make flight delays a thing of the past. Our own Jennifer Cortez takes us to NASA Ames to find out more. Have you ever been in this situation? Long lines at the airport? Your flight's been delayed again sitting on the runway waiting to take off, or circling the airport waiting to land. Unfortunately, it seems as if delays and cancellations are becoming a routine part of travel. Over the next 20 years, the demand for air travel is expected to double, which could make these delay problems much more frequent. In fact, by the year 2012, there will be over 1 billion passengers traveling on domestic flights annually. But is there anything that can be done about these delays? Well. Researchers at NASA are working on something called Aviation Systems Capacity, which may someday make flight delays a thing of the past. There are many factors that affect delays at major airports throughout the country. Uh, the major one is that there is just an exponential growth in the amount of traffic in the air traffic system. And unfortunately, we are just using the old air traffic control system that has been around for years. To better understand why some airport delays happen, think about your own rush hour traffic. As long as everyone is going the same speed, traffic moves smoothly. But if weather is bad or a few cars or trucks slow down, then huge backups can happen. 
That same basic thing is happening in the airport environment. Air traffic may be running smoothly, but if one plane is delayed because of weather, backups start to occur. Unfortunately, if planes are late leaving one airport, then those same planes arrive late at other airports, causing further delays. NASA's goal is to safely increase the capacity and productivity of national airspace by developing revolutionary operation systems and vehicles. Now, NASA has been working on three projects, and these three projects are aimed at trying to develop the technologies that will increase the capacity on the national level. First two projects are the Advanced Air Transportation Technologies Project and the Terminal Area Productivity Project. Those two combined are looking at technologies that will help reduce the workload of both pilots and controllers uh, at major airports. In addition to that, NASA is developing an aircraft that will be able to fly in and out of major airports without needing the runways. Frank, I know that you want to get aircraft in and out of airports faster. How are you going to do that? Well, Jen, since 70% of all delays in and out of major airports are caused by weather, uh, NASA is working on technology that will allow traffic to safely come in and out of these major airports, even under bad weather. And so, in order to do that, NASA is working on a technology called Airborne Information for Lateral Spacing, which will provide the pilot the ability to see other traffic, even during the bad weather times, so that they can safely come in and out of these airports. So based on doing that, we would be able to increase capacity at major airports. And the third element in the capacity program is the Short Haul Civil Tilt Rotor Project. The Civil Tilt Rotor aircraft offers a unique opportunity to alleviate runway congestion at the busiest airports. With the advantage of vertical takeoffs and vertical landing, tilt rotors don't rely on conventional runways and can bypass ground and air congestion, which reduces door-to-door -door trip times for passengers. With trips of less than 500 miles, tilt rotors will reduce the amount of fixed wing flights, which would free up runway space for larger aircraft. The benefits of the tilt rotor are that you can take off and land vertically, and then you can fly like an airplane. So it can fly twice as far and fast as a, as a helicopter, and at its destination, the reverse occurs, and it lands like a helicopter. And the big advantage is you don't need runways. And also, you don't even need airports. You can fly to small landing areas that we call vertiports. And these could be located much closer to where you're going or where you're coming from. And therefore, you avoid all of the uh, congestion on the ground and at the airport and in the air. That's why I believe uh, the tilt rotor will revolutionize air travel. Some initial milestones for the Aviation Systems Capacity Program have already been accomplished and are currently being tested for future use in airports. We've all seen helicopters flying around, but do you know how they work? For some answers, we turn to Johnny Alonzo. Helicopters have been credited with saving over three million lives by transporting critically wounded people from accidents and war zones. They're also used for things like helping the police fight crime, fighting forest fires, and simple tasks like checking our roadway conditions. But have you ever wondered how helicopters fly? For some answers, I spoke with NASA Langley researcher Mike Watts at the Coast Guard Air Station, Elizabeth City. Johnny, to really understand how a helicopter flies, first let's go back to a fixed-wing world, a regular airplane, okay. the kind with wings and an engine. Now, a fixed-wing has an engine, a jet, or a propeller to push you through the air, and that moves air over the wings, which provides lift that keeps it in the air. And obviously from, from this helicopter, you can see we don't have normal wings, and we don't have a jet or a propeller on it to push you forward through the air. But what you do have is the main rotor blades. 
you can notice that these are shaped a lot like wings for a fixed wing. The way you get them mo moving through the air is these rotate around in a circle, and that moves them through the air. They're shaped just like a wing, so that that provides a lift force that lifts the helicopter off the ground. Cool. So you've tapped in on how a helicopter lifts off the ground. Can you explain to me how you control the altitude? Sure. The way you control the altitude is by generating more lift and more upward force. And the way you do that is you pitch the rotor blade to a higher angle in relation to the wind. That generates more lift and that lifts it off the ground. Okay. To go down, you just reduce the angle of the blades that, that generates less lift and the gravity settles you down into the ground. So this is the main rotor. Uh, what is this? This is called a tail rotor. Yeah. As you can see, it looks like a main rotor or a propeller on its side. When you turn the main rotor blades, the body of the helicopter wants to go against the rotation. So if the blades are turning this way, the body wants to go this way. Well, to keep straight, you have to provide something to counter that turn, that force pushing it sideways. So we provide a force that keeps it straight. And that's what the tail rotor provides. Wow. If you want to go to the left, you provide more force, and it goes this way. If you want to go to the right, you provide less force, and the torque turns it this way. So, Mike, you briefly explained to us how you keep the helicopter straight. How do you make it go forward? Well, you make it go forward by providing a force to push it forward. Just like in a regular airplane that has a propeller, the propeller is providing a force to push the airplane forward. We need to provide that somewhere. If you think of the main rotor as a disc in the air, and it's got a force going through the center of it, that's what we called about, talked about as a thrust, right. that holds it in the air. If you tilt it forward a little bit, it's going to pull the helicopter forward. If you tilt it back, it's going to pull the helicopter back. Right. If you want to go sideways, you just tilt it to the side, and it pulls you sideways like that. And so you have the force pulling you backwards, forwards, and sideways. Sure. And if you actually take that disc and turn it all the way on its side, it's like a propeller. It's pulling you all the way forwards. And there's a concept being looked at by the Marines now called the V-22 tilt rotor. And that is to turn the rotors on their sides and make them propellers. You get the benefits of going farther and faster for a fixed wing or a regular airplane, and you can take off and land vertically, just like a helicopter. That's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. Mike, thanks for coming out and showing us uh, everything about helicopters. My today. pleasure, my pleasure. You got the keys, man? Oh yeah, let's go fire it up. Come on, let's do it. All right, let's Take go. Take alarm? Yeah. So that's how it works. We'd like to thank the U.S. Coast Guard for letting us use their facilities here in Elizabeth City. So we're taking off now. Let's go to my house. We're going to park. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Destination Tomorrow. I'm Steele McGonigal. And I'm Kara O'Brien. And for all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time.